pronunciado no dia 15 de setembro passado. Von der Leyen referia-se à luta contra a pandemia nas diversas vertentes e à inspiração que devemos retirar das novas gerações. E acrescentar, os nossos jovens deram significado a palavras como empatia e solidariedade. Eles acreditam que temos uma responsabilidade para com o planeta. E embora estejam preocupados com o futuro, estão determinados a melhorá-lo. A nossa união será mais forte se for mais semelhante à próxima geração, ponderada, determinada e solidária, assente em valores e ousada na ação. Até aqui palavras da Presidente da Comissão. O que aqui nos importa não é a avaliação do atual Governo da Comissão, mas a consideração se de facto podemos ou não falar de uma alma europeia e quais os caminhos que nos são dados a percorrer. É comumente aceito que na raiz do modo de ser europeu encontramos três cidades, cada uma delas contribuindo com realidades essenciais para a identidade europeia. Jerusalém, com a revelação do Deus único e a proclamação cristã da encarnação desse Deus na história e da sua vitória sobre a morte, com a consequente tomada de consciência da dignidade da pessoa humana e da sua vida. Atenas, com o uso da razão e o aparecimento do conceito de democracia. E Roma, com a capacidade técnica, o direito humano e o acolhimento em síntese cultural de realidades, conhecimentos e pessoas provenientes do exterior. Quando pela primeira vez visitei a Bélgica, não pude deixar de sentir um fosso claro entre os centros históricos das cidades que visitava, com as magníficas obras de arte que podia admirar, e as gentes que circulavam naquela rua. As cidades estavam cheias de monumentos e manifestações de fé. Em cada esquina, em cada rua, surgia a imagem, o nome, a referência a um santo, a uma dimensão cristã do cotidiano, tudo caldeado, discernido e iluminado a partir da fé. Mas tudo isto era visitado e admirado por gente que era completamente alheia ao significado cristão do que visitava. O que admiravam eram apenas pedras, monumentos do passado. Quase parecia que os antigos habitantes daquele país tinham desaparecido e que um novo povo estrangeiro o habitava agora. Ao fim do dia, numa pequena igreja ao lado da estação central de Bruxelas, uma dezena de cristãos persistia em celebrar a Eucaristia. Cidades construídas por cristãos, mas agora habitadas por gente estranha ao Evangelho, e onde os cristãos são uma clara minoria. Ao escutar o elenco dos diversos elementos da alma europeia, segundo o discurso da Presidente da Comissão, devemos reconhecer que a Europa contemporânea guarda apenas uma pequena parte do que recebeu de Atenas e de Roma e que esqueceu quase completamente Jerusalém. De Atenas, a Europa foi capaz de manter a racionalidade científica e económica, mas não foi capaz de manter o filosofar, a paixão pela procura da verdade, única capaz de oferecer alma humana à ciência e à economia. Foi capaz de manter uma democracia formal, mas foi incapaz de a desenvolver 
na auscultação efetiva das suas populações e das suas necessidades. Deixou que uma elite que se considera iluminada devemos interrogar-nos sobre o quem ou o que é ilumina. Domine, domine quase em absoluto as leis que emanam do seu Parlamento, tentando impor aos Estados e aos seus cidadãos uma nova ordem mundial, queixando-se em seguida da indiferença com que essas suas leis são recebidas, mas sem hesitar a importar a liberdade de quem se desopõe. De Roma, a Europa foi capaz de manter a eficácia, a ousadia e o direito, ainda que esquecendo boa parte da sua fundamentação natural, em detrimento de uma radicação quase exclusiva no contrato social. Esqueceu, além disso, a humildade do acolhimento do estrangeiro, a dimensão cristã e universal da sua missão. De Jerusalém, a Europa esqueceu quase tudo. Perdeu-se numa multidão de deuses, criados por si ou recebidos de fora, e cada um pôde mesmo tornar-se um deus para si próprio. A Europa colocou de lado valores e reduziu outros a um ideal abstrato, a palavra sem carne, sem vida. O discurso ético tornou-se autojustificativo, e deixou de oferecer limites e vida ao agir dos habitantes e das instituições. O imperativo técnico, se és capaz, deves fazer, tornou-se a norma suprema da fé. A vida humana viu-se reduzida a um objeto ao dispor da investigação científica e da arbitrariedade de cada um em qualquer dos seus estados. Os cristãos viram-se reduzidos a pequenos grupos. Se o cristianismo continua a crescer nos outros continentes, na Europa diminui a olhos vistos. Acusado de não científico, foi expulso da universidade e do pensamento. No domínio público, foi empurrado para o privado da consciência. E neste último, os escândalos de abusos, ampliados e sublinhados, mas vergonhosamente reais, vão paulatinamente afastando os poucos que ainda ousam ter a fé como referência. A guiada da escola, da saúde e da política, olhada como atitude apenas cultural ultrapassada, sem expressão suficiente no domínio público, a fé parece arrastar o refúgio na espiritualidade e na caridade organizada, da alma cristã da Europa, para além das pedras e da recordação, descritas habitualmente de um modo mais ou menos negro e caricatural, basta ver as séries do Netflix. Resta o enganador vocabulário, quase todo ele cristão, mas usado sem o horizonte de tempo, reduzido ao nosso mundo, à história e aos seus limites esvaziado de qualquer conteúdo prêmio. Ficaram as celebrações e as vigílias, ficou a espiritualidade e a meditação, mas sem referência a Jesus Cristo. E ficaram os valores sem referência a Deus, que é o seu garante, e em quem eles encontram a sua verdadeira consciência. Consistência, desculpe. Ficaram os valores sem carne, sem vida, incapazes de oferecer o um núcleo suficientemente forte para deter o imperativo ético. E por isso, efetivamente, facultativo. Poderá uma alma assim reduzida e amputada continuar a chamar-se alma europeia? O Papa Francisco não se cansa de dizer que não estamos apenas numa época de mudanças, mas antes numa mudança de época. Por isso, a questão coloca-se necessariamente. Seremos nós, cristãos europeus do século XXI, capazes de oferecer ou de contribuir significativamente para a definição de uma verdadeira alma europeia nesta nova época que desponta? 
Prefiro uma igreja acidentada, ferida e alameada, por ter saído pelas estradas, a uma igreja enferma pelo fechamento e a comodidade de se agarrar às próprias seguranças. Estas conhecidas palavras do Papa Francisco são bem o retrato da Igreja da Europa. Na Europa, a Igreja mostra hoje as feridas de uma Igreja em saída. Uma Igreja que, nos séculos passados, arriscou estar presente na educação, na saúde, na arte, na política e em todos os demais domínios da vida social. As feridas de uma Igreja que aceitou anunciar e viver o Evangelho e do Evangelho. Temos que aceitar essas feridas. Doem-nos e estão à vista de todos. Não nos orgulhamos de muitas delas. Pelo contrário, de muitas sentimos a vergonha da sua existência porque significam uma traição ao Evangelho. Envergonham-nos. Por nós, mas sobretudo porque tornam Jesus Cristo menos credível. E, no entanto, não podemos deixar de sair. Temos que tomar a sério as interpelações que a sociedade europeia nos faz. Mas não podemos deixar que elas nos retirem a capacidade de anunciar o Evangelho na sua inteireza. Ao longo dos séculos, a Igreja na Europa e no mundo sempre se viu marcada por feridas. Pelos cismas, pelos escândalos, pelas crises, pelas divisões internas, pelos ataques e perseguições que lhe adiaram no exterior. Contudo, nunca elas foram impedimento para que, por entre os escombros de tantos sismos, surgisse a santidade a dar alma ao mundo. Deus confia em nós, cristãos europeus do século XXI, para voltar a oferecer a propor sempre, não um ideal inatingível, próprio de uma ideologia, mas o um concreto de uma vida cristã. Isso significa comunidades cristãs. O Evangelho exige sempre esta dimensão comunitária. Capazes de dar corpo ao Evangelho nesta nova época que agora dispõe. Estamos certos de que, nesse novo modo de viver, a Europa não poderá ignorar as suas raízes. Estamos igualmente seguros de que também o modo de viver cristão não poderá amputar o Evangelho e a fé apostólica, que trazem consigo o embrião do nosso viver contemporâneo como cristãos europeus. E significa igualmente a capacidade de não nos deixarmos abater pelas feridas inevitáveis de quem nos sair. Aos nossos contemporâneos, propomos o Evangelho com humildade, mas com persistência. Propomos o um modo de viver cristão que nos torna felizes e que já foi capaz de dar carne e vida aos europeus e à cultura europeia dos séculos passados. Propomos o anúncio e a vida que, de facto, defendem e promovem o integral do Brasil. Não o fazemos como quem deseja qualquer regresso ao passado. Fazemos-o antes, seguros de que hoje o Evangelho continua com todas as capacidades para se tornar vida e cultura, a transformar esta nova época que surge na Europa. Melhor, seguros de que Jesus Continua hoje a ser o caminho para todo e qualquer ser humano. Essa é a missão que o próprio Jesus nos confia. Muito obrigado. Peço muita desculpa de falar de coisas, mas não estou habituado, eu vou fazer 80 anos dentro de todos Comecei a ensinar na faculdade de Metras o fim de três. E durante este tempo, nunca na minha vida li de nenhum colóquio, de nenhuma comunicação, e não estou, eu não estou habituado. Eu peço desculpa se não disser exatamente que não escrevi para o uso dos tradutores. Eu, disse, eu pego na palavra do Sr. Dom Nuno, que falou 
da herança jurídica de Roma para lembrar que o, o direito foi ensinado na Universidade de Bolonha a partir do século XI e se expandiu por toda a Europa, mas que já era o direito do Império Bizantino e que já era aqui na nossa península o direito que se manteve em torno da, da Corte de Leão é o direito justiniano, o direito romano cristianizado, humanizado nos seus excessos, como, por exemplo, no direito de vida e de morte, no antigo direito romano, os pais tinham sobre, sobre os filhos. Ao longo dos séculos, muitas vezes, o campo do direito em que é formulado o Estado e o campo dos valores superiores que são ensinados pela Igreja, tiveram, digamos, a um sucesso muito maior. Foram sucessos. Em Gangues Anjas, o imperador a o desmilitarianismo e depois os imperadores lastas resolveram legislar sobre o que era a matéria de fé. E no Ocidente, no século XIII, houve aquelas tentativas que começam com o Inocêncio III, se acentuam com o Inocêncio IV e culminam com o Bonifácio VIII, que quis que o imperador da Alemanha reconhecesse que o império era um seu da Igreja para assambarcar o que seria poder do Estado. As relações, portanto, nem sempre foram fáceis, mas sempre houve na Europa a consciência de que são duas coisas diferentes. E nisso a civilização europeia difere da civilização muçulmana, em que o Estado é uma comunidade religiosa que se apoderou do poder. E foi só no século XIX que alguns Estados islâmicos mais influenciados pela Europa, nomeadamente o Egito e o Irã, o Irã que é o fantasma dos americanos, mas que é uma, era uma monarquia constitucional desde 1907, promulgaram códigos civis, segundo o modelo do Napoleão, naturalmente integrando a tradição local e o que era de integrar da, da, da tradição muçulmana. No extremo oposto, temos o, está, o caso da China, em que a, o imperador era considerado filho do céu e, portanto, sumo intérprete não só da justiça, mas dos valores superiores. É verdade que, acima do imperador, pairava a tradição confuciana de que os letrados eram considerados os intérpretes e que faziam com que a China fosse um Estado autoritário, mas não um Estado totalitário. O Estado totalitário aparece mais tarde. Temos o exemplo do nazismo na Alemanha, temos o exemplo da União das Repúblicas Socialistas Soviéticas, que é tanto quanto sei o único Estado da história que se não define por um termo geográfico, mas por um termo ideológico. Não se, não se pensava confinado por uma fronteira geográfica e cultural, mas por uma adesão a uma ideologia. Ora, o perigo que neste momento me parece correr a Europa não, não é um perigo islam, é um perigo lateral um perigo externo, eu diria, cruzando o livro de Job, que é uma tentação exercer sobre o seu eleito com a condição de lhe não retirar a vida. O verdadeiro inimigo da Europa está dentro dela. São as tendências totalitárias que, que tendem a impor-se. Ao ver ali o desenho, 
que é o emblema desta associação. Lembrei-me dos debates sobre o aborto e lembro-me de uma discussão que tive com um amigo que me dizia: a mulher tem direito a fazer o que quiser do seu corpo. E eu objetei. Mas não é o seu corpo. Ela é que pede num, uma célula do seu corpo. Ela é que pede uma célula do feto que se traz e verá que o ADN é inteiramente diferente. Ou é 50% diferente. É outra individualidade que ele está fisicamente em potência e não faz parte do corpo da mulher. E quem o diz não é o livro de Jó, nem a Epístola de São Paulo aos Coríntios, nem a Apocalipse de São João. É a ciência moderna. E é contra a ciência moderna e o que ela afirma é da natureza do embrião que se levantam os Estados que legalizam o aborto. Embora se possa discutir até que ponto o embrião que merece já a proteção jurídica do Estado. Mas o argumento que se dá de que ele é parte do corpo da mulher é, segundo a ciência moderna, inteiramente falso. Outro atentado, omito alguns casos secundários, mas outro atentado grave à integralidade, à integridade da Europa e a, uma, a segunda ameaça do totalitarismo foi o que se passou com as censuras que a senhora Dona Úrsula, presida da União Europeia, Úrsula ainda tinha que ser pequena Ursa, e ela deve julgar que é a Ursa menor para que se orientam no mundo a todas as bússolas, mas não é. É um bicho da terra, assim, tão pequeno como todos nós, para usar a expressão de cada um. Quando ela recorvou à Hungria o ter proibido a, a, a propaganda do homossexualismo junto de menores, ela declarou que o que se faz muitas vezes não é grave. O que é mais grave é o que se declara para se justificar o que se fez. Porque o que se declara reflete o que se pensa. Quando ela declarou que para estar na Europa os Estados tinham de estar integrados na ideologia da Europa, quis fazer da União Europeia, que começou por ser uma simples União aduaneira e depois se transformou em União Política, uma União Ideológica, como a União Soviética, a que qualquer Estado poderia aderir desde que aderisse à ideologia oficial. E isto é extremamente grave. E temos, temos mais recentemente, e com ele termino, o que se passou com aquele inquérito aos abusos sexuais, segundo dizem 200 mil, mas dos quais já que notar apenas 4 mil estão provados documentalmente. Os outros são aduzidos de altiva, de fato, etc. Ah, basta fazer uma conta de dividir que para aqueles números serem corretos, cada sacerdote que abusou de menores teria de ter, em média, abusado de 67 menores cada um, o que é absolutamente incrível. Ora, para o justificar, o Sr. Macron declarou que ia abolir o segredo da confissão. Não discuto agora os efeitos práticos negativos que isso possa ter, como o arcebispo de Perth há pouco tempo lembrou. Lembro-me a frase que ele preferiu. Nada há superior às leis da República. Caímos no mesmo erro da União Soviética. O erro de pensar que é o Estado que cria os próprios valores por que se ordeia e que não há uma justiça superior que está para além do Estado que o transcende. Neste Estado, eu atrevo-me a ser produzido, não, não só não há lugar para a transcendência, mas nem sequer há lugar para a tragédia. 
no estado em que tudo está previsto, regulamentado, previsto pelo Estado omnipotente, omnipresente e omnisciente, não há lugar para a tragédia. Eu lembro que São Gregório de Naciança escreveu uma tragédia no sentido literário do tempo sobre a maior de todas as tragédias, a tragédia do filho do homem foi executado no seu próprio povo. Na Europa, e vazia de valores que nos querem impingir, não há lugar para a tragédia. Nem sequer para, não digo já para a São Gregório de Naciasa, mas para a tragédia grega. A Europa não se quer. A Europa que tem que ser capaz de, de, de produzir uma tragédia como o rei épico de Sófocles. Quando muito produziria uma história os quadradinhos. Em que Édipo, em vez de matar o pai, iria para a cama com ele. E ficaria como modelo para as gerações futuras da sagrada liberdade de escolher o parceiro sexual que nos querem impingir um sumo valor. O senhor Macron e a senhora Dona Úrsula, eu responderia que o próprio fundamento, a base da Europa que eles estão a minar, é aquela palavra do Evangelho. Dai a César o que é de César, mas dai a Deus o que é de Deus. Muito bem, eu não vou ter, mas tenho aqui o ter de controlar os tempos, portanto, eu virei a cada mais ou menos cerca de 10 minutos, a cada orador, e aviso 3 minutos antes para o professor poder dirigir a sua intervenção. Vou agora a palavra ao pastor Cornelius. Cornelius, só um minuto. Well, first of all, I wish to express my heartfelt thanks to all of you for inviting me to this conference and for the opportunity to address you on one of the topics today. Let me start with two disturbing events that happened quite recently. The first story comes from the city of Leipzig in Eastern Germany and concerns a Jewish man. The second comes from England and concerns a Christian lady named Mary Onoha, her family name suggesting Nigerian descent. At the beginning of this month, a German Jewish singer named Gil Ofrahim was turned away from a hotel in Leipzig because he was wearing a Star of David pendant around his neck. Apparently, this Jewish symbol disqualified him from receiving a place in that hotel. He was refused, not because of what he did, but because of what he was. A Jew. In June of last year, a nurse called Mary Onoha stopped working after many years of faithful service in the Croydon University Hospital in London. The reason? She wore a little cross around her neck. Due to that, she was constantly bullied by colleagues. The head of her department told her to take off that symbol for hygienic reasons. But strangely enough, religious symbols worn by staff workers with a different religious background drew no criticism. Mary was suspended, stripped at her position, at her position and told to work as a mere receptionist. She felt treated like a criminal and resigned. Her case is presently in the court. 
friends, these two stories, to which many more could be added, must serve as a wake-up call for all those who are still asleep. Europe is turning away from its Judeo-Christian roots, from the Old Testament and the New Testament, from the Torah and the Gospel, from God and Christ. This is a very serious development. 2,000 years ago, Europe was a pre-Christian continent. Today, this is no longer the case. Ancient paganism makes way for neo-paganism, classical humanism, for a militant anti-Christian humanism. What will the future bring? What will our children and grandchildren have to live through? Our heart is bleeding when we think of the younger generation, a generation which is faced with a choice, either go along and be brainwashed or stand your ground and face persecution. For many centuries, Europe could be called a Christian continent. Currently, liberal and progressive forces are working hard to destroy these roots and to do away with them. Europe has become a post-Christian continent. It's like the house that Jesus spoke of in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 43 through 45. That house was cleansed from an evil spirit, but there's no new and better resident came to take its place. The house was reoccupied by that same spirit and by seven others worse than himself. The situation in my own country is deeply saddening. Let me give you some of the facts. There is a strong so-called pro-choice sentiment and influence in the media and the political arena. Abortion is legally permitted in the first 24 weeks of one's pregnancy. When a woman decides to have an abortion, she must take five days to consider or reconsider her position and her decision. The pro-choice lobby, however, is now working hard to get this five-day period abolished. It is considered paternalistic to impose a five-day reflection period on a woman. The choice is up to the woman, they say, but the children have no choice. The unborn, unborn child has nothing to choose. Euthanasia, already legalized in the Netherlands, we were one of the first in Europe to legalize euthanasia, even before Belgium made the same choice. Euthanasia is once again a hot issue. Bills are under preparation to extend euthanasia to healthy people who consider their lives <laughs> completed. <laughs> to children between one and 12 years old, and to persons with dementia. As a result of the COVID-19 crisis, the Dutch government has drawn more power to itself, thereby limiting the freedom of its citizens. Will that power ever be given back? That's an open question. Some fear that this is only the beginning of an increasing control of our daily lives. Churches are coming under fire because of their relatively independent position. When they express Bible-based convictions in the public realm, they often meet with a strong backlash. So far, Christian convictions were tolerated, if not respected, but this tolerance is rapidly decreasing. Yesterday, I was in the old city of Lissabon, 
and uh, we stood there at a monument for Jewish people who had been murdered in the past. When I turned around and I looked at a wall, I saw the words, this Goa, a city of tolerance. I hope it's true. But the tolerance of liberals doesn't go that far at all. Tolerance for the Christian life view is rapidly decreasing. It is even asserted that the Christian upbringing is harmful, is detrimental, causes damage to young children and teenagers. Spend. Schools are now expected to teach a subject called citizenship, by which the ideals of the French Revolution are invited to the minds of the students. Special attention must be given to the LHB, LHBT plus ideology, the new norm. Plans are underway to revise Article 23 of our Constitution, the article that guarantees freedom of education for all. This is the situation we are faced with today, and that is why we are here. How are we to consider these developments in our individual countries and in Europe as a whole? Various angles and inroads are possible, as we can and will notice during this conference. What brings us together is the strong conviction that our nations and peoples are drifting away from their solid anchors and that it is of the utmost importance to raise a banner against the flood waves of secular ideologies. What unites us is our attachment to a culture of life in contradistinction to a culture of death. Each of us, however, comes from a particular background and has been raised or nurtured in a specific tradition. I, for one, am a conservative Protestant Christian in line with the 16th century Reformation. My church is a church that wants to adhere to the Bible as the inspired word of God and to live in accordance with that. Friends, I believe that the solution to the current crisis we are facing in Europe is precisely this. We must go back to the Bible. No, we do not want to overlook nature. There's much in nature that appeals to us and supplies us with arguments against the tide of atheism and the rejection of Judeo-Christian morals. Even after our fallen paradise, our broken world still reflects God's goodness, power, and wisdom, as the Apostle Paul points out in Romans 1. Although many modern Christians speak with this disdain about God's creation ordinances, we affirm that these ordinances can only be neglected or destroyed at our own peril. Nature is like a book with many letters revealing something of God's will. Nonetheless, God's will is more clearly displayed in the scriptures. God has revealed himself in a saving manner through the Bible, and it is this glorious book to which we need to return at this crucial hour in history. Let us affirm and reaffirm the values and norms found in the scriptures. Above all, let us live them. Let us walk our talk. Let us practice what we preach. Have we done that? Have we obeyed God's word? And have we been living witnesses of Christ? There is reason to be deeply humbled. Shame must cover our faces. We have failed in so many ways. We have not been watchful. We have neglected prayer. We have often looked away when children were murdered in the only place where they should be saved, that is in the mother's womb. Frequently, we have not acted in defense of the elderly, the handicapped, and other vulnerable people. In a word, we have not been faithful in upholding the sanctity of life. We have contributed to the dismal condition of our churches and nations. Let us therefore beg the Lord for his undeserved mercy. Surely we need to act, but not in our own strength. 
We need to cry unto him who is the almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the triune God. He is mighty to incline the hearts of men and women, of rulers and citizens. Again, let us return to him. Let us go back to our roots. May the Lord grant us true repentance, a living faith, and ardent love. May he stir up our hearts and minds to go back to the Bible. That is my heartfelt wish and prayer. Thank you and God bless you all. E agora sem mais demoras, passa a palavra a Dom José Inácio Munilha, Bispo de São Sebastião. Bueno, la ventaja de hablar el último, eh, pues es que uno ha podido escuchar atentamente las intervenciones que me han precedido, me parecen todas ellas muy interesantes. Especialmente quiero agradecerle a Monseñor Nuno Brás que nos haya centrado la cuestión que abordamos. ¿no? Ha roto Europa con sus raíces históricas, vivimos de espaldas a la herencia recibida desde Jerusalén, la cual nos dio la luz de la revelación. Seguimos creyendo en la capacidad de la razón para descubrir la verdad imperativa presente en la naturaleza de las cosas, como Sócrates, Platón, Aristóteles, o por el contrario, nos hemos hecho hijos del relativismo. Creemos en el derecho natural que fundamenta el concepto de justicia según la herencia romana, o por el contrario, hemos apostado por un derecho acomodaticio a las ideologías del momento. ¿Es compatible el proyecto europeo del año 2021 con el humanismo cristiano de los padres fundadores de Europa? Ciertamente es bastante obvio que Europa está consumando una inversión de valores que hace oídos sordos de aquel famoso llamamiento de San Juan Pablo II en Santiago de Compostela, el año 1982. Desde Santiago te lanzo, vieja Europa, un grito lleno de amor. Vuelve a encontrarte, sé tú misma, descubre tus orígenes, aviva tus raíces. Siete años después eh, de aquel inolvidable discurso, acontecería la caída del muro de Berlín, el 9 de noviembre de 1989. Yo entonces era un joven sacerdote, tenía 27 años. Y recuerdo haber vivido aquel momento con gran optimismo, que ahora no puedo por menos de recordar con la inevitable sensación de haber sido bastante ingenuo, ¿no? La reunificación de Europa parecía una maravillosa oportunidad para respirar de manera acompasada en los dos pulmones, de Oriente y de Occidente. Y de hecho, en el inicio del pontificado de Juan Pablo II en 1980, él había designado a San Cirilo y San Metodio como copatronos de Europa, compartiendo esa designación con San Benito, para expresar la integración de las dos Europas, ¿no? de comunes raíces cristianas. Aquel momento histórico fue una gran oportunidad para abordar la purificación de la cultura europea, del influjo nefasto del marxismo, así como del neoliberalismo capitalista, ¿no? desentendido de la doctrina social. Sin embargo, la sorpresa ha sido comprobar cómo el momento de la reunificación europea no fue el momento del redescubrimiento de las raíces cristianas, sino, al contrario, el momento de la escenificación de la apostasía. Lo que posteriormente se ha producido no ha sido tanto la caída de las ideologías, como se anunciaba, cuanto a la conformación de una nueva ideología en la que el marxismo y el liberalismo se han reformulado, la llamada ideología de género. Obviamente no es algo que aconteciese sin un proceso previo y de hecho la crisis del mayo del 68 ya había apuntado hacia esa apostasía. 
Benedicto XVI nos alertó ante la crisis del relativismo para finalmente denunciar la dictadura del relativismo en la que nos encontramos. Como digo, el nuevo dogma europeo es la ideología de género, que se atreve a redefinir el concepto de la dignidad humana, la antropología, que desprecia el matrimonio natural, despoja a la familia de su identidad como célula básica de la sociedad, el principio de subsidiariedad tan importante es olvidado en la teoría y negado en la práctica. Y en esta línea el intervencionismo público se va imponiendo de una manera inexorable. Cada vez hay más Estado y menos sociedad. La libertad educativa se va estrangulando y es el Estado, y ya no las familias, el que se arroga el derecho educativo sobre las nuevas generaciones. En España hemos sido testigos de una frase lapidaria de la exministra de Educación Socialista pronunciada con el objetivo de limitar la influencia de los padres en el ámbito educativo. Su frase es, no podemos pensar de ninguna de las maneras que los hijos pertenecen a los padres. ¿Pertenecen acaso al Estado, señora ministra? Lo cierto es que el Estado legisla y actúa como si así fuese. ¿Cómo es posible ¿no? que la ideología de género haya llegado a ser asumida e impuesta con tan poca resistencia? Esto no hubiese sido posible, ciertamente, si las raíces culturales y religiosas de Europa hubiesen gozado de mayor vitalidad. El desarrollo económico generado tras la Segunda Guerra Mundial conllevó un notable bienestar social que desgraciadamente degeneró en hedonismo. De ahí a la pérdida de los valores no hay mucha distancia. ¿Acaso habíamos olvidado aquella palabra profética de Jesús de Nazaret en la que nos advertía de la peligrosidad de las riquezas? ¿Qué difícil será a los ricos entrar en el reino de los cielos? Ciertamente, como añade el propio pasaje evangélico, nada es imposible para Dios, pero se requería gran madurez espiritual para que las riquezas y el bienestar social no se tradujesen en una cosmovisión materialista. Cuando volvemos la vista a lo acontecido en Europa tras la Segunda Guerra Mundial, nos viene a la mente aquella expresión de Salomón que recoge el libro del Eclesiastés: nada hay nuevo bajo el sol. El novelista norteamericano Mitchell Hoff ha descrito este proceso histórico en la sucesión concatenada de cuatro fases. La primera. Los tiempos difíciles dieron a luz hombres fuertes. Segundo, los hombres fuertes dieron a luz buenos tiempos. En tercer lugar, los buenos tiempos dieron a luz hombres débiles. Y en cuarto lugar, los hombres débiles dan a luz tiempos difíciles. Recuerda haber enviado a las redes sociales en forma de pequeña encuesta la pregunta sobre cuál de estos cuatro momentos es en el que nos encontramos actualmente. La gran mayoría de cuantos contestaron se decantaron por el cuarto momento. Los hombres débiles están dando a luz tiempos difíciles. Esta explicación eh, del origen de la crisis actual puede ayudarnos a entender por qué los países del Este están siendo más resistentes a la ideología de género que los occidentales. El hedonismo ha hecho mayor mella en los países ric más ricos. La dictadura marxista se ha demostrado menos peligrosa para la salud del alma europea que el influjo del Carpe Diem del mayo del 68. Tres minutos. 
mención aparte merece la resistencia que están llevando a cabo algunos de los países europeos que formaron su alma bajo el yugo comunista frente a la inicua pretensión de la imposición de la ideología de género por parte de las autoridades europeas. En realidad, son estos países resistentes los que verdaderamente son fieles y leales al alma europea. Por el contrario, las amenazas económicas y políticas de Europa contra quienes se resisten a asumir la agenda LGTBI escenifica una traición y una suplantación de los fundamentos históricos de la Unión Europea. Quienes están arriesgando su balance de cuentas por mantener la fidelidad a los principios de la ley natural merecen nuestro reconocimiento y apoyo cuando la injusticia se convierte en ley, la resistencia se convierte en deber. Volviendo al hilo de mi exposición, resumo un poco y luego si alguien quiere la intervención completa la dejaré. Volviendo al hilo de mi exposición, es importante entender que la crisis de una Europa que rompe drásticamente con sus raíces responde a un proceso de globalización bajo el concepto de deconstruccionismo. El Papa Francisco lo designa así en el primer capítulo de la encíclica Fratelli Tutti, bajo el epígrafe El fin de la conciencia histórica. Estas son las palabras literales del Papa. Por eso mismo se alienta también una pérdida del sentido de la historia que disgrega todavía más. Se advierte la penetración cultural de una especie de de construccionismo, donde la libertad humana pretende construirlo todo desde cero. Son las nuevas formas de colonización cultural. No nos olvidemos que los pueblos que enajenan su tradición y por manía imitativa, violencia impositiva, imperdonable negligencia o apatía, toleran que se les arrebate el alma, pierden junto con su fis fisonomía espiritual su consistencia moral y, finalmente, su independencia ideológica, económica y política. Cierro eh, la cita. La estrategia del nuevo orden mundial se está imponiendo de forma sub subrepticia, está centrando sus esfuerzos en la ruptura de las raíces históricas de los pueblos, como observamos en el 500 aniversario de la evangelización de América. Una vez que un pueblo se ha desvinculado de sus raíces históricas necesitará anclarse a algún tipo de ideología y la orfandad generada por el deconstruccionismo histórico será fácilmente ocupada por la ideología de género. No quiero terminar mi intervención sin hacer una autocrítica sincera desde el seno de la Iglesia. Es obvio que no estamos a la altura de lo que este momento tan grave necesita. El problema principal al que se enfrenta la Iglesia Europea no está en los ataques anticlericales de los medios de comunicación, ni siquiera en las políticas que rompen con las raíces cristianas europeas. Nuestro principal reto es la secularización interna. Si la sal se vuelve sosa, ¿para qué sirve? En palabras de Benedicto XVI, la Iglesia tiene necesidad apremiante de pastores que resistan el espíritu de la época. Por ello, la gran aportación de la Iglesia en medio de esta crisis es la mostración del testimonio de los santos que han resistido el espíritu de su época. Un minuto. Un minuto. Ellos, los santos, han configurado beneficiosamente la historia de Europa. La conclusión es clara. De nuestra santidad depende el futuro de Europa. Concluyo recordando que a los tres copatronos de Europa anteriormente citados, San Cirilo, San Metodio, San Benito, Juan Pablo II añadió en 1999 otras tres copatronas más, Santa Catalina de Siena, Santa Brígida de Suecia y Santa Teresa Benedicta de la Cruz. Hago votos porque llegue el día en que San Juan Pablo II sea reconocido como el séptimo copatrono de Europa. Los encomendamos a los siete diciendo, rogad por nosotros.
Muito obrigado a todos pelas intervenções. Nós temos apenas duas perguntas do mesmo, uh, do mesmo elemento, da José Maria Duque, e por, por falta de tempo para gerir, eu iria pôr uma, enfim, de acordo com as intervenções uh, que tivemos na mesa, ia pôr a primeira ao pastor uh, Cornelio Zonfeld, e a segunda aqui ao Dono Nubras. Agora tenho que encontrar as perguntas, porque isto, normalmente isto, estas coisas apagam-se quando a gente precisa delas, não é verdade? Portanto, não, ainda não está. Este telemóvel não é meu, este telemóvel não é meu e, portanto, tenho aqui uma dificuldade de manipulação do aparelho. Peço desculpa. Não, já cá está. Quer dizer, está. Já cá está. So, first question for Cornelius and Feltz. With the fall of Christianity, of, of the, the values of Christianity, will the, the, the LGBT mindset and pro-abortion, uh, a new form of paganism? What's your feeling? That's the question. Uh, then the first question to be answered would be, uh, to my humble opinion, is what is paganism and just to be very short i would say that paganism at, at the heart of it is self-glorification is placing man at the center of the universe um so considering ourselves as divine as somebody without god as god himself now this may take a personal form or a national form or a tribal form paganism um, now, if, if we look at the LHBTIQ, etc. ideology, uh, then we can clearly see um, no God, no master. Um, I determine my own life, my own fate. And especially with the transgender movement, you can see there is a undermining of God's creation ordinances. A mentalidade a, principal do LGBT é minorar, um, not to consider ourselves as creatures of God, Deus, but as people who, in total freedom, mas que nós somos totalmente uh, in, in, livres para obter todas as coisas. The end of freedom, in the name of freedom. E isto é o fim da liberdade no nome da liberdade. A segunda pergunta. A segunda pergunta. O Nuno Brás. Nuno Brás. É a seguinte questão. O recuo do cristianismo que vale na Europa o recuo da liberdade. The setback of Christianity is in Europe the setback of liberty. Let's see. Nós não conseguimos, we, we uh, uh, nós não conseguimos imaginar imagine um ser humano the human being uh, que chegue, uh, que, que ultrapasse uh, aquele que é Jesus Cristo. We cannot Quer dizer, conceive that human uh, being go Jesus Cristo beyond Jesus Christ, é, that Jesus Christ uh, uh, is alto, the mais main point daquilo que é o ser humano. Is the main point that a recusa de Jesus human, Cristo human being. traz consigo the uma refuse, desumanização. The refuse of Jesus Christ, the e traz consigo, por isso Jesus mesmo, Christ sempre is the, também the of, uh, uh, esta diminuição clara da liberdade. We, Aliás, we uh, have, uh, 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 um, creio, que, uh, creio que se vê isso and, muito claramente uh, ne, em todas estas imposições do Estado, this, uh, em toda, uh, em toda esta tentativa. Through the state uh, start uh, to giving uh, us de impor by... uh, de cima para baixo precisamente esta nova ordem esta nova ordem mundial o que quer que isso signifique the impose to us the new uh, eu creio que, que devemos the new order, devemos sublinhar the isto new, uh, muito o facto Jesus Cristo mundial, é o ponto mais alto do ser humano porque nele point of Deus the e o homem se encontram in human being God and e, portanto, Jesus se Deus Christ, e o homem se encontram uh, they, they a, a partir do momento em que se dá a encarnação, And, uh, se eu quero falar do homem, tenho que falar do Deus que é Jesus Cristo. If I want to speak about se man, quero falar de Deus, tenho que to speak falar about do homem Jesus que é Jesus Cristo. In God. Uh, e, e é, portanto, em Jesus Cristo que nós encontramos uh, o ponto, 
mais alto uh, de todos os valores, de toda a realização. And, uh, realização. Uh, portanto, porque, uh, não se trata simplesmente Because, uh, de, de pensamento, uh, 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 trata-se também on de, de, de vivência. Desculpem que eu entretanto já perdi a questão, mas, sorry, uh, 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 mas claramente, portanto, uh, uh, recuar, recuar na referência a Jesus Cristo é obviamente a Jesus Christ is, uh, obvious, Obrigado, chegamos assim ao fim desta freedom. mesa, de que eu como moderador tiro uh, uma, uma conclusão das várias intervenções e uma esperança. A conclusão é que o trabalho que nos é requerido uh, para cristãos é fácil. É o trabalho da revelação. Is, Nós temos que fazer a revelação. To ask questions is, is Porque easy quem se nos opõe a e a quem nos opomos quer nos impor uma cultura e uma civilização baseada na ignorância wants, e no obscurantismo. Quem nega que a vida humana é singular e existe desde o primeiro momento é um militante da ignorância e do obscurantismo. Não é preciso a ciência a Qualquer mãe que teve um filho sabe que o ser que cresceu dentro de si é outro ser. E qualquer pai que acompanhou a gravidez da sua mulher sabe que aquela criança que dava pontapés na barriga, que escutávamos antes de nascer, é outro ser. E nós temos que revelar essa marida. E quem nega a dualidade homem e mulher And who quer construir uma sociedade the, baseada na ignorância e na, na, no obscurantismo. São como os terraplanistas que ainda acham que a Terra é plana. Ignorant, os que querem voltar ao geocentrismo, em que era o sol que rodava uh, à volta da Terra e não ao contrário. E nós temos que os confrontar na sua ignorância e na sua ignorância. E eu creio que este é sobretudo um tempo de cultura. Nós vemos de combate está a em torno da lei mas este não é um, um tempo da lei, this is not, é um tempo da cultura. This is not the Nós time temos que repetir e repetir e repetir, e repetir the time of culture que a vida humana é singular desde a concepção. E, e que a humanidade é homem e mulher, é homem e mulher. The reality is man and woman, das, das leis and God is God, de, is God de, de and God is é um in its man, de in his human being. Depois queria, como sinal de esperança, recuar aqui, as a as a hope, a parábola de Dom José Inácio, que nos disse que quatro tempos, tempos difíceis eram homens fortes, homens fortes strong, eram bons tempos, strong, fort, uh, bons tempos man, eram homens débeis, e nós teremos no ponto quatro, homens débeis geram tempos difíceis. And, uh, o sinal de esperança é que voltamos ao we, princípio, os tempos difíceis vão gerar homens fortes. É esse o desafio que temos uh, pela frente times. nas sociedades do nosso tempo. This Muito obrigado a todos. 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 Peço all, desculpa porque nas colunas deste lado está a aparecer as traduções de fundo ou a transmissão do YouTube. Nós demos-nos conta disto, mas só se pode corrigir durante, uh, agora durante, so sorry, durante, durante o intervalo que vamos ter. Left, uh, right Segundo aviso sides. é conservem convosco os aparelhos da tradução e os escutadores, enfim... Por razões uh, para o vídeo, uh, portanto, cada um conserve consigo, mas não se esqueçam keep, de devolver ao fim bem entendido. Temos de devolver aos senhores que nos, que nos alugaram este COVID equipamento. Uh, pandemic. Terceiro aviso, Third. são só quatro. Terceiro aviso é nem todos os que aqui estão se registaram. Não é Not dramático ficarmos sem saber que uma outra inside, pessoa uh, Mas é dramático the meeting, não sabermos they don't, uh, com quem é que contamos para o almoço e com quem é que contamos para a Fátima amanhã. Porque quem está a gente sabe é não perder us, a possibilidade de almoçar. Ou to go to quem Fátima está a gente sabe amanhã ir a Fátima é fundamental que se registre. Uh, Os outros todos também é bom ficar com uma lista dos amigos que temos. E o quarto aviso é que regressamos a esta sala às 11h50 em ponto. Portanto, we temos go back, uh, 10, we get 13, back at this room at uh, uh, um 15, um coffee break. Muito bem-vindo ali ao lado daquele, daquele balcão. We're going to have a break now. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Vou remerciar, Père. Uh, d'avoir introduit uh, aussi, uh, aussi gravement et, et, et de manière aussi importante, essentielle, uh, notre journée. Uh, 
nous allons continuer avec euh, euh, une table ronde au sujet de l'écologie intégrale. Alors, je voudrais peut-être commencer euh, en vous disant, en tant que directeur de la Fondation Jérôme Lejeune, ce que euh, les jeunes personnes ou les adultes atteintes par la trisomie 21, par le Down syndrome, nous disent tous les jours. Vous savez probablement qu'en Europe, en France particulièrement, 96% des enfants, des embryons qui sont détectés euh, trisomiques in utero, 96%, ai-je dit, sont avortés. Ils n'ont pas le droit de vivre. Et donc, euh, ces enfants et ces adultes que nous recevons à la consultation Jérôme Lejeune tous les jours, nous en recevons plusieurs milliers, 12 000 par an, nous disent de manière unanime, s'il vous plaît, défendez-nous. Ils ont envie de vivre. Et ils nous disent tous, nous sommes comme vous. Nous avons un chromosome en plus. Et certains rajoutent, c'est le chromosome de l'amour. Alors je suis heureux de, de penser à eux avant d'introduire cette table ronde sur l'écologie intégrale. Parce qu'ils sont un maillon manquant dans notre réflexion sur l'écologie et méritent effectivement que nous donnions force de réflexion pour pouvoir intégrer en nous en tant que chrétiens un regard qui prend tout le monde en compte, qu'il soit fort ou qu'il soit vulnérable. Donc la, 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 la table ronde de, 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 de maintenant est centrée sur le sujet de l'avenir de l'Europe, comme vous le savez, qui est un sujet qui a été ouvert à l'initiative du président Macron et qui est inscrit dans l'agenda politique du printemps 2022. Vous savez que le, la France sera euh, présidente euh, de la, la Commission à partir du mois de, de, de mars-avril prochain et que Macron le président Macron sera peut-être réélu et qu'il a un véritable point de vue personnel à la fois sur l'Europe et sur l'avenir des valeurs de l'Europe. Donc je pense qu'effectivement, il est temps de pouvoir lui faire savoir qu'il y a en Europe des citoyens, des hommes, des femmes qui ont des regards particuliers sur les valeurs de l'Europe et notamment sur celles de la vie. Donc la description des thèmes qui sont ouverts au sein de la plateforme Internet qui nous présente la Conférence pour l'avenir de l'Europe, vous les avez peut-être regardés, les thèmes sont, sont stupéfiants. Ce sont des thèmes qui sont strictement et uniquement techniques. Comme si l'avenir de l'Europe se résumait, en quelque sorte, au progrès à ce qu'on appelle le progrès, et qui est devenu, euh, par voie idéologique, un progressisme. Ces, ces, ces thèmes-là sont l'écologie, l'état de droit, l'économie, l'emploi, la démocratie européenne, sans aucune approche idéologique, sans aucune place laissée à la personne humaine, à la famille, à la justice, aux pauvres, à l'éthique ou à la bioéthique. Comprendre l'écologie intégrale, c'est la réponse chrétienne à la question environnementale et c'est l'enjeu de notre table ronde. Je me permets de, de rappeler la question posée par Dieu à Cain. Qu'as-tu fait de ton frère et qu'un répond, suis-je le gardien de mon frère Et dans un monde européen qui est de moins en moins à Belle 
et, que de, et qui est de plus en plus qu'un, la question de l'écologie intégrale, intégrant tout le monde, y compris les, 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 les vulnérables, c'est évidemment une question que nous avons le devoir de nous poser autour de cette table ronde. L'écologie ne peut se contenter de seules réponses techniques ou même politiques face à la menace que vous avez ce matin parfaitement bien décrite qui pèse sur la planète Terre et qui, perd, et qui pèse sur notre humanité, les réponses techniques sont bien sûr euh, nécessaires, mais elles sont strictement insuffisantes. Et une réflexion sur la vocation de l'homme et sur sa responsabilité est absolument indispensable pour que nous réussissions à reconnecter la nature et l'homme. L'homme dans, ce rôle de, dans son rôle de gestionnaire, de gérant de la nature, et non pas dans son rôle de consommateur avide et destructeur. L'enjeu, c'est effectivement de relier l'environnement et la défense de la vie, relier l'homme et la nature. L'homme et la nature sont-ils des ennemis comme le laissent entendre certains écologistes radicaux, ou au contraire, sont-ils des amis, mais peut-être des amis qui ont oublié qu'ils servaient un même objectif, celui d'un bien commun, et le bien commun de toute espèce vivante, c'est la vie elle-même. Donc, on l'aura compris, une révolution culturelle est nécessaire et elle passe par une révolution personnelle. Je rappelle donc que notre table ronde est composée d'universitaires, d'hommes et de femmes politiques, qui sont appelés à dégager lors de cette table ronde des perspectives claires, s'il vous plaît, pour que nous puissions être capables de prendre des initiatives concrètes, d'être des êtres d'action pour que, euh, au delà de nos propos, nous puissions influencer notre Europe. Notre Europe chérie, notre Europe menacée, notre Europe en danger. Donc, après euh, vous avoir rapidement euh, présenté, euh, professeur euh, Joa César Das Neves, eh bien, je vous prierai, s'il vous plaît, de prendre la parole. Donc, euh, le professeur Joa César Das Neves est... Euh, euh, professeur, je vais, je, vais dire quelques, je vais vous lire quelques mots et ajuster mes, mes lunettes. Il est professeur titulaire et président de la commission d'éthique de la Catholica, ici à Lisbonne. C'est un homme de sagesse, c'est un homme d'influence. Il a été conseiller du premier ministre euh, portugais et c'est un homme également très prolixe, très généreux, puisqu'il est l'auteur de plus de 60 ouvrages. Professeur, je vous laisse la parole. Merci. Minências, meus amigos, uh, queria gastar um bocadinho do vosso tempo a uh, discutir uma questão simples. Por que é que os ecologistas não estão do nosso lado? A razão, isto não é uma coisa secundária, porque uh, os ecologistas pertencem a um dos momentos mais extraordinários de toda a história, em particular da história contemporânea. Não é? Conseguiram em duas gerações, pegar num tema que praticamente ninguém falava e transformá-lo num dos temas centrais uh, do momento. Não, é? não se fala do futuro da Europa sem falar na questão ecológica. Isto é verdade ao nível político, mas é também a verdade ao nível individual, ao nível das, das famílias, das pessoas. Portanto, a questão ecológica é um tema que pervade todos os aspectos da vida. Conseguiu mesmo impor um dos poucos absolutos éticos do nosso tempo. Nós vivemos num tempo que se diz tolerante, que se orgulha de não ter dogmas, que ataca quem pretende impor dogmas. De facto, tem vários dogmas que impõem de uma maneira bastante fanática e, e este é um deles. Portanto, é um tema em que, se alguém publicamente falar ao contrário, perdeu a carreira, perdeu a honra, perdeu o emprego, enfim, está para dito. De facto, é um dos momentos mais importantes, movimentos mais importantes da atualidade, 
ninguém tem dúvidas que o futuro da Europa tem de ser ecológico, mas não devia este movimento estar do nosso lado. Bem, essa é a lógica do conceito de ecologia integral, que nós estamos aqui a, a debater. A intuição original vem, aliás, da centésimos anos, do Papa São João Paulo II, que falou em ecologia humana, e o Papa Francisco desenvolveu o tema uh, falando de ecologia integral. O argumento tem toda a lógica. É um, é um excelente argumento para olhar nos nossos debates. De defender a natureza quer dizer também defender a natureza humana. É claro que quem defende a vida dos animais e das plantas, dos, dos uh, ecossistemas, devia defender também os embriões, as, os idosos, os doentes. E, de facto, o futuro da Europa depende de uma sociedade que funciona em termos ecológicos, e isso quer dizer uma ecologia que não é apenas física, é também social, é também uh, cultural, etc. Agora, o argumento não funciona. De facto, não funciona. Quer dizer, os ecologistas não estão do nosso lado. Eu podia agora enverdar por uma discussão do que é que se passa no movimento ecológico, foi essa a minha primeira ideia. Mas depois achei que era mais interessante ver convosco o facto de que este fenómeno, o fenómeno dos nossos argumentos bons não funcionarem, é muito mais vasto do que simplesmente a questão ecológica. A maior parte dos nossos argumentos excelentes não funcionam. Eu até diria que todos os nossos argumentos excelentes não funcionam. E discutir porquê parece mais interessante. Podemos ver isso com três dos nossos principais argumentos. O primeiro é este, o argumento ecológico. E, meus amigos, os ecologistas não só não defendem a vida, mas estão exatamente do lado oposto. Portanto, não é uma coisa de neutralidade, é uma oposição. Mas o mais extraordinário não é isso. O mais extraordinário é que os adversários dos ecologistas também são nossos adversários. Quer dizer, dos dois lados do debate ecológico, estão os dois lados contra nós. Os ecologistas porque as crianças e os idosos gastam recursos e, portanto, poluem e estragam o ambiente, e os adversários que pretendem uma sociedade mais eficaz, mais dramática, mais dinâmica, mais produtiva, acham que, os, que as crianças e os idosos estragam essa eficiência. E, portanto, este argumento, que é um argumento logicamente muito bom, de facto, tem exatamente o efeito ao contrário. Um outro argumento interessante para vermos exatamente a mesma coisa é o argumento demográfico. Não há dúvidas que o futuro da Europa enfrenta uma dificuldade grande por causa da situação demográfica. É? Temos a, a, os europeus em, como uma raça em vias de extinção. Eu não sou uma espécie protegida, mas eu sou uma raça em vias de extinção. E isso é um problema. Quer dizer, é um dos dramas. O resto, aliás, fica secundário perante isto. A resposta a esta questão seria naturalmente uma defesa da vida e da família. Precisamente por este argumento se deveria defender a vida e a família. A alternativa que de toda a gente fala e deixem-me dizer, eu tive uma experiência já há há muitos anos de dizer isto, quer dizer, a melhor maneira de tratar o problema demográfico é defender a vida e a família e, e a audiência desdá-se a rir. Portanto, foi um momento de hilariante na, na minha intervenção Uh, já me aconteceu muitas vezes a audiência dessa rir, mas nunca por este argumento. Outra alternativa é acolhimento de imigrantes, que é um elemento de acolhimento, que muitas vezes é mesmo por razões humanitárias, e de facto resolve parte do problema demográfico, mas apenas em termos económicos e sociais, não em termos culturais, por exemplo. O problema cultural do futuro da Europa não fica resolvido pelos imigrantes. Nós somos herdeiros dos bárbaros que apanharam isto, e os que vierem para cá enfim, tratarão uma Europa à sua maneira, mas não à nossa. Mais uma vez o argumento falha. Estes argumentos ecológico, demográfico e outros são válidos, são interessantes, são mesmo contundentes, mas passam ao lado da questão. Só se considerarmos o argumento central da nossa posição é que nós podemos perceber exatamente qual é a nossa luta. Porque estes argumentos são argumentos de conveniência. E a conveniência é uma coisa boa, não estou a dizer mal da conveniência, quer dizer, é um, um, um argumento de eficiência, de utilidade, que são coisas boas. Mas o nosso argumento é essencialmente um argumento de dignidade. 
é um, um argumento de natureza humana, é um argumento de direitos fundamentais. E isso é um bom sítio para discutir na Europa, porque a Europa é um grupo, uma entidade, uma, uma presença que tem defendido isso pioneiramente antes das outras zonas do mundo e, aliás, tem depois espalhado essa defesa por todo o mundo. Mas antes de entrar nesse ponto, eu gostava só de fazer aqui um parênteses que me parece importante, que é o seguinte. O facto do nosso argumento central ser um argumento de dignidade humana significa que o local ideal, central, decisivo para defender essa posição não é a política, não é os meios de comunicação social, é a própria vida. Era a vida defende-se na vida. Nós não estamos aqui para aprovar leis, para conseguir políticas ou subsídios. Nós estamos aqui para tratar das pessoas concretas. E tratar das pessoas concretas significa fazermos próximos delas, daquelas pessoas que têm a sua dignidade em risco, e, e proteger essa dignidade. Portanto, a luta pela defesa da vida e da família faz-se na vida e na família. Senão, o nosso movimento é simplesmente mais um movimento de ativistas, como, por exemplo, os ecologistas, provavelmente conseguirá algumas vitórias e algumas derrotas, mas passa ao lado do problema central. Eu acho que este é um ponto é muito importante, porque muitas vezes, no meio da fragor e de forma compreensível, esquecemos disto. Quer dizer, estamos com objetivos politicamente muito bem definidos e passamos ao lado daquilo que é realmente o problema. Ora, depois de dizer isto, tenho, no entanto, de notar que as questões político-legais são importantes. E, portanto, devemos também preocupar-nos com elas. E, como eu dizia, é neste campo, no campo da defesa político-legal dos direitos da humanidade, que a Europa se distinguiu primeiro e ainda hoje se distingue no Conselho das Nações. Portanto, a Europa tem uma longa, prestigiosa e honrosa luta, campanha e popeia de defesa dos mais fracos, de defesa daqueles que estão a, cuja dignidade está a ser atacada e que pode apresentar-se assim perante o mundo com, com, com honra e dignidade. As lutas depois tornaram-se globais, mas a maior parte delas começaram na Europa. No século XVIII começou a luta pela defesa dos plebeus, foi talvez a primeira grande luta do, do terceiro Estado. Depois veio a luta da defesa dos escravos, em seguida dos condenados à morte, depois dos proletários, dos trabalhadores, sexo dos direitos da mulher, os direitos dos negros e outras etnias, e mais recentemente os direitos dos homossexuais e dos transexuais. Portanto, temos uma sequência que se transformou na Europa mesmo como um traço da, da nossa cultura, quer dizer, os europeus têm de estar a lutar pelos direitos humanos, senão a coisa não corre bem, nós não somos muito europeus se não fizermos isso. E por isso, a nossa luta pela defesa da vida e da, da família encaixa-se nesta sequência. Mas, mais uma vez, não encaixa. De facto, há muitas vezes até esses direitos são argumentados contra nós. E eu gostava de ver convosco rapidamente porquê. Eu acho que todas estas outras defesas da dignidade tem uma coisa em comum que contrasta com a nossa posição. É que todas essas defesas da dignidade são de pessoas convenientes. Quer dizer, os proletários, os, os trabalhadores, as mulheres, os condenados à morte, os escravos, são todos convenientes. E nós estamos a defender os inconvenientes. Aliás, os extremamente inconvenientes. Quer dizer, não há ninguém mais inconveniente do que um bebê que a própria mãe não quer. Não há ninguém mais inconveniente do que um idoso ou um doente que a própria família prefere ver morto. Não há ninguém mais inconveniente do que um marido ou uma mulher que já nem sequer há peixorra para olhar para a cara dele. E são esses que nós estamos a defender. E por isso é que temos, e vamos ter sempre contra nós, uma enorme quantidade de pessoas boas, sérias, competentes, capazes, porque os nossos argumentos embatem sempre contra a parede da inconveniência. 
E por isso é que temos os movimentos ecológicos contra nós, e temos os liberais contra nós, e os socialistas contra nós, e os capitalistas contra nós, e os cientistas contra nós. Todos esses estão contra nós e vão estar sempre. Não por causa do argumento que a gente apresenta, que aliás até preferem não ouvir, mas por causa da evidência da inconveniência. É evidente que o um embrião é uma vida humana. Mas é evidente que aquele embrião é altamente inconveniente. E portanto, o que quer que a gente diga, vai sempre embater com este problema. E aí se nem sequer discutem se é uma vida humana ou não é. É inconveniente. Há um argumento de conveniência que nos opõe. Eu acho que é muito importante todos os que estamos nesta luta ter consciência deste facto. E até consciência de um outro aspecto que eu acho que ainda é o mais dramático de todos. É que perante isto, a gente só pode perder. Não há maneira da gente ganhar. Nós temos contra nós, mesmo os ativistas mais generosos da defesa dos direitos, das causas humanitárias, dos direitos humanos, estão contra nós. Estão contra nós os doutores da lei e os escribas. Estão contra nós os fariseus e os saduceus. Estão contra nós os erudianos e os romanos. Estão contra nós até as multidões que andavam atrás de nós e que agora estão contra nós. Só temos do nosso lado os inconvenientes, os leprosos, os, sobos, os coxos, os cegos. E por isso a gente só pode perder. A única esperança que temos é de ressuscitar ao terceiro dia. Muito obrigado. Merci, merci beaucoup, uh, professeur. Maintenant, nous allons uh, donner la parole au professeur uh, Julio, Julio uh, Tudela de la Universidad de Valencia, de, de Valence, donc, qui est un scientifique de, diplômé en, en, en pharmacie, uh, spécialiste en analyse clinique, responsable du laboratoire d'analyse clinique de de Valence. Professeur, vous avez la parole. Merci. Muchas gracias. Gracias a todos. Gracias, Jaime, primero, por invitarnos a esta maravillosa jornada que tanto me está gustando, tanto me está enriqueciendo. Quiero primero compartir los saludos de mi rector, a quien represento en este acto, José Manuel Pagán, que no ha podido estar hoy con nosotros, el rector de la Universidad Católica de Valencia, que se suma y nos apoya con todas sus fuerzas. Quiero también hacer un pequeño recuerdo al profesor doctor Justo Aznar, que es maestro de todos nosotros, defensor de la vida y gran científico, que hoy se debate con una grave enfermedad. Desde aquí le mando un fuerte abrazo. Bien, efectivamente, la defensa de la vida que nos une aquí siempre es enriquecedor, siempre empuja el escuchar, el, el escuchar a quien está remando en tu misma dirección. Esto no es fácil en nuestros lugares de trabajo, donde frecuentemente vamos contra corriente. Esta tarea, esta tarea de defender la vida verdaderamente es una tarea amenazada. Y quiero hacer mención a algunos de estos combates que estamos sufriendo ahora en España, no solo contra la vida, sino también contra los que la defienden. En primer lugar, pasamos diapositiva, quiero recordar este informe MATIC tremendo que no podemos olvidar. La aprobación por parte del Parlamento Europeo de este derecho con minúsculas contra el derecho con mayúsculas. ¿Existe verdaderamente el derecho a matar? ¿El derecho a matar al no nacido? ¿O el derecho a matar al vulnerable? Al no, como ha dicho, 
al no inconveniente. al inconveniente, correcto. Muy bien. Nos publicamos desde el Observatorio de Bioética de nuestra universidad, en el cual hacemos una tarea científica en favor de la bioética, inspirada en la ciencia y a favor de la vida. Ya publicamos un informe desvelando las entrañas de este informe matic. Perdón, perdón. Desvelando las entrañas de este informe matic. Eh, publicado el día de la festividad de San Juan Bautista. También martirizado por un capricho. Y se define en este informe el aborto como atención médica esencial. Y tenemos que decir, como después recordaré, y estamos publicando desde los medios de nuestra universidad, tanto los medios de comunicación como redes sociales, que ni el aborto ni la eutanasia son actos médicos. No son actos médicos. No debería requerirse la objeción de conciencia por parte de un profesional que es obligado a realizar un acto que no es médico. Cuando un médico mata un embrión, no hace un acto médico. Cuando un equipo médico inyecta una inyección letal a un enfermo, no hace un acto médico. No puede exigírsele. Y desde la buena praxis del ejercicio de la medicina, apelando a la objeción de ciencia, no a la de conciencia, los clínicos, los sanitarios, no deben alinearse con estas prácticas. Pasamos. El, este año, en el mes de marzo, en España, se aprueba tristemente la ley de eutanasia, presentada como una conquista de las libertades. Pasamos. Recientemente en nuestro observatorio hemos organizado una jornada defendiendo que salga a la luz la mentira que esconde esta supuesta conquista de la libertad. Como afirmaba el doctor Marcos Gómez, que ha dedicado toda su vida a la promoción de los cuidados paliativos, y comenzó ya en España a implantarlos hace 40 años. La realidad es que en España hay 75.000 personas que mueren cada año con un sufrimiento intenso que puede evitarse porque no tienen acceso a un servicio de cuidados paliativos pero hemos empezado a construir por el tejado. En lugar de comenzar por los cimientos, que es atender a los que lo necesitan, hemos priorizado legalizar la forma de terminar con ellos. Un nuevo atentado hacia la defensa de la vida constituye una propuesta de ley orgánica en España que os pongo aquí la, la presentación por parte del Partido Socialista, adelante con la diapositiva, que pretende perseguir con penas de cárcel a todo el que se manifieste frente a un, una clínica abortista o se dirija a las mujeres que acuden a abortar. Pueden ser condenados a penas de cárcel solo por ofrecer a estas mujeres una alternativa. Ellos lo presentan como un intento de penalizar el acoso. Pero no es cierto. El acoso ya está penalizado en nuestro ordenamiento jurídico. 
lo que ellos quieren penalizar es presentar la posibilidad de la vida a las mujeres que empujadas, engañadas, atemorizadas, abandonadas, optan por la peor de las soluciones. Nosotros hemos también eh, publicado en medios de comunicación este artículo en el cual hacíamos esta referencia. Manifestarse a favor de la vida, ofrecer a la mujer que sufre otra posibilidad, es hostigar, es coartar. Esta es la conquista de la libertad. Más allá, nuestra ministra de Igualdad en España, señora Montero, afirma que va a perseguir a los médicos que, se, que objeten al aborto por practicar violencia obstétrica machista. Es decir, oponerse al aborto, que no es un acto médico. No solo el médico que aborta. El farmacéutico que suministra el fármaco abortivo. Oponerse a hacer lo contrario de aquello para lo que ha estudiado, para lo que se ha formado, para que lo, lo que dedica a sus esfuerzos es curar, aliviar, prevenir acompañar es un acto de violencia según la doctora la señora Montora aquí tenéis el artículo de la prensa donde recoge esta triste intención nosotros en nuestro observatorio hemos publicado también nos oponemos a esta posición afirmando debe un profesional sanitario apelar al derecho de objeción de conciencia cuando es solicitado para hacer lo contrario de lo que debe y sabe hacer no sería mejor apelar a su obligación a ejercer con buena praxis y aplicar los mejores tratamientos los más eficaces, los más seguros para contribuir a la salud de sus pacientes. Y nos encontramos con una paradoja tremenda. En, un, en una UCI, en un quirófano, estamos intentando salvar a un paciente que ha ingresado con una sobredosis de barbitúricos porque quiere suicidarse. Y aplicamos todos los medios para evitar que muera. Pero en el quirófano contiguo estamos aplicando una medicación letal, obedeciendo religiosamente al mandato legal para terminar con la vida de alguien que así lo ha pedido. No es esta la forma mayor de absurdo a la que nos lleva el neopaganismo de la posmodernidad? Quiero poneros también las declaraciones del Papa Francisco, al cual, el Papa Francisco, al cual de corazón agradezco las palabras que nos ha enviado para esta reunión y su defensa sin paliativos de la necesidad de ser fiel a la conciencia bien formada que está en toda circunstancia a favor de la vida. Es un homicidio y nunca es, libito, nunca es lícito hacerse cómplices con un homicidio. Juan Pablo II lo definió al aborto como el abominable crimen del aborto. Finalmente, 
estamos siendo censurados por redes sociales, Google, plataformas como Google, que sistemáticamente censuran nuestras publicaciones cuando contienen términos como aborto, eutanasia, ideología de género, transgender, transexual, etc. Y tenemos aquí, os traigo algunos ejemplos de capturas de pantalla que hemos recogido desde nuestro observatorio cuando han bloqueado publicaciones referidas a estos temas. Tenemos una periodista encargada de buscar las palabras que escapan a la censura para poder publicar finalmente nuestros trabajos. Pero no vengo a llorar. Vengo a decir que una generación, un hombre débil, genera una, como era Munilla, un hombre débil genera una situación catastrófica, pero de la situación catastrófica nacen hombres fuertes. Y no lo digo yo. Lo dice San Juan Pablo II. La vida vencerá. Esta es para nosotros una esperanza segura. Sí, la vida vencerá. Me lo estoy imaginando hablando con su rotundidad. Puesto que la verdad, el bien, la alegría y el verdadero progreso están de parte de la vida. Y de parte de la vida está también Dios, que ama la vida y la da con generosidad. Muy obrigado. Merci, professeur Tudela. Maintenant, nous allons passer la parole à Madame Lexman. Madame Lexman, qui, qui est donc aujourd'hui eurodéputée, qui succède à Miroslav à, à Bruxelles, au Parlement de Bruxelles. Nous avons euh, moins de dix minutes, euh, chère Madame. Est-ce que c'est possible de tenir dans ce temps-là. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you for the floor. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Oh, but it This one is working? Yes, now it's better? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much once again for the floor and thank you for the invitation to this very important event. I would like to maybe address you from the angle of uh, what I believe would be uh, appropriate as a contribution to, to the discussion about the future of Europe. As a member of the European Parliament, I thought it is vital to, to take this angle and maybe open up a discussion among us what should be the main points we are going to bring into this debate. I'll start with the principle of subsidiarity, which is one of the foundations of the European Union. The principle comes from uh, two encyclicas. The first time it was not coined, but it was already mentioned implicitly in the uh, encyclica Rerum Novarum Balleo 13. This encyclica was a response of a Catholic church to the Marxism and to the Marxist ideology, it was trying to make sure that the social issues and social problems of individuals are being addressed in such a way that people are not being taken their freedom away. And later on, Pius XI, uh, in his encyclica Quadrat Gessimo Anno, he coined the, the term uh, subsidiarity and developed it into whole teaching. This term is in the foundations of the European Union And we have to make sure that this term is being, uh, this condition is being observed because this is the way how we are going to secure that the European Union is not going to be taken by another ideology and is going to serve uh, the people and is going to, uh, uh, it's going to uh, protect our freedom. Uh, German political, uh, sorry, German, um, uh, uh, lawyer, constitutional lawyer, 
Ernst Böckenförde once said that liberal democracy uh, and freedom in liber liberal democracy must be protected by some kind of self-regulation, which must come from within uh, the moral foundations of human person. This is a, I would say a secular clause, the maybe more Christian clause, which practically says very similar idea uh, was pronounced by Robert Schuman, who says that the European democracy will either be Christian or not at all. And I'm, I was thinking, what is the kind of combining point of, of these two? And I think for us Christian, Christians is the reveal truth about human person. But also the secularists, the agnostics, maybe atheists, we agreed on a certain terms that human being is in a possession of human rights and human dignity, which are inalien inalienable. This is what the world has agreed on. And we have again and again ideologies coming and trying to portray their view of a human person, which is very far away from this understanding. We got some points we are, we are supposed to touch upon, and I would like to touch upon the protection of life from conception. This is a big debate throughout the last 70 years, or maybe even more. Actually, abortion was introduced in the Soviet Union, in the ide ideological Marxist Soviet Union. And from a natural perspective, we understand that human being life starts with conception. Actually, even those who are support, supporting abortion, they started to set, argue that human life starts only after birth. But now no one is disputing this. Now we, they came with another concept because realized that people do understand that life starts with conception. So the new concept is a privacy or right to abortion for, for well-being of a woman. Another problem arose, which is when we see a human life from conception to natural death, that suddenly natural death is being questioned again because of a view of certain, uh, I would say shifted view of what dignity means, shifted view what uh, happiness means. And for this reason, we started to terminate human life by ourselves. But I would maybe mention the middle part from between conception and natural death, because this is very important. I, I think that as Christians, we have to focus on the protection of dignity of every human person during the entire life. And Pope Francis said in his encyclical Laudato Si that we must look at the uh, processes of society, its economy, behavior, and patterns. And we have to consider the interactions within the natural systems themselves and with the social systems. And now I'll be, bring a couple of uh, points. I believe that they're absolutely vital within the whole system. Pope Francis also says very clearly that corruption is uh, an attack on human dignity. And this is where I see that we as Christians have to be very active and have to point out also that this is the, the tax of, of human dignity. Uh, I have just come from a, from a G20 where legislators from all, the, all around the democratic world, we were saying that deepening our trade with China is actually an attack on human dignity because the Chinese communist regime is able to use our money the money gained through our trade, trading with us to deprive people from their dignity in China. And we have to be aware of this. I, for example, have realized that cameras, thermometers, which are now being introduced during COVID in the European Parliament, where, me, uh, where cameras produced by Chinese uh, Hikvision co uh, company in the Urgu, in the Xinjiang region. And I asked the president of the parliament to take it away. Because I think by this, we were attacking the human dignity in China, and we are part of the immoral regime. Artificial in intelligence. 
the European Parliament has uh, passed a, a very good resolution where we clearly state that the artificial intelligence must serve a human being, must serve well-being. The human, the, set, the, the human being and the dignity of every person must be in the center of artificial intelligence. But at the same time, we have algorithms which are attacking truth, are demolishing our democracy and system because are inducing lies, shifted uh, understanding of words, incorrect information and manipulation into the social media, into the space and into the public discourse in, in a social uh, media where most of the people are now leading the public discourse. The Matic report was already mentioned by, by, by two professors. The Matic report attacks the very foundation of the universal human rights as we agreed as a, as a civic society, not only from our perspective as a Christian, but also, as I said, the atheist, the agnostic, they also agreed it because the, the universal human rights says that everyone has a right to life and, and the right to abortion is completely against it and in the contrary to that. The Matic report has uh, attacked the natural understanding of things as Pope Francis is, in, is encouraging us to, 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 to view them because practically the Matic report wants to give the right to birth and being pregnant also to men. The Matic report has attacked the very foundation of our free civilizations, of our democracies, where the conscience is being regarded as guidance to our behavior. And from this perspective, I believe that we have to really come back, I mean, at the European Union level, to go back to the very foundations the subsidiarity principle is giving us. Because the subsidiarity principle was the answer to the Marxist uh, ideology. <coughs> and that should be also the, our answer on the European level to the new ideologies which are demolishing and destroying our freedom and our democracy. I, I really like the uh, quote from, I, I can't remember it by heart, but John Paul II, he said in one encyclica that if the upper layer in the subsidiary hierarchy is dealing with issues which is not its business, it creates bureaucracy, it uh, overwhelms the higher level with a uh, lot of procedures and they're unable to focus on what they are supposed to focus. And I think this is clearly saying what the European Union is now, now facing the problem. We are dealing with so many issues which are not in our competence and we are failing to deliver where we actually did receive the competence from the member states. And I think this is exactly what we need to bring the discussion into. And I will conclude uh, with the thought of Benedict XVI, where he said that relativism is sort of the new ideology which is attacking our freedom. And I think the only way how to fight relativism as this new ideology is to go back to the truth. Because if freedom is um, captured by truth, that's the only real freedom. If it's eroded by relativism, the freedom will be diminished. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Miroslav, not Mikolaski, but Mikolashik. Uh, it's a little, little change in the program, yes, but this is the original version. So I'm coming from Slovakia. Yes, I am by training medical doctor and uh, I was ambassador of my country to Canada. And then I was serving for 15 years with uh, my outstanding colleagues, uh, Carlo Cassini, Alois Peterle, Jaime Mayor Oreja, for 15 years in Brussels and in Strasbourg as a member of European Parliament. We were sitting in the EPP, which means from my side, it was Christian Democratic Movement Party. Everyone has his family, so this was my family, and now I am retired. But uh, yes, as I said, it was said, I, I try to be 
active in the one of us executive committee as a member, elected member. So thank you for being with us. Uh, this is outstanding conference of one of us. I think uh, we are learning uh, new things uh, and we are bringing new fresh ideas, I think. And uh, uh, what I like uh, from the panelists uh, this morning uh, that uh, we were not uh, in, uh, I would like uh, to say, uh, insist that not only in the def defensive, defensive kind of position, uh, but uh, we were bringing fresh ideas and French argumentation, fresh uh, uh, ways how to tell the truth. And um, this is our role. This is our role because uh, the truth will win. This was uh, uh, on our old presidential flag, the, the truth wins, you know. So I think we will uh, testify about the life, about the family, the truth. And, uh, and uh, if, uh, if we are with God, we have the majority, right? So, um, so um, with uh, any other delay, I was told we are uh, commencing by, uh, by listening to the professor of this uh, university. Um, uh, and uh, 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 in my papers, Isabel, uh, yes, Isabel, Capella Hill, uh, with the, the rector of the Universidad Católica, Católica, Católica Portuguesa here in Lisbon. Uh, uh, Madam Rector, you have the floor. Can you hear us? I can hear you perfectly um, and good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be a speaker at this uh, European Forum. Um, one of us, I'm one of you. We are all together in the fight for truth, as uh, our moderator has just said. I just wish I could be there today, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm outside the European Union today, Sh close by, but outside in the UK. Um, so without further ado, I want to, to greet also the other panelists uh, in this round table. Um, I shall be speaking broadly about context. I'm uh, uh, speaking from the expertise of uh, my fellow panelists. Um, I decided not to speak so much on issues that pertain to the legal or the political challenges to freedom, but rather to make a comment on context, on what Europe, on the position that Europe is in right now, um, and uh, what are the current threats and how we should move forward. And to do this uh, from a position that, um, and, and I enjoyed uh, listening um, previously to, to the notion that we are not in the defensive. I think it is important to be able to be self-critical also about the moment, uh, to be aware of the challenges, but also perhaps to seize the moment as an opportunity. Um, so I will start by singling out two different strategies that are often present when discussing Europe and what it stands for. The first champions a sense of irretrievable loss. It pivots around the idea of Europe as a political and spiritual unity, a community of believers that gave vent to distinct modes of political organization. One may borrow the words of the German poet Friedrich von Hardenberg Novalis when he wrote in 1799 in a fragment that is very important for us today, Christianity or Europe, Christenheit or Europa, he wrote the following. Those were beautiful, magnificent times when Europe was a Christian land. And he goes on to lament when one common interest joined the most distant provinces of this vast spiritual empire. Quote end. Novalis lamented the intestine process and the religious wars that led to the divisions of Christianity and mourned the loss of a common interest that was both political and spiritual. Novalis Europe is a community of believers that is also an ethnic, cultural, and ideally political unity. This idea of Europe is in some sense permanently lost, 
And it is probably unwise to hang on to this romantic construct as a guiding narrative for the present. The, the second strategy to address Europe looks for articulation without disavowing conflict. It, it stresses rather an image of Europe historically built around the construction of borders. A geography of limits, in fact, articulated the imperial discourse of Rome from myth to politics. Rome's founding myth, the story of Romulus and Remus, enunciates the violence that both structures and protects a demarcation practice. Arguably, the border produces the empire. In his reflection on the philosophical idea of Europe, Massimo Cacciari argues that identity is ingeniously produced at the limits. Becoming occurs in limine. Consequently, the space that substantiates and co-produces the idea of Europe only becomes what it purports to be at the edge when the limits are reached. One may say that Europe becomes Europe in Lampedusa and Calais, more precisely when the values, the sense of identity of a European communion of sentiments are questioned, the mode of response and engagement with dialogue and respect for human dignity define and reaffirm the deep sense of the Christian becoming of Europe. So basically the point is that it is part and parcel of the Christian and the Catholic understanding of Europe to uh, um, reaffirm identity when and uh, at the limits when it is challenged, at the moment uh, when it is challenged. Um, so in order to address and comment on the perceived dangers for freedom in Europe, I thus believe that one must not shy away from the discourse about borders and the challenges to the limits that have for centuries shaped the sense of European belonging, anchored on a specific set of values that from the community of believers to the structure of modern democracies have made the European mind. Freedom is certainly one of those secular citizenship rights that is also grounded on the values of Christianity. But first, the conversation must do away with the pervasive sense of fear, although the, the danger is graspable and very present. I'm often reminded of an obscure meditation, perhaps because I'm in London, by Virg Virginia Woolf, uh, written during the Blitz. In Thoughts on Peace in an Air Raid, she describes the every night experience of anticipating the drop of German bombs over her house in London. And she writes, one, two, three, four, five, six, the seconds pass. The bomb did not fall. But during those seconds of suspense, all thinking stopped, all feeling, save one dull dread ceased. The emotion of fear and hate is therefore sterile, unfertile, quote end. Addressing our current condition and the dangers to our freedom must take place without fear. There is no whizzing drone sound above us, waiting to fall. The sense of embattlement and fear prompts intellectual sterility and favors useless debates. We live at a time when a global pandemic is slowly becoming endemic. Europeans are daily confronted with poignant social crises, ranging from unemployment to migration, with environmental hazards ravaging the livelihood of populations, with political and cultural crises reflecting the rise of dissent, prompted on the one hand by populist discourse and on the other by the global call for social justice. Under current conditions then, what it means to be a European is under duress. And yet I believe that the moment can be grasped as an opportunity and should not, should not be wasted with despondent nostalgia, hanging on to a past that never truly was as, as idyllic as some are led to believe. The French psychoanalyst uh, Catherine Malabou describes our time as a time of wounds and wounded identities. And I see this is as um, one of the most problematic elements uh, that will shape what I'm going to say next. These wounds run deep. They cut across political borders, remnants of past conflicts. They foster anxiety before the changing social landscape and the arrival of new entrants that in turn seem to justify the waning of social rights. They articulate the crisis of values and identities. They anticipate a fear before a future defined by technology where human beings are obsolete. They connote a sense of despair before the ravages of climate change and the toll of natural disasters triggered by human behavior. And in these times of wounds, we observe a clash over the precedence of fragility, 
Who has suffered the most? Who is to blame? Who may claim the status of victim? And who are the perpetrators? The widening of the wound threatens all sorts of institutional authority, the state, education, the economy, the church. It threatens societal cohesion and instills a demand for retribution. Europe is at a crossroads, but I argued that this is not a moment to lament, but precisely an occasion to rekindle the spirit that comes forward exactly when the idea of Europe is placed under duress. Just as the personalist values of integrity, justice, solidarity, care, but also the right to a dignified living are part and parcel of the European project and originate in the lessons of the gospel, so too is the self-reflexive critique that informs discernment. Faith, we have to be self-critical also about the moment. Faith does not preclude reasoned choice. Obedience does not disqualify discernment. The critique of Europe must therefore be an occasion to strengthen our choice for a project serving the common good and a true exercise of freedom. So I will now address four elements which I find are crucial to understand our time um, that as I said are more uh, placed on the macro level um, and, 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 and finish there. So the first is our cultural context and the idea of a global Europe, what it entails uh, and what kind of challenges it brings. The second is the appropriation of the social justice agenda by woke culture. So I cancel culture, I want to address this. It is a wave coming from the United States that is spreading across and that is pro proving to be extremely dangerous for um, our societal cohesion. The third pertains to the transformations of work. And finally, of course, I want to talk about the technological explosion and misinformation. So the first, global Europe. Freedom, like justice, cannot be simply an ideal. It is a practice that involves recognition, recognizing as well the other's right to the same freedom of choice, speech, faith, assembly, and culture. And to act on this basic right as a dialogical capability, that is something that does not belong to each one alone. Um, as I said, to act on this basic right, we need to act on it as a dialogical capability, knowing that it is something that does not belong to each, uh, each one of us alone, but to many individuals simultaneously. Freedom then rests on conviviality. It is not a simple personalist right. On top of the transformations that have shaped cultural change in modernity, secularization, the consumerism and commodification of cultural capital, relativism, class conflict, mediatization, one more has become the node of debates over the past two decades. This is the growing transformations of the ethnic, religious and cultural composition of European countries and the challenge of a multicultural society to a certain sense of European singularity, otherwise referred to as the West. Difference is increasingly perceived as a threat to Europe's freedom of assembly and circulation, as real security threats by a minority of radicalized Europeans produce a general sense of embattlement, restricting mobility on the one hand, but also producing in the soft sense what for some may be a radical change in the relation to the European past and its heritage. Um, and again, we are going to link this to this idea of wounds and resentment, right? So to accommodate the difference, you have to disown your past. The demand by the new European cultural identities to revise history and address historical grievances produces a new trend of cultural morals that is arguably a threat to intellectual freedom. As I stated at the outset, without condoning this move, it is important to combat the trends, so this trend of cultural morals, while understanding and addressing the grounds of the grievance. The paradox of the European is to inhabit a 21st century territory that is multicultural and multi-ethnic, while remaining locked inside politically romantic frameworks, connoting the citizen to one space, one people, one language, one culture. So here we, we are at a crossroads, because on the one hand, we do understand that our social fabric of the populations has changed. Um, this embedding of difference is part and parcel also of the European project. Um, and, and there are two, uh, um, let's say, two, two uh, trends that occur at this time. 
One is to disavow this difference as something that is destroying uh, our society. The other is to respect it so much so as to really destroy the heritage and the legacy of uh, the European history and its past. So we are faced between these two trends with a reality of a global Europe. Um, so I would say that global Europe, this notion, supports at times a political discourse that resorts to the narrative about the incoming flow of newcomers, they come as migrants, as refugees or exiles, to justify three types of limitations, security limitations, social and economic limitations. In other terms, limits to the freedom of movement to social and economic rights. The 21st century European denizens cheated out of the basic citizen, citizenry promises of democratic societies by waning civil liberties and social rights, deregulation and the crisis of voice, in fact, experience a crisis of belonging that is deepened by a crisis of representation, both political and symbolical. However, the cheated, so these, these other social problems of Europe, that uh, um, the, the European crowds on the streets have uh, been addressing as cheated promises of the liberal social, uh, social state, are enacted precisely not because of the incoming flow of um, new uh, um, of newcomers, but they are enacted precisely, I would argue, by the reinforcement of the authoritarian apparatus of the liberal state uh, that manifests itself in the coordination of all areas of life according to politically bent social models. We're talking about democracies, but um, uh, we're talking as well about the way in which a absolutist state-centered policy is limiting um, individual liberties, the family, um, the, the development of the private sector. So this uh, um, increased structuring uh, and coordination of all areas of life according to uh, politically bent social models um, limit, promote uh, um, what uh, in France has been called um, a certain politically correct uh, respect for a difference that exerts violence on um, uh, the grounded traditions of Europe, uh, what is called as the islamo uh, and that fosters, of course, an attack on um, Christian ideas and also strong, uh, strong anti-Semitism. Um, but at the, at the same time, this uh, centering of the ideological apparatus and this uh, emboldening uh, of um, a certain authoritarian streak within, uh, as I say, the democratic structure of um, the European political states, impose uh, or, or um, are liable to advance, impose, and in Portugal very clearly to impose certain uh, social agendas, uh, for instance, euthanasia, uh, limiting as well the rights of the family uh, in heretofore privileged areas of intervention, so um, restricting the intervention of the family in the area of education, for instance, um, in Portugal, uh, as we are discussing um, Hopefully, this will now be stopped. But as we as we speak, um, one of the measures to be discussed was to have compulsory public kindergartens from the age of three, which is, of course, um, uh, comes with a, a, an agenda of, of uh, transforming children into uh, instruments of the state and of the ideology of the state. So I would say that this liminal moment, that uh, um, uh, this liminal moment when Europe is, cha is challenged, is for us an occasion to self-reflect, um, to be able to analyze these different trends and the critique, but to reawake, uh, to uh, fight back, and this is precisely, I think, what the forum uh, is doing. Um, the second element I want to talk about is social justice. I will be very brief because I think that my time is coming to an end. Um, so the idea uh, uh, 
woke culture and the appropriation uh, of uh, the agenda of social justice that has been central uh, to the project of Christian Europe by uh, activist um, discourse. Uh, and this comes about um, precisely because uh, over the past 30 years, a fundamental uh, transformation has occurred in um, the notion of uh, identity. So uh, the, the trend of wokeness and cancellation rests on, on a defense of a certain um, uh, I, a certain notion uh, of uh, identity and the defense of identities that had, that were uh, repressed or uh, did not have visibility in um, uh, Western societies. Um, what happened was that over the past decades, um, identity changed from being understood as something personal and utterly particular to becoming a marker of collective belonging. The notion of situated identities, that one's identity is marked by sex, race, class, religion, and that those situated forms of belonging determine how one feels, reasons, and behaves, provides for the activist splintering that sustains a disruptive agenda. The personal becomes a social affair. For instance, a woman shares the fight for empowerment with other women against the male dominance of the public sphere. But a black male is felt to be placed on a lower level of power than a white woman, while a black woman falls lower than the preceding two. If one adds class and education, age and religion to the equation, the possibilities of these activists' shared identities multiply ad infinitum. The movement is spreading and it is spreading rapidly. And this notion of situated identities, uh, which was, uh, became as an intellectual exercise um, cherished um, by the humanities is now being used to cancel out whole disciplines. Um, one of the ways from the, coming from the United States is to claim that um, uh, classics, Greek, the way the Greek and Roman history are taught um, throughout the ages have been the grounds for the support of white supremacists. And this is um, something that has been very vocally defended by classicists at um, Ivy League universities such as Prince, uh, Princeton. And they believe that in order to fight this perception that classics has um, given rise to uh, racism in society as sponsored and as grounded that the whole discipline must change. So it must be uh, destroyed. Um, so out of an argument of identity, a move is on the way to reboot completely what was heretofore understood as culture, memory, legacy, tradition, heritage. Um, transforming completely uh, the intellectual framework with natural uh, impacts in, the, uh, in politics, uh, uh, in society, but most specifically attacking uh, the structure of education. Um, I would say that out of all the dangers to freedom, um, wokeness and cancel culture is uh, one of the strongest. Uh, I think my time is over. I would just like to say that the two other elements that uh, I uh, meant to, to, um, um, to define, to discuss, uh, were the dangers to work uh, by roboticization and the way uh, in which this is, of course, affecting um, the individual's um, right to uh, dignified living and to uh, dignified living uh, working uh, conditions um, and the dissemination of uh, fake news by dint uh, of the uh, abuse, um, uh, conscious abuse of the technological uh, platforms. I, will, I shall end with a quote um, by a philosopher uh, that is not only inspirational, but uh, that uh, 
sharply um, uh, configurates the situation we are living in right now. This, who is um, Hannah Arendt. Uh, she, in, in 1956, in a short text, she wrote that the ideal subject for totalitarianism is not the Nazi or the communist, but the person for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, that is real experience, and the distinction between true and false, that is the patterns of thought, no longer exist. Speaking about the threats to freedom, it is precisely this, I want to end with this. Um, the attacks on, um, the, on truthfulness, the attacks on the distinction between fact and fiction, the attack on education, uh, those are real and present uh, dangers um, uh, that in my field of action, naturally, I feel it is my duty and my mission uh, to combat, but that we all as European citizens should be aware of and uh, work uh, systematically to curb. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Headmaster, Madam Rector. We are uh, enriched by your, uh, by your intervention. Uh, we learned a lot and uh, thank you for your fresh uh, thoughts and uh, excellent argumentation uh, about the freedom and about the challenges. And also we are thankful to you and to your institution, Catholic University in Lisbon, uh, to, uh, to give us the, the premises uh, to organize uh, one of us uh, uh, conference here in Lisbon in so uh, beautiful beautiful uh, premises of the Catholic University. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, without any, any delay, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, three other speakers. Uh, but we start uh, to my left hand side, there is, uh, there is a professor of law, um, faculty of law in Lisbon, Mm, uh, Senor Pedro Barbas Omen. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I, I guess uh, you will speak in, uh, in your language. Yes. <coughs> Começo por felicitar os organizadores do Fórum One of Us Lisboa 2021, que depois de uma pandemia esgotante, constitui um, um momento retemperador de forças antes das próximas batalhas. Saúdo também os meus colegas de painel, bem como toda a assistência. É uma grande alegria poder colaborar com o One of Us e partilhar este espaço com pessoas cujo compromisso com a causa da dignidade humana constitui para todos nós um exemplo. O tema que nos hoje é proposto é o seguinte. As ameaças às liberdades, em especial de consciência, religião, educação e expressão. Como crescem e como devemos enfrentar essas batalhas. Falando depois da reitora da Universidade Católica, que aqui saúde vivamente, poupa a tarefa de identificar algumas dessas ameaças, nomeadamente da cultura woke e como ela está a disseminar-se nos meios de comunicação social e nas universidades e escolas. O pouco tempo disponível, e vou cumprir os meus 15 minutos, obriga a fazer escolhas e assim vou centrar a minha exposição nos seguintes tópicos. As duas revoluções que vivemos, a quarta revolução industrial e a revolução cultural ocidental, a forma como estas revoluções estão a alterar valores e normas e, finalmente, o modo como podemos utilizar a revolução industrial para uma agenda da dignidade humana, restaurando a confiança no Estado de Direito, na democracia representativa e no princípio básico da dignidade da pessoa humana. É hoje em dia claro que vivemos duas revoluções que se alimentam uma da outra. Uma revolução industrial, a quarta, e uma revolução cultural. A quarta revolução industrial, pela sua velocidade e impacto direto sobre todos os sistemas, tem vindo a colocar em causa os limites da ciência. Física, biologia e digital estão hoje interligados. E a ideia de que todas as pessoas estão permanentemente interligadas transformou a governação do mundo e das empresas, mas também a nossa relação uns com os outros. Os avanços tecnológicos emergentes em campos como a inteligência artificial, a robótica, a internet das coisas, os veículos autónomos, a impressão 3D, 
a biotecnologia, o armazenamento de energia e computação quântica exigem novas respostas científicas, claro, mas também novas concepções sociais, uma vez que todas estas transformações tecnológicas, tecnológicas têm um profundo impacto na organização da vida em sociedade. Também no plano cultural vivemos uma revolução. Tenho vindo a utilizar uma fórmula para caracterizar o tempo desta globalização. Todos temos que pensar o mesmo e ao mesmo tempo. É esta combinação das duas revoluções que potencia um ataque nunca antes experimentado às tradições religiosas, políticas e culturais em que nos inserimos. Na verdade, autoproclamadas vanguardas culturais, ao estilo dos guardas da Revolução Islâmica, pretendem hoje em dia dizer o que devemos pensar, dizer, ensinar e acreditar. Como aconteceu noutras revoluções, em especial na Revolução Francesa, que podemos tomar como um exemplo, o programa cultural exato vai sendo definido e alterado ao longo do tempo. A exaltação de um novo tipo de virtudes e de um homem novo, se a palavra homem ou mulher ainda pode ser utilizada, dos novos Robespierre e Danton preparam os seus programas sociais e alteram a linguagem. Talvez um dia alterem, de novo, o calendário e o nome dos dias e dos meses alterem a nossa era cristã. Por hora, a guilhotina funciona em espaços limitados, despedimento de professores, de jornalistas, de homens públicos, proibição e inclusivamente destruição de livros, reescrita de textos do passado. Mas é evidente que será uma questão de tempo para que os limites sejam ultrapassados uma e outra vez. Existe sempre um último tabu para quebrar, uma última barreira a saltar. Como na Revolução Francesa, a ilusão de criar novos cidadãos virtuosos nas novas virtudes revolucionárias woke, como é há pouco referido pela professora Isabel Gil, assenta numa vertigem revolucionária que terá que ser acompanhada todos os dias. A revolução alimenta-se si própria, exige que os cidadãos pecaminosos sejam expulsos das universidades, dos órgãos de comunicação social, dos livros, não aceita a diversidade das tradições dos países, das re regiões, das comunidades, das famílias. Reescreve os clássicos, proíbe a ironia e o riso. Abole os dias do pai, da mãe e da família, palavras que, como homem, mulher e família, passaram a poder designar qualquer conteúdo. Enfim, e só, só em nota, quem está por Lisboa vê agora como uma festa pagã, o Halloween, tomou conta das nossas cidades, enfim, sem nenhuma tradição uh, aqui em Portugal. Estas transformações assentam também num movimento que perverte os alicerces do associativismo dos Estados e coloca em causa os princípios fundadores da democracia representativa a nível local, nacional e supranacional. Na verdade, assinalamos a crescente influência dos poderes informais, soft power, e do direito informal, soft law, nestes vários níveis. As entidades que detêm esta influência e capacidade para determinar a agenda do direito informal, soft law, estão hoje em dia dominadas pelas pessoas e pelas organizações interessadas nessas agendas. Comitês internacionais, peritos ad hoc, comissões para a vigilância da linguagem e do discurso do ódio, entre outros, são organismos que dominam a opinião pública e prescrevem a tribunais, nacionais e internacionais, o que entendem por consenso operativo ou, na terminologia do Conselho da Europa, com um senso europeu. Na forma, na verdade, uma forma de indicar o que se pode ou deve pensar. Anota-se ainda a sempre crescente influência das companhias majestáticas dos nossos dias, as quais controlam as redes sociais, a internet, policiam uh, a internet e exercem poder de Estado sobre esses setores, à imagem das antigas companhias majestáticas dos tempos coloniais. Policiam, fiscalizam, punem, sem recurso para um tribunal, um espaço sem intervenção dos Estados, sem polícia e sem juiz à internet. As novas ideologias colocam em causa as bases da sociedade contemporânea, a ciência e o discurso científico. A ideologia de género põe em causa a ciência, mas a ciência é fundamental para o desenvolvimento e para o progresso dos nossos dias, como vemos destacadamente e como exemplo na invenção e na aplicação industrial de novas vacinas contra a Covid-19 e outras doenças. Aqui chegamos, pergunta-se o que fazer para proteger a liberdade de pensamento e de expressão, a liberdade de opinião, a liberdade de religião no espaço privado e também no espaço público, a proibição da censura, a divulgação de textos, imagens e cultura do passado, 
sem censura ou alterações de fundo, bem essenciais para a defesa da dignidade humana. As instituições que foram no passado o alicerce da esfera pública, do constitucionalismo e do Estado de Direito, terão que ser as fundações desta política. Entre estas instituições, relevo escolas e universidades, igrejas, jornais e outros meios de comunicação social, academias, museus, bibliotecas, livros e livrarias, redes sociais e recursos digitais disponíveis na internet. A defesa destas instituições, como é o caso das escolas e universidades católicas, tem que assentar num compromisso indiscutível com o bem comum. A liberdade de opinião é um bem inestimável, mesmo do lado católico, mas terá que existir um compromisso claro no conteúdo, na mensagem. Como disse a propósito das universidades e das escolas católicas São João Paulo II, em primeiro lugar têm que ser católicas. E esta é uma exigência identitária, sob pena da diluição das instituições. É que as ameaças à liberdade e à identidade não vêm apenas de fora. A liberdade de cata dos professores, a liberdade de objeção de consciência de médicos e de outros profissionais, a liberdade de expressão, exigem instituições adequadas para se afirmarem uma sólida infraestrutura jurídica para fundamentar os seus conteúdos e os seus limites. Mas é necessário persistir na salvaguarda destes direitos fundamentais, nomeadamente assegurando escolhas adequadas para as instituições nacionais e internacionais que são chamadas a arbitrar conflitos jurídicos em nome destes direitos e liberdades. No caso português, como em muitos outros países, a ausência de meios de comunicação social cristãos de âmbito nacional contribui muito para a ausência do ponto, dos pontos de vista católicos no debate público. Finalmente, é necessário retirar lições deste passado recente. É necessário utilizar do mesmo modo que os guardas da Revolução Cultural, os instrumentos tecnológicos da Quarta Revolução Industrial ao serviço das causas do bem. Em diversos países, estações de televisão, sites na internet, redes sociais, novas revistas e jornais, novas instituições de ensino, com métodos inovadores de ensinar e aprender, são bons exemplos. Vimos muitas experiências de sucesso de universidades, escolas e empresas durante a pandemia. Foi possível continuar aulas e outras atividades letivas, criar recursos formativos para estudantes, formar e avaliar esses mesmos estudantes. Muitas editoras apostaram nas edições digitais de jornais, revistas e livros, com bons resultados. É necessário aprofundar estas iniciativas, melhorar a sua qualidade, contribuir criticamente para aprofundar bons conteúdos, limitar a exposição de crianças e jovens a materiais digitais nocivos. Penso que esta oportunidade não deve ser perdida. Em experiências globais que permitam que os nossos jovens, bem como adultos, possam aceder a sites seguros, assistir a aulas e ter bons materiais pedagógicos e científicos disponíveis permanentemente. Em suma, entrar também na quarta revolução industrial. A conclusão principal é esta. A resposta depende sobretudo da capacidade de aproveitar as oportunidades da quarta revolução industrial para derrotar a revolução cultural e criar uma nova agenda da dignidade humana. Não é inevitável que todos pensemos o mesmo e ao mesmo tempo. Esta é uma tarefa de each of us. Muito obrigado. Obrigado. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation and also uh, effort for keeping the time. Unfortunately, we came late from the lunch and the coffee. So we, I am told that uh, we have uh, a little bit to speed up uh, this, uh, this uh, conference. And uh, probably we will not have a, a possibility to take questions our, uh, after this, this panel. Uh, so I, I would like, uh, je voudrais vous demander, s'il vous plaît, de bien vouloir uh, uh, créativement uh, uh, raccourcir un peu votre intervention. Et, um, uh, et uh, donc, je, je donne la parole à, à notre uh, um, participant uh, à, ma, à ma droite, uh, Monsieur Christophe Folchenlogel. Il est avocat au Centre européen de la loi et justice à Strasbourg. Uh, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. Je m'exprimerai en français. Euh, alors, je commencerai par enfoncer quelques portes ouvertes. Nous vivons en Europe, pour la plupart, dans des États qui prétendent défendre la liberté. D'ailleurs, le combat public 
que mène l'Union européenne contre les quelques États qui se prétendent être des démocraties illibérales en est une preuve, selon moi. Ce libéralisme est très largement conçu comme un véritable mode d'existence, ou je devrais-je devrais plutôt dire un mode de coexistence pour accommoder les différents points de vue. En fait, l'axiome du libéralisme européen actuel est que chacun agisse selon ses désirs personnels, que chacun puisse vivre comme il l'entend. On vit sous le règne de « chacun fait ce qu'il veut ». Et finalement, donc, peu importe la finalité de la liberté, le pourquoi de la liberté, peu importe le sens de la liberté, ce qui est légitime, primordial, c'est la liberté individuelle, c'est la volonté individuelle. Et donc le progrès, le progrès, c'est de, ou plutôt enfin, toute règle ou norme qui s'opposerait à la volonté individuelle serait une atteinte à la liberté. Donc nous connaissons ici euh, tous les nombreux exemples qui illustrent cela, avortement, suicide assisté, euh, mariage homosexuel, changement de sexe, etc. Alors, la COVID-19 a quand même eu un impact très intéressant, selon moi, puisqu'il y a eu des restrictions graves et importantes à nos libertés individuelles qui ont été mises en place par des gouvernements de droite, de gauche, de centre. Et, et on a eu l'impression que beaucoup se sont subitement souvenus que l'être humain était un animal social, que nos actions individuelles pouvaient parfois avoir des conséquences néfastes sur autrui, et que l'intérêt général pouvait ou devait parfois primer la volonté individuelle. Alors, est-ce que c'est une réelle prise de conscience de nos concitoyens Est-ce qu'ils ont admis à nouveau que les désirs individuels sont parfois nocifs pour soi-même et pour la communauté Ont-ils admis à nouveau que la communauté est légitime à parfois restreindre la liberté individuelle euh, Malheureusement, je pense que c'était surtout la peur, euh, la peur pour sa propre vie qui a permis de faire accepter très facilement à la majorité des restrictions graves et importantes aux libertés. Je pense que cette acceptation était en fait une sorte d'égoïsme déguisé. Les personnes acceptent des privations de liberté parce qu'ils ont peur pour eux, euh, mais la privation de ces libertés, de, de jouir de, de la société, des services de la société de consommation, euh, n'ont pas été forcément acceptées par un, un, un réel altruisme. Je, je pense que c'est quand même une opportunité pour réaffirmer et, et le dire que, oui, il y, a, il y a des limites objectives et nécessaires à la liberté humaine que la société donc, est légitime à, à imposer. Ça, c'est le premier point. Alors, combien même me, me tromperais-je sur, sur cette analyse, on constate aujourd'hui que tout est renversé en ce qui concerne la compréhension de ce qui est bien pour la société. Par exemple, lorsque nous, conservateurs, critiquons une fausse liberté qu'un gouvernement voudrait reconnaître à certains, nous disons que c'est mal, que c'est nocif, qu'il ne faut pas le faire, on nous répond, mais c'est une question de liberté individuelle, nous n'avons pas à juger, nous n'avons pas à imposer nos valeurs. Et à l'inverse, lorsque nous, nous invoquons des libertés fondamentales, euh, que nous montrons qu'elles sont bien pour la société, conformes au bien commun, on nous les refuse au nom du bien et du mal. Donc, Par exemple, sur l'avortement, nous invoquons le droit à la vie du fœtus. On nous répond aujourd'hui que euh, interdire l'avortement, c'est porter atteinte au droit de la mère que c'est une forme de torture même, puisqu'on l'inquiète. Interdire l'avortement, c'est une torture, c'est mal. L'avortement, c'est une liberté, mais c'est aussi le bien, selon eux. Alors, 
si on admet que l'avortement est une liberté, alors nous, conservateurs, nous allons invoquer l'argument, par exemple, de la période de réflexion. Que la femme enceinte réfléchisse bien, qu'elle fasse un choix réel et éclairé. Mais les militants pro-choix nous répondent, ils ne sont plus pour la liberté et pour la réflexion, ils sont pour l'avortement. Ils se disent pro-choix, mais ils ne sont pas pour le choix, ils sont pour l'avortement, parce que l'avortement, la liberté, c'est de choisir l'avortement. C'est ça ce qu'ils disent. En France, nous avons eu une loi qui s'appelle le délit d'entrave numérique à l'avortement, qui crée un délit lorsque l'on essaye de convaincre une femme qu'elle pourrait regretter d'avoir avorté. Si on lui dit qu'il y aurait des conséquences négatives à l'avortement. Pourtant, avoir un tel discours, c'est une question de liberté d'expression, d'information. Et cette liberté d'expression nous est refusée au nom du, du bien des femmes, euh, des droits des femmes, euh, parce que ce serait des mensonges, des fausses nouvelles de dire que l'avortement serait mauvais. Autre exemple, la clause de conscience des médecins. Finalement, quand on y réfléchit, les médecins qui pratiquaient l'avortement lorsque cela était interdit sont aujourd'hui valorisés pour leur courage. Ils ont osé braver l'interdit, ils ont fait usage de leur conscience. Ça, c'est ce que disent les progressistes. Et aujourd'hui, l'objection de conscience est refusée aux médecins objecteurs et on leur dit que leur comportement est grave. Ils essayent d'imposer leurs valeurs. Ils portent atteinte aux droits des femmes. Donc les notions de bien et de mal sont toujours présentes pour justifier d'une restriction ou d'une libéralisation d'un acte. Les conquêtes se font au nom de la liberté et une fois qu'elles sont acquises, c'est un bien. Un bien subjectif, personnel. Voilà. Donc, encore un autre exemple, le suicide assisté, c'est une liberté nouvelle, une belle liberté, car la personne peut librement décider d'arrêter de souffrir, même si elle, ou si elle ne considère que la vie ne vaut plus la peine d'être vécue. Alors, de, dernier exemple pour la liberté d'expression. Euh, vous voyez, en France, des journalistes veulent interdire à, à un écrivain qui sera peut-être candidat, Éric Zemmour, de parler. Il lui refuse la liberté d'expression parce qu'il prêche la haine, parce qu'il est un danger pour la paix sociale, disent-ils. Et donc, au nom de la paix sociale en France, au nom du combat contre la haine, du combat contre le mal, on doit lui enlever sa liberté d'expression. Voilà plusieurs exemples. Donc, le CLJ peut en témoigner à travers son, son travail. Euh, son travail de protection de la, de la vie, de la famille et des libertés fondamentales, le sens de la liberté est travesti à double titre. Donc double titre, lorsque les progressistes promeuvent leur cause, la liberté est une fin, elle est subjective, personnelle, incontestable, c'est le progrès, c'est une conquête, et après on ne peut plus revenir dessus. Et lorsque nous, nous invoquons la liberté pour faire valoir notre point de vue, là, la liberté redevient un moyen et il est normal de porter atteinte à notre liberté d'expression, à nos libertés d'opinion, d'association, parce que nous, ben nous, 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 nous sommes le mal, nous allons contre les valeurs de la République, nous, allons, nous prêchons la haine, nous, nous avons un discours qui va contre la paix sociale. Etc. Donc il y a un vrai effet cliqué pour les progressistes. Ils réclament la liberté de promouvoir un nouveau droit et une fois qu'il est acquis, il est interdit de revenir dessus et même d'en discuter. L'exemple contemporain, je dirais que c'est le, le mariage homosexuel. Euh, D'abord, il réclame la liberté. 
n'imposez pas vos valeurs, disent-ils, laissez ces gens vivre comme ils l'entendent. Et si aujourd'hui, maintenant que dans beaucoup de pays, le mariage homosexuel est légal, eh bien, il est interdit de le critiquer. Ce n'est pas de la liberté, c'est de l'homophobie. Voilà ce qu'on nous dit. Et je termine euh, euh, simplement sur une autre dernière liberté qui me paraît très importante, c'est celle de l'instruction en famille. Euh, là aussi, en France, nous avons eu une atteinte vraiment très grave sur une, une liberté fondamentale, la possibilité pour les parents d'instruire leur enfant en famille sous un prétexte complètement fallacieux, euh, celui du séparatisme. Il n'y a aucune preuve que les enfants instruits en famille deviennent des séparatistes. Et je pense que c'est un combat très, très important parce que c'est l'éducation, euh, l'instruction publique contemporaine dans la plupart de nos pays occidentaux est idéologiquement euh, sous l'emprise de, de, de la gauche, des progressistes, de, de, de la pensée antichrétienne. Et si même les, les îlots de, de liberté euh, qui existent encore sont empêchés de, de transmettre les valeurs que nous portons, ce sera très difficile de, de garantir la, la liberté et puis d'assurer la, la suite, la relève pour le futur de l'Europe. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Merci, merci beaucoup, uh, merci beaucoup, uh, cher, uh, cher collègue. C'était très instructif et très concret. J'ai bien aimé votre présentation et votre argumentation aussi uh, juridique uh, qui, qui tient debout et qui, uh, qui nous a beaucoup appris. Merci beaucoup en tout cas et à, à, à la prochaine fois. Et je voudrais aussi que vous m'envoyiez votre présentation par email. Hein. Ça, je, je, je voudrais la voir. Uh, so we, we, uh, we are closing this uh, outstanding panel uh, with another outstanding panelist, uh, Mr. Uh, Alois Peterle. We call him Loise because this is the familiar way how we say in Slovenian his, uh, his uh, Christian name. Um, is a uh, uh, democ first democratically elected prime minister of, of Slovakia, former prime minister of Slovenia, Slovenia, sorry, you see how close we are, yes, not only physically, but yeah, by the way, we uh, one time, uh, one, one thousand ago, uh, it is proven that Slovenia and Slovakia were one nation only, yes, and only by some geographical things, we have been kind of divided in two parts. But, uh, but uh, whatever, uh, Mr. Peterle uh, has served uh, not only as a prime minister of uh, Slovenia uh, in this uh, very turbulent uh, time where Yugoslavia was uh, over and uh, they had to defend their uh, liberty and uh, and democracy and uh, and their values. Uh, so uh, we have a real hero here sitting, you know, at this table. And uh, Mr. Petele was also active in many other positions, uh, and among others, he served as a as a member of European Parliament uh, for 15 years. It means in three terms. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, I have to inform my dear colleague that he has only 10 minutes uh, or, or so. So, uh, so please uh, be, be patient and uh, listen to, to his presentation. Loise. Thank you. It's time of digestion, I know, <laughs> after such a good lunch. Uh, It's a privilege to be the last because usually the previous speakers take your points. <laughs> I will try to, to add some of mine despite of that fact. And I, I'm pleased that we share the same diagnosis. Uh, and I'm also happy that we like to go back to the, to the roots. Uh, 
in my view, there are three threats, uh, three main or essential threats. Uh, uh, truth and life are threatened. Uh, uh, they are not considered as absolute values anymore. And the third one, uh, and I would say with growing importance, is the freedom of expression. Uh, people speak about the global governance. Uh, I think it is functioning. And if Facebook leaders are not pleased with your ideas, they simply uh, uh, switch off your, your, your account. account, let's say so. It, it's, it's very simple. Now, how can we express our views? Uh, or we, we have to find uh, other ways. Uh, uh, then, thank you. Uh, my dear friend for mentioning uh, the time 30 years before i think it was quite romantic time we <laughs> we uh, we were sharing at that time the enemy was known the better part of the world was known there was iron curtain there was a historic enlargement of the european union which didn't or does not mean yet truly united europe these are different terms enlarged europe European Union and uh, United Europe. No? And uh, today the situation is much more different, is uh, much more complex and complicated. Uh, fear was mentioned today, uh, lack of trust, uh, lack of clarity. Uh, and for the citizens it's very difficult to to get uh, clear insights uh, into the, the, the different, different problems. Uh, and there is, a, I would say, growing uncertainty. There is not only po polarization. Uh, and um, it seems that everything is fluid. No, there is no solid ground. Uh, and in this respect, really, 30 years ago, the situation was so romantically different. No? Now we are facing, uh, now we, 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 we are participating in a new debate uh, of future of Europe. Uh, and for the first time, the European Union decided for button up approach. Everybody is invited to discuss future of Europe. And so far in several months, around 9,000 people expressed their ideas and around 65,000 commented that in a way I wouldn't say this is not much, but my main point in this regard is that we are discussing different sectorial issues or slogans. Some discuss uh, rights, some discuss migration, some discuss rule of, of law, and so on. But what is missing is a comprehensive approach, I would say, is a European philosophy. The philosophy of a union which began as a community. And I see big difference between the concept of community, where I think the community shares much more than a union. And I regret that the community in 1992 changed into a, a union. Uh, I, I don't like to enter into, into details. Uh, <clears throat> and now, um, you know, the the... the there is a new, very strong slogan and project. This is so-called Green Deal. And it seems that we have to establish some technical standards. We have to finish with uh, CO2, uh, with combustible engines and so on. And in 1935, we will see different Europe. I think that this is quite a superficial understanding of, of, of this very big project, which demands a very strong vertical and horizontal um, coordination and dynamics. If a country will not develop new infrastructure to use uh, electricity or hydrogen, no tourists will come there because they will not be able to refuel their cars and so on. It's, it's, it's very simple. But I think that we cannot do a green Europe uh, with this green deal if there is not also spiritual dimension. Uh, Robert Schuman and Jacques Delors and many others would say we need soul, we need, we need spirit. 
we cannot change paradigm, European paradigm, just in technical terms. Uh, maybe we will have to sacrifice something, no? not just to enjoy uh, more and more and more and more growth. And the spiritual element is the one I think uh, we are particularly responsible for. But our problem is that uh, Christianity today, or for years, has not been considered by the so-called ideologic mainstream or the other side as roots of Europe. They consider Christianity as ideological issue, not as a cultural issue, not as a roots. And I would add that roots are never past. Roots are a very important part of the organism. Without roots, uh, a plant or a tree is over, is off. You know? Uh, and uh, this is this is our problem that in many parts of the today's European society, which is labeling and disqualifying the other side, we don't find people to discuss what is truth, what is life, and we are very we don't speak terms in 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 uh, with the, uh, while using the, the the same the same words. No. Uh, for example, uh, coming from one of the Central European countries, I would like to say also here that there is quite a gap and growing gap in understanding uh, of the same words. In Central Europe, I think we think differently when we say freedom, life, dignity, identity, subsidiarity, family, rule of law. And what can we do together if we don't share the same understanding of these basic values, principles, or concepts? Now, in, in, this, uh, in, in, in this debate, if you go to, 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 to the website of the European Union, you, you will not find, uh, so family is not a keyword, identity is not a keyword, subsidiarity is not a keyword, uh, uh, family for the left side uh, is a suspicious term, community is not a key word and so on but my question is what can we do together if we don't share the same basic basic values uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, i would add that COVID, which additionally polarized european societies in slovenia in particular i would say is not the main virus of the european union i think the main union the virus is is this unity uh, uh, and, and double standards in, in many respects. I would like to finish by um, a memory on, on the debate of Future of Europe, which was led by Valerius Kardestan, who died last year. Uh, he chaired that uh, conven uh, convention. I was part of the, of the presidium representing the then, um, the then candidate countries. And I remember we had the debate whether to include Christianity with explicit mentioning in the preamble of the uh, draft of the constitutional treaty, which later became Lisbon Treaty with some adaptations, let's say so. So there was a slight majority in favor of mentioning of Christianity. My vote was also in favor of that, but Giscard said, Mr. Petro, your vote does not count. You're not yet member of the European Union. Okay, but even without my vote, there was a small majority in favor of mentioning. And then Valerie Giscard stand visited Pope John Paul II in Rome. And he came back with smile on his face because he, he spoke with Pope and Pope said, if you are not able to get through with the idea to mention Christianity, I would support the draft of the constitutional treaty, uh, despite that fact, because there are so many Christian concepts uh, uh, in, in, in the draft of the treaty. Uh, so this is why Giscard was, was happy. So he got a kind of endorsement of the Pope for, for, for the preamble without, without uh, mentioning uh, without mentioning uh, Christianity explicitly. And I think that what is our, our duty in this debate of future of Europe is to, to, of course, not only to be on the side of life, truth, uh, 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 and so on, but to, to come with our points in this, in this debate. And, and I like very much the idea 
to have a particular special conference in, in Brussels. Uh, uh, I would say not in ideologic terms, but in a very essential terms. Uh, and I think uh, we, 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 can, uh, we can come through with, with, with very clear and, and good, good ideas uh, and uh, with concepts, uh, with the value of uh, person, which was contribution of Christians, uh, subsidiarity, uh, and so on. I think I, the, the, I, I heard the sign. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alois uh, Peterle. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, all the panelists. Uh, and uh, I am uh, closing this this uh, panel, uh, leaving you to the next uh, panel. Please uh, understand that we are uh, running out of time uh, when we uh, have to respect uh, the timetable of the whole conference. So uh, I'm glad. Uh, and honored to be with you and uh, uh, please uh, uh, just uh, this is a personal personal thing those who are on Facebook uh, please uh, send me your friendship and I will confirm okay thank you very much <laughs>uh, the Universidad Católica and everybody. And I think it's, it's very good to be here with the people. Uh, we represent part of the Europe that does not accept that we will die. No? We don't accept. En español es la Europa que no se resigna a morir. Es lo que representamos. Y creo que es una gran responsabilidad. We have this responsibility. I will go through some hard numbers. We have heard a lot about philosophy before me, very good ideas, uh, but I will go, I'm an engineer, so I'm not a philosopher, and I'm a, a person of, of numbers. No? And the numbers are very, very tough because the numbers are really terrible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, or if I can have a, whatever, yeah. So this is how Europe is dying. This is the difference between births and deaths. In blue is the total balance, and in yellow is the native Europeans. And you can see that uh, it's not only ne negative, this is in the thousands, but the trend, these things, one year would not matter, no? This is the result of many years without having enough babies, enough babies for population replacement. What this creates is a Europe that is shrinking in native population. Of course, we can replace it or not, through immigration, and then we can integrate it or not properly. We will talk about this later, but this is the classic Europeans. And on top of that, next uh, slide, please. What really happens is that we have fewer and fewer young people. No? If we have 2.1 approximately children per woman, within 30 years, we would have approximately the same number of young people. If we had half 2.1, we'll have, when there are 100 now, there will be 50. No? I put there the numbers of the European Union, Portugal, because we are in Portugal, Spain, and Asturias, not only because I'm from Asturias and because historically Asturias is the cradle of both Spain and Portugal and many other countries, but because it's the first place in Europe that is dying because we have the lowest fertility. Well, until recently, the Canary Islands not only have a volcano now, but also the lowest fertility in Europe. No? And you, you, you see, this is the numbers, this is a projection, a basic projection and you see that how we will have less and less and less. And this is already happening in Asturias, when I was born in 1960. And some years later, the, the current queen of Spain was born in 1972 in Asturias. There were four times more babies than now, with approximately the same population, four times. And nobody talks about this, but this is the real number. So next slide, please. So this is the, uh, it's impossible to predict the future, but we can project, project if things continue whatever the way. This is a Eurostat projection. My own projections are similar. So this is, uh, they have what they call a baseline projection in which they project that a lot of immigration would come. And uh, they have a scenario with a lot of migration and then we would not lose population. There will be replacement. 
but the baseline scenario is in blue and there is a, a scenario without migration. So the difference between the two scenarios would be the new immigrant population, their descendants. You, you can see that it's a lot. It would be a, a lot of percentage and the current Europe is, is already a population with a lot of uh, foreign rooted people. No? So we, with so if we have so much immigration, we can have two, there can be two opposite uh, scenarios. One is that we do a proper integration. The other would be a kind of Lebanonization. No? Lebanon was a multicultural country that worked very well somehow while well, Christians were the majority, the vast majority. But then there was a basic change there through the years and it became the Lebanon that unfortunately the world has known for the past 40 years. This is not a nice example, unfortunately. So next slide, please. So uh, you, you used to be called the old continent and now we are really an old continent. No, This is the median age of the population the number, uh, the age that divides into equal half the population in 1980, uh, two years ago, 2019, and then these are the uh, projections, no? baseline and with immigration. So that's uh, in, already, we have uh, aged a lot. We are much, much older. This is some countries. I was trying to see all the countries that were in this table plus some main countries, but the trend is, is very similar. It's very, very bad. No? And an old society, I mean, the, the problem with having too few kids is not that long term we will disappear, but in the meantime, we will become very, very aged society, a society that has, of course, to spend a lot of money in pensions and things like that, that are uh, okay, as long as we can afford it, a society that is really uh, dying. No? Uh, once you have died, maybe, I mean, if you're good, you go to hell, if, oh, so sorry, to heaven, if not, you go to hell, but before you're dying, no? when you see that you're dying, you probably suffer much more than once you, you die. No? And you, we would see a Europe that is dying. No? A, a buildings that are more and more empty. No? It's like if you see in the night uh, of a country with a lot of, of uh, lights uh, in cities, but you see that they're going down and, and less and less, there are fewer lights. This is uh, what is happening. You know? There is fewer and fewer population. Next slide, please. So what is happening with the family? No? Because this has the result of that is, is not only uh, uh, big numbers for, for people, but for, for, for a society, but for common people. What is happening right now? There is a lot of people who are not having one child, not even one child. That means that when they are old, they will be very a lot alone. And also when they are young, no? if you don't have siblings, no? you don't have a brother or a sister. I mean, it's, it's much harder. It's, uh, you don't have someone to play with. You don't learn from the other. You will not have a, a, a preferential mate for, for a lifetime. No? In Spain, it's around 40% of people don't have one child. I mean, when you uh, hear that there is 1.3 or 1.2 children per woman in a country, nobody has 1.2 or whatever. That's in, it's like in Spain, it's 40% have no children, 20 or something have one, and then some people have more. No? Then uh, the vast majority of Europeans have uh, not uh, many uh, kids and there are very, very few really large families. I have three kids and they call it large family. For me, I'm from the old school that large families were something a little bit more. No? But uh, this is the case, very, very few uh, authentic large fa families. Marriages uh, have fallen. I mean, people don't marry anymore, half of the people approximately. And of those who marry, divorce a lot. And this is dramatic for me, for the couples, but especially for their kids. And this costs a lot of fertility to countries because uh, if people divorce uh, when after 30 years of marriage, they would have had all the kids that they were planning to have. But when you divorce next year after getting married, I mean, this project of a family is, is broken with no children or at most with one. No? Uh, Born, children born out of wedlock. This is more and more, there are more and more children born out of wedlock of families that are not uh, married. And this means that typically they're even more, uh, less stable than married families. There is an unprecedented, unprecedented rate of ratio of children without father, a lot. I mean, in, in Norway, for instance, in the official statistics, uh, there is uh, a woman can be either married or in a cohabiting couple around 11% are single. In, you see in Germany, you look at statistics because uh, they don't say uh, children without a father, but you go to the statistics and you have statistics 
by the age of the mother and by the age of the father. And then there is, if 5% of children, the age of the father is unknown, probably there is not an official father there. No? This is the, the assumption. No? So uh, an increasing number of children don't live with one of their parents. It's amazing how we don't care about that. I mean, because this is a lot of suffering and, and very bad for the future, no? not to be raised with one of the parents, typically the father. No? And then, of course, on the other hand, there is a growing number of modern families, as they say in the TV series, or alternative families. And typically, the problem with fertility for countries is that they have fewer children. I'm talking about all the things we can discuss, morally, whatever, but hard facts hard fact is that all these alternative families have fewer children. So as a result, we have much more, uh, the, uh, the crisis of the family means demographic suicide, means loneliness. Loneliness is a big problem, growing problem, and uh, societies that are not sustainable in the future. Next, next slide, please. So what are the, uh, this has, is something that has never happened in, in, in history, having so few kids and, and living so long time at the same time. So we can mostly speculate, we can look at Japan, we can look at my Asturias, what is happening, you know, but you can think that the economy is going to be very badly, that people are going to have be more and more people alone, that politics is going to be dominated by retired people. And this is not good that politics is dominated by a segment of the population, but a balance between the different ages, sexes and whatever. If there is a dominant uh, uh, part of society, it will probably, not them, but politicians will favor them too much. And then on geopolitics, we tend to irrelevance. So Europe is, and the West is tending to irrelevance because our weight in a world that is finally developing is less and less. No? Next slide. There are some positive side effects, but are, these are like the positive side effects of, of, of dying. I mean, all the problems disappear. No? Yes, we are going to spend less in education probably, but we, because we will have to spend more in pensions and things like that. There will be no crime. Crime is typically uh, something of young people, revolutions, violent revolutions. In Spain, we have four years ago in Catalonia, we have a problem that in the past would probably have cost us many lives, a revolt, but Fortunately, nothing happened of that. I mean, we were relatively close to something very, very serious and even a civil war, but there was no civil war. In the past, we would, many people would have died in a situation like that. And this is probably linked to a very aged society. It, it contributes. It's probably not the only explanation, but certainly a very, very aged society is less violent. So next slide, please. This is the, the human weight of Europe in the world. I mean, we were like 20%, 25% in the Belle Epoque before we started to commit our political suicide with the First World War. That was the first political suicide. Now we are in demographic suicide, but this was political suicide. And as you can see, we are less and less in the world. We are now less than 10%, from 25% to 10% and uh, going down. No? Next, please. Loneliness is probably the scourge of the of the 21st century. No, I mean fewer, more and more people live alone. In Spain, the percentage, the share of people living alone has multiplied by six in 50 years, and this is the same everywhere. No, and this is something, by the way, that is not only sad; it can be bad for your health, your mental health, and physical health, and it also costs a lot of money. No? When a couple divorces the same number of people have to live in two different houses. So they have to spend more to be alive. So this is something that uh, the real welfare, the real GDP, the real well-being uh, is something that is uh, damaging it. You know? and, and nothing, nobody talks about that. So this is a, a, a kind of simulation of the number of relatives that people have, would have if everybody had the same number of kids. You know? With one, you would only have one child and then one grandchild. You know? In the past, we had a lot of uh, siblings, a lot of cousins, a lot of whatever. No? And, and in Spain, we are around this 1.3 and going to 1.2. And it's, I think three more, uh, please, uh, next slide. So then many people say, well, the solution is immigration, but this cannot be a full solution, never. It's impossible, why? Immigration can deliver low skilled uh, manpower because there is a lot of people in the world that would like to come to Europe, but there is not high skilled. High, we need the high skilled 
And by the way, it will not be very solidarian to get the best people in developing countries. They need their best engineers, the most qualified people for developing themselves. And they say, no, 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 we are rich. We pay you, you come here. No? So it cannot provide high skilled people. And it cannot provide, give me my children that I don't have. I mean, people only think uh, in money, no? in, in uh, manpower. But we need children not just for society, but for ourselves, for becoming integral individuals, typically integral individuals that project a life. Of course, with some exceptions, people who devote their life to God no? and some people, but 90% of people typically have kids no? and they have grandchildren and things like that. I cannot import an immigrant to be my child when I'm old to take care of me. I cannot import their very few international adoptions, a child to be the brother of my single child. No? Uh, and so this is something that the immigration cannot provide. And then there are clear risks about having too much immigration. This is the case of Spain. We have a lot of unemployment and still immigrants continue to come because our welfare state attracts them. There is, of course, the problem of potential integration with Muslim immigration, especially. And uh, it also, uh, there is a danger with immigration that makes the feeling for many people that it, there is not a problem, we don't have children. It's a kind of anesthesia. No? that we have a problem not having children and people say, no, don't worry. Immigrants will come and will cover this for us. What happens if they don't come? If the countries finally develop, then we are dead. No? And then there are moral hazards. No? We are uh, in this uh, community. We are Christian. We are moral people here. I mean, actually, what we, when we take an immigrant, is uh, we are uh, to a given person. He's being taken away from his family, from his friends, because uh, we are rich and we can uh, take you here to, to wash our floor and things like that. We don't care if you personally, because it's very difficult to be a very high skill immigrant and you go to work in the aerospace in the United States and you get a very good salary. This is not exactly the same as going to another country just for washing dishes. So uh, next slide, please. The numbers of, uh, we talk about the, the Christian roots of Europe, they are the moral, the classical, but the human roots, uh, the, we have a growing number of, of Muslim population. Uh, figures are not very easy to, to get. Uh, typically, national statistical bodies, they don't uh, make uh, very clear figures. This is the best I have been able to compile using official data uh, in this time of uh, post-truth. I, I cannot, you cannot trust unofficial data. But uh, of course, France uh, is in, on top. Belgium would be as well there, but I don't have figures for Belgium. No? In France, uh, my estimate is that between 25 and 35% of babies today are from Muslim parents, either from first or second generation, combining two generations. And in some, this is the national average. That means that in some regions, there are much many more. And we can see next slide what's happening in a, in a in a place in Spain. No? In Spain, this is a city in Catalonia, in Girona, salt, uh, like sal, Catalan. So 70% of babies are from uh, foreign mothers and 52% from Africa. No? And this is something that has happened just in 25 years. So probably, yes, there is a challenge for, for assimilation of all this. And next, and I think it's there. So what can we do? I mean, we certainly have to take this as a first priority, as, as is being done, I have here Balas from Hungary. Uh, in, in a few countries, this is a top priority. And this is, I think, the correct thing to do, to get this as a top priority, to recover. We need to recover families. We need to recover uh, fertility, a uh, birth rate. Otherwise, uh, our societies would not be viable. No? But this is not something only about the government. It's something also about civil society. It's very easy to say, let the politicians do. We can all do. And companies, no? individuals and companies, NGOs, and private citizens, we can help. We can help people who want or don't want to have children. Abortion, no? there is something about the abortion law, but when there is a case in your family, you can tell, yes, yes, you are 18 years old, you are pregnant. Okay, it is not the ideal thing, but please have the baby, we'll help you. This is very different from saying, no, 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 no. It, that's very different. So I finish, I think this is maybe the last or next, next, next slide, please. So something that is critical no, is marriage. Married people have more children than unmarried people. And also another factor, this is the same in every country, 
And another factor that is critical is religion. No? Religious people have more children. Of course, we cannot force anybody to believe in God or not, but what governments cannot do is be hostile in Europe against uh, Christianity. Because more Christian people, Jewish people who are more religious, even Muslim, have more children. And we need children. So it's not acceptable that governments are against. I mean, they should be neutral, maybe, in a current society, or it can be. But they cannot be against, because we are dying. And the families that are more religious, for instance, in Spain, everybody knows that people from Opus Dei and uh, other kind of movements have many more children. So we should not criticize them for that, but uh, praise them. And this is the, the last. Thank you. Next one on, on the panel is someone who has done the job. It is Francisco Villena da Cunha. He has nine children. Wow. Bravo. I'm a theoretical guy. Well, can I use this one? Sorry. Yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much. It's a, uh, can you hear me? It's okay, perfect. So thank you very much. It's an honor to be here uh, representing the Portuguese Large Families Association. Also proud to say that we are presenting work from the Portuguese Federation for Life as well. So we have had a perfect introduction, I would say, on demographics, what is happening, why do we need families for uh, demography, uh, and so on, and about the consequences. I would like to dwell with you in the follow-on to this. So what we know is that families are not born from policies. They are born from individual decisions. And of course, we know that these decisions might in fact be influenced by culture and by context. And you, we know that policies shape both this context and this, um, and this culture. Well, I'm also an engineer, but <laughs> <laughs> not showing to be a very good one. So in terms of contents, we'll look into culture, policy and politics. And I think it's important for us to consider this distinction because we know, well, we have a lot of ideology going into family policy. We will also look into the, having a closer look into Portugal. We have more data there. We have been studying Portugal for some more years. And also after that, looking ahead. And here, actually, it's more to make you work than myself. It's just putting forth some questions and some issues that we could address here later on or uh, after these sessions. So about culture, family policy, and politics. One of our main concerns is, in fact, how can we take ideology out of family policy? We all know that we have a social democrat uh, model for families, a familialistic well-being uh, model for fam families in other countries. But can we take ideology out of this? Because we usually say family is not left or right. Family is a people thing. And some people are uh, more left-wing, some are more right-wing. How could we take this? So in the, uh, in the APFN, we have started to look at this. I'm sorry, this, this picture, it's, uh, well, this uh, plot is not the easiest one, but uh, try, I, I will try to, to guide you through it. Uh, what we see, in fact, is that if we look at the total fertility rate, we have the 2.1 over there. It looks like a maximum. Actually, it's a minimum. It's the minimum that we need to replace the generations. We know that but we are not that well, so it's, it's in the top of the graph. And then we have there the 1.5, which I've heard some uh, demographers say that it's the point of no return. Let's see. And what we see that, what we have plotted in the top axis is how much has this fertility growth uh, grew in the past 10 years. Uh, and so here to the right, we have the countries that have increased the fertility rates. To the left, we have the countries that have not increased the fertility rates. So what's the corollary of this? Whatever these countries have done, it has worked. Whatever those countries have done, it, it has not worked. Of course, founded by context, culture, and so on. So 
uh, our, our idea is to start plotting countries here. And we see that, in fact, policy and politics play a role. And you'll see the countries that are over there. Most of them are there in the table as well. And you know that you need governments that, in fact, can, can, take, uh, can take policies uh, policies ahead. Actually, I'm quite proud. Portugal was very over there. And now it's slightly more here. But we know that. In fact, we have some countries that are doing something that is working. Uh, and the interesting part here is that looking at the common features of these policies, we know first that they are family policies. It's not a low income policies. It's not policies to help people that don't, have, uh, don't earn a minimum wage. They are not birth related policies, demographic policies. It's not, well, I'm not sure, not sure, sorry. Uh, I think it's going. It has a mind of its own now. So um, the issue is that they are policies targeted at families and not only at birth, but considering that the child will be with the family 20, well, now 40 years sometimes. So uh, they need to consider all the phases of the life of the family. They are positive. They consider one child as a benefit, as a good in its own not as a burden, as a cost, as a lot of work or something like that. And the good in itself, not only for the family, but also for society as well. They are stable. It doesn't work to have a policy. Now you'll have this type of support two years ahead. Our child is one and a half. Well, the policy changes. It doesn't work like that. And they are comprehensive and coherent. And finally, very, very important. They are subsidiary policies. They favor freedom, and they favor the freedom of parents. We have here our national heroes, Artur and Paula, they are over there. In next session, they will tell you about what is fighting for freedom here in Portugal. But what happens in fact, is that these families, the, these policies, they support the families. They are not coming against the family and taking the role of parents of educating their child. So going a little bit deeper, this is one of those graphics that we use sometimes. We have over there in the dark blue, the actual fertility, how many children our family having? And in the light blue, how many children would, family like, would families like to have? And what we see is that the light blue is affected by culture. How many children will I want to have? And we see that in some countries, and let me unfortunately point to Austria, if people were having the children that they would like to have, they would not be replacing generations. And let's look at countries like, well, fortunately, Portugal and Poland, that if families had the conditions or what they understood to be the conditions to replace the generations, they would in fact have children. So what we see is the light blue is the, is the room to work on the culture side. The gap between the dark blue and the light blue, it's where policies and context can come in. How can we help families to have the children that they would like, in fact, to have? And then there's, of course, an influence of a negative culture. Spengler, one of, uh, well, a Forbes uh, editor, said sometimes, quoting someone else, that, in fact, urbanization and, so, and pension funds made children go from being an investment to becoming a burden because you didn't need children anymore to farm your land and you didn't need children anymore to take care of you while you are in old age. And we see some examples, these are from 2014 and, uh, and uh, 13 and 14, saying that child-free life, when the children become an obstacle to a fulfilling life. So it's not only that you might not have children if you don't want, it's about freedom once again, it's children will hinder you from fulfilling your life. And this is complicated. This was seven years ago. So closer look at Portugal and now going really fast because I'd like to go more on the next session. Well, the uh, on next section, actually it's the same story that we have everywhere. We have been reducing uh, birth from uh, birth since the uh, 1960s. Right now we, ha we have more, um, more, oh, more uh, death than uh, birth. And if we look at the past 20 years, we see that we have had a lot of firsts, things that started to happen now in, um, in the last 20 years that they didn't happen so far. So I, I, will, I, I will tell you what, what is happening there. 2000, two, 2007, uh, we had the first, the first time that we had a negative, sorry, 
we need to go to the next one. Yes, um, the 2007 was the first time that we have a negative natural balance, more death than birth, right? Uh, 2009, first, uh, first time that we went below 1,000 births per year. And 2014 that you have over there is the all-time low. It's 80,000, 82,000 births, which is around half of what we would need to replace the generations. And there you have the two, seven, well. And the, the, the conclusion is more or less the same that we have just heard. We are missing 1.8 million people in Portugal to replace the generations, it to have a sustainable, a sustainable approach to our society. These would be the people that we, we would have needed to be born from 82 until now, that now would have between, well, zero and uh, 40, 40 years old. And so it cannot make us, uh, it, cannot make, it cannot be strange for us that we have, uh, sorry, I don't know if I'm, uh, it, it cannot be strange for us that we have, in fact, uh, this is our uh, pyramid, we, you know, well, well, sorry. This is 1980, it was, in fact, a pyramid. No, sorry. Yes, next one, please. Yes. So, the 2019, we see that it's more of a coffin, and the conclusion is the 1.8 million people that we are missing, uh, that we don't have. Uh, right now in, in our country. Okay, so of course this has, a, this, this has, uh, this has consequences for sure. Uh, as Isilda says many times, shoes that weren't sold, baby clothes that wasn't sold, diapers, schools that closed, teachers in unemployment. It cannot make us, it cannot be a surprise that we have unemployment in teachers rising much more than, than in other uh, professional categories. Going, going further, looking ahead, and now going to the final slides. So, don't people want to have children? Well, they want, in fact. This is a study made in Portugal. Uh, we see the green is the, we need to go, okay, thank you. The green is the one that is the desired fertility. It's above 2.1. So if people have the children that they would like, we would be okay. It's also a phenomena that in UK, say they call the NIMBYs, right? Is that, People consider that the ideal fertility rate is like the 2.4, but for me, I will stay with the 2.3. So let others have the children. Uh, but in fact, what we see is that the expected is much lower and the real even lower than that. So then we have the childlessness. This, this is also very important, is the percentage of women who reach 50 years old without children. And I'm once again, very proud that Portugal is over there. We have less than five, percent of the women that uh, uh, reach the end of the uh, reach 50 years old without uh, children once again it's not that women need to have children and should be obliged to have children no what we uh, we know from the previous inquiries that women in fact want to have children so they should feel free to uh, follow their dreams so uh, also the reasons for not having children it's more or less the same i will just take on the consumption expectations sometimes the reason is this one I, when I was born, my parents, well, generations before us, I'm not that young, but uh, uh, earlier generations, uh, our parents uh, strived really hard to make a living. And so they wanted to have few children to give them more than what they had in the past. Our generation, we had a lot. And so we want to have few, few children so that we can give them the same that we, that we had. So expect, consumption expectations are always playing a role one, one side or one, one side or the other. So going, and of course, well, abortion, I cannot not talk about abortion. Uh, we have then this for the Portuguese Pro-Life Federation. It looks impressive, but we have almost two, 240,000 legal abortions just because the mother want, wanted it so. Well, we can discuss about what's, what one thing is. Um, and it seems that it seems like it's normal. Uh, and of course, we also see that a third child, a pregnancy of a third child, has much more probability to terminate in abortion than the probability of the pregnancies of uh, um, first and second borns. Okay, so same thing with the abortion pill, the same uh, uh, abortion culture. Trying to move on. Okay. 
just uh, delving a little bit here. One of us, we all know what this was. It was a petition that we had uh, to defend. Uh, well, actually it was much more complex than that, but to defend the embryo, uh, defend one of us in one of each fragile states uh, of our lives. We had similar petitions for bulls in Portugal to protect, uh, to, protect um, to make justice because Simba was killed by someone. And so people wanted, uh, there was a petition to get that man in jail. And then another petition not to terminate the life of Zico because he had killed a one year old baby. Uh, but then convert him and now he's called Mandela and supposedly living somewhere. Uh, what we see is that one of us, you all know the effort we, which was behind it of getting all the signatures. In Portugal, we got 74,000 in one year and it was a lot of work, not mine, from the people that are here. They worked a lot to get these signatures. The Bulls got 70,000 signatures in a few months. Simba got 120,000 signatures in one year compare it with one of us, and Zico Mandela, 70,000 in one month. So people are moved at what is actually moving them. This is another one about the media boycott. This was one of the, our marches for life in 2013. There was no news in the, in the main press, in main media press, except this one, because there were 30 people, uh, well, having an homage to some uh, fallen soldiers, great, but there were, there were some thousands of people behind them. And this was the only picture that we saw in mainstream media about, uh, about this March for Life. So just term going, closing, final remarks. It's about individual decisions. And individual decisions, they are usually not made out of patriotism. I don't have my children because I'm patriot. Well, uh, I, I like contributing to my country. But in fact, individu so it's individual decisions, the ones that will save Europe in the future, that the people who are being born right now, that will, our children, that our teenagers will make in the next 20 to 30 years that will help us in fact to shape the future of Europe. And what we know is that they will make these decisions out of the conviction that having a family, and as we were hearing, committing for life to a family is one of the most fulfilling pathways they can get in, in their lives. Also, I would add one other scourge to solitude because I fully agree that solitude is one of the scourges of this center. It's fear. It's fear. Fear of leaving something different. Fear, fear of being seen as an irresponsible. Fear of not being able to control everything. And if it's something that we know even with three, three children, it, we don't control anything. It's not something we never control, but sometimes we have that illusion. And so with fear, we see sometimes people uh, coming in together and the Portuguese Large Family Association had a very interesting initiative here, which is network of fam networking families and having the younger families to see that it's possible. Just a small anecdote on my story. I, I joined the association when I had three children. And when I went there a few hours later, I called my wife and, say, and said, look, there are people here with six children, eight, nine, and they can do it. So maybe we can as well. So this has a lot to getting the confidence to live the life that in fact we want to live, it's very important. So it needs to, we need to surpass this uh, sense of fear. And when we start to lose a sense of transcendence, it's harder to fight this fear. Because we, when we start accepting that uh, the things that we don't control are controlled by someone else that really likes us, it gets more difficult. And finally, well, cultural of well-being, I'm, I, I will pass this one. Uh, and just getting this question, what are the messages that we are passing to our youth? We are in a university, great one, uh, but we are very much focused everywhere in training our youth to become very good professionals. Are we training them to commit to something for life? Whatever is that, either a family, either a cause, either something. Are we training people to, are our children devoting as much time to study uh, as they are devoting, uh, building character, committing and understanding that only by commitment, they will be true, truly happy people. So that's the question. And finally, just saying that I think we have a role here, not beyond the policies, families have a role because I think that looking at other normal, happy families, it's one of the things that can help young people to lose uh, part of their fear and understand that in fact, that can, they can follow their, their hearts and they can be confident that we as a society through policies will be here to support them through the journey. So thank you. Please go closer to the mic. 
I will try to do so. Um, there are so many discrimination in life. <laughs> so better now. Good. So um, I would I would also like to like to thank uh, Prime Minister uh, Peter Lef for mentioning mentioning his role in in Christianity in in actually the shaping of the future of, of Europe. I believe from the Hungarian and Polish Central European perspective, we cannot uh, be thankful enough. Uh, how do I move my presentation? Could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So uh, I was, I was, when I was preparing for this um, this presentation, I thought that I will have uh, have the word as the, the third speaker, and that so many wise words will already be said. So I, I was trying to to uh, formulate it on a way that I will not be boring. But I believe that there are some messages which we do have to reiterate though so we are if we are talking about the future of europe we are losing relevance in the global world in the modern global world the population uh, alejandro already told us is projected to be only six percent in 2070 the last figure i found uh, of the world's uh, share of gdp from arising from the eu countries still has the the second largest economy the brits included and that was then uh, in 2014 16 percent so imagine without the brits we are not even reaching 10 percent i believe but we have no single member state where we actually would reach the the fertility level uh, for renewal and yes 2.1 should be the base and but that's something where uh, we are very far away from and of course, we have a, a lot of uh, sectoral political problems because of that, that we are not reaching renewal. Aging is an issue. We live healthier, we live longer. Do we really live healthier? It is always a question. If we go to cemeteries in small villages, we are not living. We are not living naturally uh, longer, actually. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of, lot of uh, mentally ill, and we have a lot of, lot of uh, chronic diseases as well. But statistics show that we actually live longer. And of course, sustainability question. Yes, healthcare. Yes, uh, sustainability of pension funds. Yes, workforce. What will happen? Who will, who will work in, in uh, the next coming year, next coming decades? Also, already in the midterm, we have issues. The German Post has been recruiting postmen, simple postmen in Hungary in the last month. So uh, it does not look like that mass migration solves workforce uh, issues, not even for relatively low skilled work. And of course, we are not talking about demographic challenges. Uh, the European Commission used to have a, a demographic uh, conference organized every second year, but then they just discontinued it in 2016 i believe was the last one and now we don't have it anymore um, and and we had had a fantastic slide from the media that children are invisible in our cultures we have an adults only culture in the modern world especially in europe but also america you can go to an adult uh, only hotel you can book your flight ticket uh, on a on a, a plane uh, where at that section you will not meet any disturbing uh, small individuals. Uh, next slide, please. And then the paradox on goes on as we we believe that uh, that from the European policies, at least, what what you certainly can say is that motherhood is not valued as something positive per se for the entire uh, society. Mothers, especially well-trained mothers, are seen as someone who is losing out on, on a career. They even say that this is a lost investment. And actually, I have myself heard it from a European Union official, but well, right, relatively high level one, that if you, if you have a child and you are well-trained, then you should hire someone who is not that well-trained and that will raise your child. And when I mentioned that maybe it's not exactly the same for the child, then there was big silence and then we moved on to something else. Um, um, and then, uh, of course, we, we experience charges against the traditional family. And we, in Hungary, we believe that the basic building block of any successful and happy society is indeed the traditional family. And, and we have to be very, very cautious there, and we have to recognize these charges, and we have to fight these back. There is a relativization of the marriage between one woman and one man. 
But of course, there is a constant push for, for same-sex marriage. So how come marriage, if it's a traditional marriage, it is something to be relativized, condemned, uh, made, it, made equal with domestic violence. But of course, for same-sex couple, it is something very modern and something very progressive. And then uh, we have mentioned uh, children born in and out of wedlock. We all know that there are more children born in wedlock than out of wedlock. We all know from scientific data from the US and from Europe that actually those who were raised in an intact family, so within wedlock, they will have better educational attainment, they will have better prospects in the work life, and they will be less exposed to, to becoming a criminal, a drug addict, an addict, and so on. So actually, uh, marriage is something which is very, very important if we want to move forward. If I may quote here uh, our study from a study from our institute, when we asked Hungarians last year about the, the three more uh, most uh, important factors when they decide about the number of their children, the first is a stable partnership marriage. The second one is a stable employment and the third one is a home where which uh, which they in Hungary at least they want to own themselves. So these are the three most important factors. And then we go down to the, the slide which was very rightly being said stability, stability of a partnership, stability of, of decent employment and the stability that actually also someone who, who, who wishes to live in a household of 11 can afford a decent housing. And then of course, churches representing eternal values are, are condemned, but we also see that churches do give in. We also see that the, that the German Catholic Church is not obeying uh, orders coming from the Vatican when it comes to same-sex marriage. We also see the Scottish Reformed Church uh, making it uh, possible at not yet uh, compulsory but possible for, uh, for their priests to, to marry uh, same-sex couples. And of course, we have talked about abortion. This is seen as the peak of, of women's rights. And of course, we have huge marches for that because that is indeed the most important issue. Um, on abortion, I just want to uh, mention here one Hungarian policy. And this is that after the 12th week of pregnancy, practically all all, uh, so all uh, family uh, benefits are, uh, are paid out to, to the parents. So when, an, when a, a pregnant woman has, uh, has an attest from the doctor that the pregnancy passed the 12th week, we all know why the 12th week, and then, uh, then actually uh, that, that human being is seen also according to the Hungarian family law as, as a born human being. But I was quite negative until now. Next slide, please. I would like to say that there is hope, though. Could I please have the next slide, please? Yes. So ideal number of children, we have talked about that. Ideal number is always a bit more than, uh, than the, the actually planned children. Um, it is well over two in the European Union. Uh, this is a study done by a, by a conservative uh, political foundation with, in cooperation with our institute. It is, it is a study which is representative for all European Union and uh, member state and the UK and Norway and uh, Switzerland. So it is well over two in Europe. Childlessness is something which we can see that there is 5% there is of Europeans who believe that uh, life without a child is ideal. And there is a big difference between, between uh, regions. And there you can see that in the Visegrad it is three, but for example, it, Hungary it is only 1%. The highest is in Finland and Germany, it's 8%. So there's eight times more uh, people in, in Finland and in Germany who believe that uh, life without a child is ideal. But I want to come down to one thing here. And this is that uh, the two children family is ideal everywhere. 60% is the, exactly the same, where the big difference to Eastern Europe or uh, former uh, socialist countries is, is the large family, so the three plus. And there you can see that it's not uh, 16 or 14%, but 24. So every, every uh, fourth uh, Eastern European uh, can imagine to live in a large family, actually more, because we also have 3% who can imagine living in uh, a four plus. Uh, household four plus family. Next slide, please. And then this one is also a quite uh, nice question, I believe. We asked them on how important is family in your own life. 
and 91% of the European Union, uh, no, 81% of the European Union respondents said that this is either important or very important. And it all, the high, highest numbers were uh, 98%, 97%, so practically everyone. But also in the, in the Netherlands, uh, we measured the lowest number, but the lowest number is 82%. So uh, I believe that the hope is indeed there. I, I just wonder why uh, we need a Hungarian uh, political foundation to ask such, such questions in Western Europe, because I've never seen any such study uh, made in these countries. Uh, next slide, please. Again, um, how important is it that the state supports families and the state supports starting of a family? And there we can say that 81% in Europe were favorable. Uh, and then we can also say that the, that the best ones were, were uh, saying that 95% said that this is indeed important, whereby the lowest figures are around 70%. So it is again something where, where even the so-called lowest have, have very, very good uh, figures. And then the next one, please. This is a quite provocative question. And there we asked whether the states or the countries should rather uh, support uh, families than migration when they address the population decline. And there again, uh, there is more than twice as many Europeans in the entire Europe who say, so it is 57 to 24, who rather say that they should support their own families and not migration when addressing truly given demographic challenges. And then um, it is very, uh, very um, nice to see that uh, actually twice as many Europeans uh, say the same, even in the founding, uh, so the so-called old member state, I don't like that, uh, that uh, definition, but still. So those who joined before 2004, even there, it is 53 to 27. And then all member states agree, but uh, so even, Every member state, that is there, there is a positivity. Uh, so more say that we should help families and not migration. But in Ireland and the UK, um, I believe that both is a quite global nation and that should uh, address that. But I believe that what is more, more exciting is that we have in many countries, for example, in, the, in Denmark and in the Netherlands, that every fourth respondents were not saying what they thought. So it is, it is quite nice. Uh, we were talking about culture. Maybe it's, it's the, the mainstream culture is already uh, rooted that much that this is not something which, which they are happy to share. And then the last one from this uh, big study, please. It is whether we need um, family-friendly attitudes, uh, not just financial support. And I believe that we have talked about that in the previous presentations as well that what will, what will help us to have those desired number of children? According to Hungarians in childbearing ages, it is, is 2.37. That's the number of desired children. And we are now with the highest growth in the last 10 years, that was 24% uh, more in fertility. So 24% uh, growth in fertility in the last 10 years, we are now at 1.55. So we are still very far away from, from what actually those who should have those children are, are stating. Um, and then here we also have an overwhelming support. Even the, the least positive uh, response is coming from the, the Danish and the Dutch uh, were over 70%. So yes, family-friendly attitudes. And I will come back to that why it is so important. And the next one, please. I just want to, I thought that this will be a subject which, which not necessarily has been touched yet. We have made uh, two studies in parallel, our institute. The one is a representative study from Hungary, that is the, the right column. And uh, we also did one with the European Large Federation Association, where 11 countries, from 11 countries, we have responses from, uh, from large families. And the first one is that we, we asked them, what do you think about these new trends that many, including Meghan and Harry and other celebrities stating that we will not have a child or we will not have a second, third, fourth child because we believe that that's the, that's the solution for the, for the environmental crisis and then the children and the diapers and whatever have a huge CO2 emission. And that, that shows very well 
uh, that that actually uh, even uh, in a representative study, 70%, 69% of Hungarians cannot disagree, cannot agree with that statement. As of course, uh, it's it is even higher in the in the Hungarian. Uh, that's the middle column. It's the Hungarian large families, 86%. So practically everyone. And in the European large families, it is 71%. So that, that again shows a bit of a cultural disparity in the European Union, that in the average Hungarian sample is practically identical to the, to the European sample uh, of, of large families. And the next slide, please. Of course, large families, those who have children, they want to keep the, the, the world, the, the nature as, as uh, beautiful and fantastic for their old children. So I, I believe that that this is uh, why why all these accusations are are faulty because of course those of us who have children we would we would do anything to to raise our children in an environmentally cautious way and uh, what I I certainly can say that out of these it came out that that around the the lunch table the dinner table uh, the environment is indeed something very exciting and I will come to my last uh, slide. What can be the successful uh, demographic policies? Uh, well, it is a it is a good question. Uh, I just would like to start with something at, at how much culture is actually defining uh, and all the surroundings, policies and politics in Hungary uh, between 20, 2002 and two thousand ten. We had the left wing. Uh, liberal government, but that corresponded to the times when my generation, I was born in 76, the so-called uh, Ratko uh, cohort, it's a large cohort, uh, many uh, young people were born, uh, it's because of the first abortion ban in the 50s, and then their grandchildren came into the, came into the, uh, or their children came into the, to the ages of ideal childbearing ages, and that's exactly when, because of wrong political uh, environment and wrong policy decision, the fertility dropped to historic low. So when uh, Fidesz took office in 2010, uh, they faced uh, the lowest ever fertility of 1.23. And in the last 10 years, we are facing uh, a double hurdle. It, it means that we have more than quarter of a million women less in childbearing ages than, than they had in their times. And that's exactly when we missed out a lot on, on uh, having, having as many babies as only possible. So it is policies and politics as well. And then just a very important, uh, just a few sentences. So family friendly shift, uh, strengthening communities, showing young, healthy, happy families uh, with a lot of children. If it's nine, then it's nine. If it's two, it's two. If it's three, I mean, it's, it's an individual decision we have seen. And then of course, we also have to be very cautious on saying that, that someone does not have a child. We all know that how many of our friends, our family members do have to fight for having, having children because of, for example, health problems. So yes, strengthening communities, show it as a relevant way out, show it that there is a big uh, community, that you are not alone, that you want a lot of children. We have a fantastic and very engaged uh, large families association in Hungary as well. Yes, we have to help young uh, Hungarians to, to uh, opt for as many children as they want. I, I already listed you the three most important issues. In Hungary, we have nearly 1 million people more in employment in 2020 than we had in 2010. So whoever wants to work can work. And of course, the stability is indeed very important. Address the prolongations of childbirth. We have to do something with that if we want to close the gap between desired children and actually born children. Uh, we managed to reach uh, sort of encouraging results that since 1950 or uh, um, the, the, the trend stopped, but we are again also at, at 29 uh, years of age, which already means uh, means that at many uh, in many families the second third fourth will not be born just because of biological reasons and if i as a as a man and the father of three may may say a sentence here as well it is also up to the men because after 35 the men will not have it that easy as well despite all movies and whatever and then reconciliation of work and family life this is this is family in the european union language uh, this is actually the only sentence which is in the demographic report. Family is not there. Uh, demographic decline is not there. But uh, reconciliation of work and family life. 
we have talked about that in the first uh, first slide that that uh, whether we 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 can reach that we value motherhood and leave it to the families to decide how long actually they want to stay home with one child. I will finish. Yes. So so yes, it is important, but from the family perspective as well, not just from the employers. And then of course, when we talk about future of Europe, uh, there is no such thing as a as a one size fits all family policy, and it should we should follow the subsidiary principle and leave it to any community, any member state to formulate these, because it is up to culture, it is up to religion, it is up to traditions of the individual countries. And one thing might work here, but it might not work elsewhere. And if we are talking about the future of Europe, Europe is not a melting point. Uh, we have our own Judeo-Christian culture we can count on. So this, it's not a carte blanche. We, we can do whatever on a big American melting pot. And then intergenerational solidarity. And that's my last notion. We have seen it in, during the Corona times. We have asked our elderly not to go out. We have asked our elderly to stay home because of course, before vaccinations, it was, it was their generation who had the, the biggest problem. But throughout the curfew, the sandwich generation, the generation of parents wanted to work or had to work from home office. They had to educate the children back home. They had to take care of the elderly as well. So it is. It was practically a multitasking and in the, in, uh, something which which was was certainly not easy on any of the generation. So address the intergenerational solidarity, and that goes back to my first point: is to strengthen the community, strengthen the family, because we we have uh, automized uh, societies in Europe, and that is one of the issues. So try to bring back together the large family concept, but in that sense, the large family, the the, the multi generational family. Of course, it's not easy, but still, wherever it's possible, I believe, try to address these with, uh, with uh, targeted programs. I believe I will stop here, and I'm very grateful that I could have your attention. Thank you very much indeed. The last of our panel is Richard Stotsky. I'm happy to hear you. Thank you very much. OK, this, um, I would like to uh, refer a little bit to what was said before, especially in the morning. Uh, there was a very important statements about the uh, ecology and, and uh, Julio Cuenca and Professor Neves mentioned that we also have in, in, in a sense, we have two spheres. We not only have a physical chemical pollution, but we also have a value pollution. And I think we should we should speak in this language. So, so in, in fact, because I would like to give you a different answer than I, from those that I've heard already. Uh, by profession, I am a psychologist of business and organizations. And for 20 years, I work with all sectors, including great big corporations. And I, in a sense, I went into them from the other side. And as a consultant, I was helping them to grow the businesses. And because of this, uh, at a certain point, I decided to change the position because I saw that their pathologies are permeating, they are moving to our society. So, so that's why I would like to have this different point of view. When I, and, and I would like to ask, and I think, uh, uh, Jaime Oreja had a wonderful idea a few years ago to have a value monitor that it would we should monitor the values in Europe as we monitor other things. And we started, in fact, a, a project, but unfortunately, the, the pandemic stopped it and we couldn't continue. But I think we should come back to this. So in other words, there is a saying that if you can't measure anything, you cannot manage it. If we don't measure the pollution, the value pollution that we get, then we will never be able to manage it. And, and I, when I say what, what it means, well, I give you a small little, you know, what is death with dignity, for instance? Of course you know. Yes. <laughs> so, so there are, this is a, something, a part of this pollution, and we should have, if someone uses this term, this is a toxin and it, it, it should immediately be picked up. So 
how it started. It started very early in the biblical times. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Ratzinger, in, in his very interesting paper on the comment to uh, to to the Pope's uh, John Paul's uh, encyclical, uh, he said that the the Jews, when they were moving into the Promised Land, they had their Earth religion, and they were opposing the second, the Revelation religion. And it's very interesting. So they had the religion. They were religious people, but they were, in a sense, pagan. They built the, the golden cults. They were praying to it. And all of a sudden, God sent Moses with bad news. No, you have to destroy the calf. And, and he was furious when he saw it. So there was, and it's very important that we should remember that in our hearts, in our bodies, we tend to have our own religions, religions that are not exactly what, what God would like us to, to have. And for the Ten Commandments are revealed, and one, and one of the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment is the commandment that, that is uh, relevant to what we are here for. The Fourth Commandment is with uh, commandment about the love and, and um, to your parents to, for better prosperity. Now, in the pagans cultures, different pagan cultures, there was uh, something like gerontocide. You kill the parents. Why you kill the parents? Because they are a burden. If you walk and you, let's say you go to a promised land and those elderly people, disabled, they are slowing you down. So just leave them behind and go quicker. That's why probably God told them, don't, no, you have, to, you have to take them with you. But are they only a burden? This is the question. And I think, no. When you have your elderly parents dying at home, this is very interesting. I think today there, was, uh, there are statistics that in the 1949, for instance, 90% of people were dying at home. Today, this small little percent. People, small children, are not exposed to death, to suffering. They are not exposed to anything. And then we ask ourselves why they don't ask elementary existential questions. They don't, why they are not religious? Because they don't have to. We were happy. And unfortunately, all of us from the 60s, we believe now we are happy, we'll have a lot of money and we'll have consumerist lifestyles. We, in fact, someone mentioned today, we don't have, we don't need um, our children to take off our land. We, we, we can sell it and we can have fun in our, uh, in our older age. Now, the fact is that it doesn't work like this. Uh, <clears throat> there is a lack of sense of life among the elderly people. In, in Europe, 10 to 20 elderly people wish to die. The, the sad effect, and it's very interesting, they feel lonely, and, and what, what you mentioned today, an important thing during the lockdown, it was the first time in many years, and I know it from my own family, my, my brother, was asked by, by, by his daughters to take care of the children when during the lockdown because they had to work to work. So in a sense, it was positive effect, yes. But so what we, what we have to understand that there was this tendency for better consumerists having fun life, and this is one thing. And then it is also in the pagan times. It was easier. Why should we burden? And God wants us to have our parents not only to because of them, because we take care of the parents, but also for our children to be, this is important, to be exposed to a certain experiences that are needed for life. This is important. Exposure is the most important term I think we should learn. This is like 
we have we are exposed to toxin in the air we are also exposed to certain toxin in the values world that we live on and today from Ordo Iuris, I was reading a, a newsletter on Ordo Iuris. They said the big, large companies met and they decided to spend, I think it was $40 billion to prolong and to support the LGBT agenda. $40 billion. You may ask, okay, $40 billion, why do they do it? Why they spend so much money to, to do this. There is a very clear reason. By doing it, they destroy families. And families, this is, and we have, yes, they have, by families are very bad for earning money. When you go and ask any, any marketing uh, uh, specialist, they will always tell you, Dinky, this is the best <laughs> client double income no kids this is having fun spending cruise ships etc cetera, etc cetera. this is the, the the best thing that may happen to a, to affect to to business uh, so so what they do they create a sphere they create films that will take out the um, uh, the family and will show it either as pathological or something like this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, just an example: one company is uh, Netflix is is producing one after another toxic series, toxic shows that destroy the family, but also other the whole Hollywood, in fact, which is sponsored by by big families. The producers usually you can see the products in the films put there. You could see that that they they earn a lot by sponsoring the the life on, of consumerism. So if I would say if I were to say okay, what can you do to change it? How can you improve the situation? Where well, the, the, it would be completely different. I don't think this policy as long as we have four big or five big companies the media the social media companies working against us i think no political um, governmental policies will help we have to do something something else well first of all we have to to do it on our own i i i might say okay i don't have as many children as you i have seven children uh, but <laughs> but <laughs> But I have nine grandchildren already. So, and I may tell you why I have seven children and nine, nine <laughs> grandchildren, because I don't have a television. Yes, exactly. So what you have to do, first of all, throw out your television sets and all the access. I was, we were, we, in our family, we were controlling the access to media very strongly. Our children could not see a film that we would not have seen seen before because we were very sensitive to this to, to what i i'm saying the exposure there is long time it was 1970s where albert bandura created the first studies of exposure of social learning children just copy what they see and this is when i'm, I'm i was flying here and all of the people with children give them the tablets to keep them calm okay i I, you can imagine what will happen with them. That they will become os what they watch. So this is the first thing. Throw out the media and control it. And, and we should have policies. We should have warning signs. Because one of the most toxic films, Inside Out, no, when I talk, that, sometimes I, I talk to, to many, but this is a, a, a film about animals, although it pretends to be a film about, uh, about people about emotions, etc. I don't want to, there's no time for it. So this is the first thing. The second thing, to do it, we have to measure it. We, you, when you go to, not, maybe not this one, but when you go and you have ingredients, my dream is that every, every single film has an ingredient, ideology toxins, uh, LGBT ideology, gender, etc., atheism, 
and and when we watch we catholics we should oh no i don't want oh, this is dangerous this is what we should do i started to do it with my children with not my students uh, and and i found out that they were lost i remember uh, no i won't tell you it, in the break, during the break because we I, we don't have enough time so the second thing is engagement and connection of the children with the elderly and it's in for instance in school environment this is so that they can meet on one hand children should see the elderly people because they are gone they you usually are gone from the families and and also give the elderly chance to talk they have 80 years or 70 or 80 or 90 years of experience they want to share nobody wants to listen to it this incredible there are there are I, there, there was something like story corps for instance that you can record anyone and put it on internet and I, I I was enthusiastic about this really wonderful job. You just have a special application to make a, a recording. Now what do I see? Go to the story corp now. The, most of the stories is about the homosexuals, couples who, when they may meet, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's, it's terrible. Then <clears throat> um, I think we have also uh, we need a lot of education. We have a need, need a lot of research about elderly people, about the connection between elderly and young. And if we lost the huge families, we have to create substitutes. And, and, and this is very important and teach people how to deal with these. <clears throat> of course, supporting financially and, and morally supporting media productions, independent channels, etc would be also uh, very important maybe i'll stop it because i already got too much time so i encourage you to 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 work i'm i'm now uh, decided to to work on this on this uh, monitor of value so if anyone is interested to join a, a small working group please give me your cards and and i think next in the beginning of next year we'll make a, a online meeting and really start working on it. Thank you very much. Well, good evening. I am Semia Sibillo. I am a wife, mother of two children. I feel at home today because I have a degree in law from the Catholic University of Milan. I'm the director of the Manjagalli Life Aid Center Milan, the first center to be located in a hospital, Manjagalli Clinic, one of the most important maternity hospitals in Milan in Italy. Il Centro di Aiuto alla Vita Manjagalli was founded by Paola Bonzi in 1984 in the same year of the Italian law and abortion. In 37 years of activity, our center has helped more than 23,000 children to be born. Every year, we take care of about uh, more than 1,500 mothers and their children. The center is federated to L Federvita Lombardia and the Italian Life Movement. I am bringing greetings from Marina Casini. I have a pin on my jacket, our symbol of life. They are the feet of a baby in the 12th week. I brought some as a gift for you. Thanks. Now I introduce Richard from Africa Life Youth Foundation. Hello, Richard. Hello. Great Can you describe you. how the Africa Life Youth Foundation operates, your activities? Yeah, greetings to you from Kampala, Uganda. I'm Richard Sampala, the founder and executive director of Africa Life Youth Foundation. I want to thank the organizer of this forum for the opportunity you've given me to share what Africa Life Foundation is doing in Uganda. And I want to say thank you for all my, my fellow panelists for being a voice for the voiceless. Thank you so much. Africa Life Foundation started in 2004 for the purpose of taking the gospel of life and the gospel of Jesus Christ to young people in the community. We started going to schools, asking school administrators to give us permission 
to speak to students for only two hours. When we speak, we give out uh, questionnaires where we ask students to write the challenges they're going through. Then we come back the following day, we meet these students on one by one. We found out that thousands and thousands of young girls have had abortion before and they're facing psychological torture. But our one-on-one -on -one mentoring, counseling has helped them to get healed from the past abortion. Since 2004, we have witnessed 620 babies being saved through our school outreaches. We also hold our youth annual camps and these camps help us to house 300 uh, youth for four days where we have more time with the young people to train on them on the issues of human life, how they can be able to defend their pro-life view within five minutes. It's a great opportunity that will have time to help these young people to discover their talents and how we can help them to develop their talents and transform their communities. Since COVID-19 started last year, our country has faced a big tragedy. Teenage pregnancy has increased and 470,000 young girls under the age of 15 are pregnant right now. We did our research and find out that 70% engage in sex because they were finding sanitary parts. They couldn't find sanitary parts, so they had to share to the boyfriends and the boyfriend provided money and they ended up having sex. Last year, law in December, the law led us to begin 25 student pro-life clubs in 25 learning institutions. We hoped these clubs to set up a constitution, to elect their leaders, to set up a day every week where they meet and discuss the issues of life. We have seen these clubs reaching out to the young people in their private closet and 34 babies have been saved since last year in December when we started these camps. We've realized that when you equip young people, they have more access to reach to their fellow young people in their private closet. These students have been facing challenges whenever they reach out to their fellow student who has already made a decision to abort. This young girl asked them, if I decide to keep this pregnancy, are you willing to walk alongside with me until I, bear the, uh, I deliver the baby? When my parents and the boyfriend have rejected me, are you waiting? The students have been contacting our office and by the grace of God, we've been able to help these young girls that are pregnant by providing monthly support, by finding a her place where they could stay, helping them to deliver their baby, and after also supporting them to begin a small income generating project. God has been so faithful and witnessed a lot of young people turning to say yes, to keep the baby into their womb. Since last year when COVID-19 started, our ministry lost 70% of the donors through lack of job, through death. Right now we are facing a big challenge and surely we need your prayers because our ministry depends on individual donations. I wanna share my story. When I was in a mental school, I saw a lot of children celebrating their birthdays and they were getting gifts in the class. I waited the day when I'm going to get a gift when I'm going to celebrate my birthday. I went to the teacher and asked my teacher, hey, when am I celebrating my birthday? She told me, we don't know when you're born, but go back to the people you're staying with and ask them, then we'll be able to celebrate. 
As you know, kids, they keep on, when they want something, they run, they persist. I ran and went to home and asked the people that were taking care of us. They kept on dodging me, but I insisted on because I wanted to celebrate my birthday and get a gift like other children are getting in the class. So one of the lady took me to the office and shared this story to me, that a gentleman was passing in the street of our city Kampala and had a little baby crying in the trash can. When he opened up, there was Richard. They estimated that I was like two weeks to three weeks old. But when she shared that story to me, I didn't know how important that story is to my life. But when I reached on high school, I realized that God saved my life with a great purpose. And that's one of the reasons that even pushed me to found Africa Life Youth Foundation. The truth is I didn't know what happened to my mom. Maybe she was a prostitute. Maybe she was raped. Maybe my dad rejected her. But one of the things I thank my mom is that she respected my rights in her womb and bared with a shame for nine months and said to put me where God would take care of me. And God did it. I want to thank my mom every time for loving me and saying to save me even though I've never seen her. If you make a decision to reach out and be a voice for the voiceless, that little baby you're saving is going to be a great transformation to thousands and thousands of people in the future. I want to thank you so much for this opportunity to share what Africa Life Foundation is doing here in Uganda, Africa. Thanks a lot, Richard. Bye, Richard, thank you. And now Elisa Magalini um, has been a volunteer for 30 years at the Live Hide Center in Castiglione delle Stiviere. Buongiorno a tutti. Parlerò in italiano così mi è più semplice. Mi chiamo Elisa Magalini, sono da circa 30 anni volontaria del Centro di Aiuto alla Vita di Castiglione delle Stiviere. Ho iniziato molto giovane e da alcuni anni lavoro per l'associazione come educatrice. Il Centro di Aiuto alla Vita di Castiglione delle Stiviere è stato fondato nel 1979. Aderisce alla Federazione Nazionale dei Movimenti e Centri di Aiuto alla Vita con oltre 600 associazioni locali e anche alla Federazione Regionale detta Federvita Lombardia. L'associazione di cui faccio parte è composta da 20 soci e svolge la sua attività grazie a 10 volontari operativi e a un'educatrice un professionale dipendente che sarei io. Una delle particolarità di questa associazione è che i volontari sono eterogenei sia come età sia come provenienza. La difesa della vita come fondamento e cardine è riuscita ad unire persone davvero variegate che hanno trovato una loro collocazione in base ad interessi e sensibilità personali. La storia dell'associazione parte grazie al coraggio di alcuni soci fondatori che leggendo i bisogni di quel periodo hanno deciso di aprire questa associazione. Sono stati volontari che fin da subito hanno cercato di mettere la vita e la sua difesa al primo posto. Hanno accolto nelle loro case giovani mamme scacciate dalle famiglie e sono stati esempio di integrità e coraggio. Sono le fondamenta su cui tutti noi e la nostra associazione ci appoggiamo e cresciamo. Attualmente le richieste di aiuto ci provengono da nove paesi dell'Alto Mantovano e ad ogni donna i volontari cercano di donare ascolto, amicizia, conforto, supporto sociale e psicologico. Non mancano certo gli aiuti materiali, con distribuzione di pannolini, alimenti per la prima infanzia, latte per neonati, indumenti, attrezzature, giocattoli e contributi in denaro. Il nostro grande punto di forza dipende dal fatto che i progetti sono gestiti in collaborazione con gli assistenti sociali dei paesi di provenienza delle donne e famiglie che aiutiamo. E in particolare per Castiglione sono coordinati con i partner di una rete che si chiama Siamo in Rete, che comprende l'assessorato alla coesione sociale del comune e molte delle associazioni di volontariato del nostro paese. Questa rete di collaborazioni 
costituitasi e sviluppatasi nel tempo, ha permesso di saldare rapporti e di portare avanti progetti importanti per la gestione e l'aiuto di persone fragili. La rete, creatasi, permette da tempo di procedere uniti verso scopi comuni e di lavorare insieme, anche tra associazioni apparentemente molto lontane tra loro, ha portato ad una conoscenza e al rispetto reciproci. Nel corso del 2020 sono state seguite 142 donne e famiglie in difficoltà, con 162 bambini da 0 a 2 anni. Da queste famiglie solo lo scorso anno sono nati 29 bambini. Dall'inizio dell'attività nel 1979 sono nati 424 bambini dalle mamme che abbiamo seguito e aiutato. In casi particolari è possibile anche attivare l'accoglienza presso gli appartamenti della nostra casa di accoglienza San Luigi Gonzaga, che è operativa dal 1993 e attualmente dispone di due mini alloggi e un terzo appartamento più ampio. L'accoglienza per le sole mamme con bambini viene sempre fatta in collaborazione con i servizi sociali del paese di residenza della donna. Svolgiamo anche attività culturali per sensibilizzare le persone alla difesa della vita umana, con promozione di incontri e partecipazione a manifestazioni. Soprattutto abbiamo un ruolo attivo nella giornata per la vita, che si celebra in ogni parrocchia dal 1979 ogni prima domenica di febbraio, secondo le direttive della Conferenza Episcopale Italiana. L'attività è integrata dall'organizzazione dell'evento Una Luce per la Vita, che consiste nell'accendere un lumino e metterlo alla finestra per manifestare la disponibilità all'accoglienza della vita umana. Tanto è il lavoro fatto e il lavoro da fare. Se mi dovessi chiedere che cosa una realtà piccola ma preziosa come la nostra possa insegnare all'Europa o come possa cambiare alcune filosofie di morte, l'unica risposta che posso darmi è che tutto questo è possibile attraverso il contagio reciproco. Dobbiamo essere pronti, come facciamo noi nel nostro piccolo, a entrare in rapporto con realtà diverse ed invece di combatterci sui disaccordi, provare ad incontrarci sui punti comuni, così da far partire una conoscenza ed un rapporto di rispetto. Credo molto nel cambiamento che ha origine anche dal basso ed è per questo che insieme a tutti i, vol i volontari continueremo a stare accanto alle mamme e ai loro bambini, cercando di trasmettere a più persone possibili, attraverso il nostro lavoro, una visione di un futuro che abbia la vita al centro, fin dal suo concepimento. Grazie a tutti, buonasera. Thank you, Elisa. Now, Veronica is here today to represent the Ordo Iuris Institute for Legal Culture from Poland. Can you tell us what Ordo Iuris is, what are your activities, and uh, If you can tell us about the Collegium Intermarium. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Veronika Przebierała, uh, and I have the privilege to represent Ordo Juris Institute for Legal Culture from Poland. We are a non-governmental organization, not connected with any political parties, and we are funded by individual donations of citizens. We are active uh, in defense of human dignity, liberty, human rights, including the right to life from conception to natural death. We are active in the European Union, United Nations and uh, European Court for Human Rights. For that purpose, we undertake a number of activities both domestically and internationally, uh, including delivering and developing legal opinions and reports, draft of laws, uh, amicus curiae statements, and representing individuals and organizations and courts. In doing that, we encounter a number of violations of human rights and freedoms in all aspects of life. We have defended people who lost their jobs for expression, their religious beliefs. You may believe it or not, but there are corporations in Poland, mainly foreign, which would fire an employee for quoting the Bible. In today's environment where political correctness dominates the public life, such transgressions are punishable by loss of work 
and cancellation from social existence. We have defended families whose freedom to raise their kids according to their will and without intervention from public authorities was violated. One cannot overlook of violations of rights of some group of people with hope that his own right to life, dignity, freedom of speech, freedom of expression of religious beliefs will not be violated soon after. A violation of one of these freedoms is a viol violation of totally of freedom because it's indivisible. Therefore, those who want to defend and promote human rights and freedoms must defend and promote every kind of them. This is the main reason why we have established this year a university, Collegium Intermarium. It is an answer for the crisis of European civilization and also at the academic area. The mission of Collegium Intermarium is education founded on classical values of European civilization, Roman legal culture, philosophy on ancient Greece, and Christian ethics. European civilization was built on Christian ethics. It was Christianity that brought the word, the awareness of human dignity and the fact that ethical norms are universal and apply to everyone. Christian tradition is not only the past, but the present and the future of Europe as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Veronica. And uh, now, Filippa is here to, today to tell us about the Convidas project, which involves volunteers, students, but also institutions. Please. Thank you. Uh, obrigado, Suémia, e cumprimento todos os restantes presentes aqui na mesa. Agradecemos também o convite à Federação Portuguesa pela Vida e pela Federação Europeia One of Us. E é com enorme gosto que estou aqui a representar, não só mais do que isso, o projeto Convidas e é uma honra ter nos escolhido para, como um projeto defensor da dignidade humana. O projeto Convidas surge a 29 de maio de 2020, 17 dias depois de Portugal ter fechado, estávamos confinados, estávamos incrédulos, as notícias e testemunhos por Portugal inteiro e pela Europa eram verdadeiramente assustadoras, o sentimento de angústia, de medo, insegurança e o desconhecimento era total. Nesse dia, a 29 de março, um ar de idosos, um entre tantos outros, ficou contaminado e não tinha quem cuidasse dos mais velhos. Os órgãos competentes não tinham mãos a medir e não conseguiam dar resposta imediata. E como diz o ditado português, quem tem boca vai a Roma. E por isso foi lançado um pedido por WhatsApp a um conjunto de jovens que pudessem ir imediatamente dar apoio. A resposta foi imediata e, e com uma extraordinária adesão. A vontade de ir ao encontro de que mais precisava foi avassaladora e imediatamente se organizaram para ir para o Norte. Nessa mesma noite, a Rita Almeida Brito, nossa coordenadora, estudante na altura de enfermagem, estava entre os jovens contactados e não podendo ir, percebeu rapidamente que haveria mais lares a precisarem e, ou que iriam precisar de apoio e por isso formou uma equipa para garantir que ninguém ficava sem resposta. Como leigos, desconhecíamos as tomadas de decisão, as muitas razões de tantos constrangimentos e não nos cabia a nós priorizar medidas. Mas era claro que os idosos que viviam nos lares estavam a sofrer. Estavam a ficar sós, estavam a ficar reduzidos a números e muitas vezes à inevitabilidade de morrer. A sua essência humana foi reduzida a muito pouco. Não de forma consciente, mas na prática foi o que aconteceu. Era a nossa missão, cuidar. A opção mais razoável para qualquer um de nós seria parar com a irresponsabilidade e a loucura de encorajar ou organizar mais missões mas foi exatamente o contrário que fizemos. Os voluntários eram, em primeiro lugar, filhos, de quem também tínhamos de cuidar, mas vieram logo e começaram a trabalhar com uma alegria e uma disponibilidade. Por isso sentimos, desde o início, uma enorme responsabilidade e procurámos sempre ser cautelosos e prudentes. Alguns diriam que mais. Cada missão, como chamámos a nossa presença nos lares, tinha a duração de 15 dias. Precisávamos de três casas, 
uma para receber durante os 15 dias, uma de retaguarda caso algum voluntário ficasse contaminado e, o outro para um, e outra para o outro período de 15 dias. As casas precisavam de garantir todas as medidas de prevenção e segurança. Isso implicava quartos espaçosos, salas de refeições, sala de estar e de estudo, porque muitos dos nossos voluntários estavam a ter aulas online. Houve quem defendesse teses durante as missões. A parte das casas era necessário conhecer o lar e muitas vezes propor novos percursos, novos procedimentos e medidas para minimizar o risco de contágio e estancar a propagação. Era preciso dar-nos a conhecer às autoridades locais, fazer contactos mais oficiais para nos cederem o alojamento, os equipamentos, os apoios. Antes de partir, era preciso garantir que tudo estava pronta para receber os voluntários. O processo durava cerca de uma semana. Foram muitos telefonemas noite adentro para conseguirmos tudo isto. Mas, acima de tudo, era preciso conhecer e preparar estes extraordinários voluntários. Por isso, preparámos dois momentos de formação. Com o enfermeiro, era preciso ensinar a vestir e a despir os equipamentos de proteção individual, os famosos EPIs, e compreender as medidas de proteção. E como psicólogo, era prudente prepará-los para a difícil tarefa que iam enfrentar. Escrevemos ainda dois manuais de apoio e orientação aos voluntários e aos líderes. Lançámos um site. Fizemos pedidos e apoios a mecenas e como não tínhamos uma associação constituída, associámos a uma outra já existente. Os apoios surgiram de forma extraordinária. Enfermeiros, médicos, juristas, mecenas, hotelaria, restauração. Tínhamos ainda um grupo de voluntários só para a logística. Quem não podia estar um mês fora de casa, disponibilizou-se para recolher ou levar material, fazer telefonemas, pôr-nos em contacto com outras pessoas. Toda esta organização foi feita de forma rápida, diria mesmo muito rápida, mas foi feita no conforto das nossas casas, atrás de um ecrã ou de um telefone, sentados num sofá. O que se segue, e que para nós é a grande beleza, foi o encontro. É como dizem os voluntários, tínhamos a consciência de cumprir uma missão, os nossos dias eram preenchidos com as tarefas simples de um lar de terceira idade. Mudar camas e fraldas, dar banhos e refeições e outras coisas pequenas. A nossa missão, porém, era levar o amor. Cuidando como se fosse única cada pessoa. Sabíamos que não estávamos ali para fazer camas, mas para amar e amando fazer camas e tudo mais que fosse preciso. É emocionante testemunhar e acompanhar isto a acontecer. Como cada voluntário, nas suas fragilidades, nas suas dificuldades, nos seus medos, nos seus cansaços, se dispôs com grande amor a ultrapassar o que fosse preciso para fazer o melhor que conseguia. Por cada pessoa, por cada idoso, por cada auxiliar, por cada diretor do lar e por cada outro voluntário. Diziam, foi bonito ver como cada dia crescia a nossa amizade. À medida que aprendíamos os seus nomes, os seus gostos e as suas manias, mesmo com os fatos bizarros e viseiras, Conseguíamos chegar às pessoas. Saber o que o Sr. Joaquim gostava, gostava, como gostava de pôr a sua risca no cabelo, como pôr à Sra. Águeda o seu perfume preferido ou cantar o fado ao Sr. Manel, fadista. Assim, cheios de delicadeza, os voluntários iam alegrando os dias dos mais velhos. No meio da aflição havia música, gargalhadas e esperança. É tão gratificante testemunhar como o amor de um voluntário a um idoso é capaz de transformar uma grande solidão na, na grande alegria e vontade de dançar, diziam. Um silêncio de bondade a um idoso num aperto confortante de mão, ou num acompanhamento doloroso, com nó na garganta, lágrimas nos olhos, a um idoso nos seus últimos momentos de vida. Como é tão comovente de sonhar e viver um oferecimento de se levantar de manhã, depois de poucas horas de sono, transformado numa força invencível para o dia que vem. A fome de não poder comer durante os turnos de Cousepis, transformada num grande desejo de dar uma refeição com o maior amor e paciência possível a um idoso que demora muito tempo a comer. Ou a suspensão de entregar, ou a superação de entregar, de, de trocar uma fralda que cheira muito mal, transformada num grande desejo de deixar um idoso muito bem arranjado e muito bem cheiroso. Ou o desconforto dentro de um EPI, transformado num grande desejo de confortar os tantos idosos que estavam desconfortáveis na mesma posição há muitas horas na cama. Por fim, e não descentrando do facto de que foi cuidar de cada idoso, sentimos que este projeto foi também uma boa oportunidade dos voluntários fazerem a experiência de olhar o outro e de permanecer focado no outro. Por isso também cuidámos muito dos nossos voluntários. Nunca quisemos que fossem vedetas ou especiais. 
mas quisermos sempre ser muito agradecidos. Foram missões silenciosas. Fizemos por não aparecer nas notícias, não queríamos tornar ninguém especial. Dizia-lhes sempre nas formações que ousava compará-los a situação compará-los a uma situação passada com a Madre Teresa de Calcutá, quando ela respondia que nem por um milhão de dólares daria de bem a um troço, mas sim só por amor. Sempre considerámos que os voluntários fizeram uma experiência de amor, uma experiência da sua dignidade humana e dos outros. Só terminar dizendo que à chegada à casa conseguimos fazer chegar a cada voluntário um menu Mic Mac, uh, Big Mac e mais tarde, quando eram muitas missões em simultâneo, um chocolate e um cartão de agradecimento que dizia Querida Rita, São Tomás de Aquino distinguiu três níveis diferentes de gratidão. Um primeiro, onde reconhecemos o benefício recebido. Um segundo, onde louvamos e damos graças. E um terceiro, mais profundo, mais profundo que chamou o nível da retribuição, do vínculo. Neste nível de gratidão, sentimos-nos vinculados e comprometidos a retribuir ao outro. É assim que o projeto Convidas se sente para contigo, vinculado para sempre e com um profundo sentimento de nos vermos obrigados a retribuir perante o tanto que deste ao longo desta missão. Certo que falamos em nome de tantos que transformaste com a tua entrega, a tua superação, o teu cansaço, o teu cuidado, o teu exemplo e a tua simplicidade. Aqui fica o nosso enorme e profundo obrigado, que junta numa só palavra os três níveis de gratidão que sentimos. Foram 730 voluntários, 65 missões, de Norte a Sul, 2.792 idosos, carinhosamente cuidados. Thank you, Filipa, for your mission. Thanks a lot. And now we have Helen. We have Helen for by video call. Um, Heartbeat International is worldwide, especially supporting pregnant women, motherhood and family. Can you tell us our Heartbeat International works? Thanks, uh, Helen. Yes. yes, well, first of all, greetings on behalf of the president of Heartbeat International, uh, Jarrell Godsey, our board and our staff. Uh, it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce to you the work of Heartbeat International. Um, I serve the uh, 1200 international affiliates of Heartbeat spread across the globe Uh, on six continents and in 75 countries. Uh, that number, 1,200, um, includes uh, maternity homes, pregnancy centers, pregnancy medical help centers, and um, non-NGO uh, adoption agencies. Uh, we are privileged to have joint affiliation partners and collaborators, other networks located in Australia, Canada, Latin America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Altogether, the Heartbeat family has over 3,000 affiliates and more than a third of our 1,200 international affiliated organizations are in 22 of the 44 European nations. Now these life-affirming organizations spanning the globe annually serve, almost always free of charge, hundreds of thousands of women in unplanned pregnancies, their families and their unborn children by offering true reproductive choice, providing alternatives to abortion through counseling, resources and training, and even through reversing chemical abortions. Our affiliates protect the lives of the youngest and the most vulnerable of Europe's population, seeing each one as a human being with intrinsic value, regardless of gender, of color, of faith, of disability, economic status, political or social status. They also uphold and protect Europe's families in every nation. The family remains the single most stable and solid societal building block for every culture and nation. Life-affirming organizations are among the few organizations whose work consequentially contribute to reversing the demographic winter most of Europe is currently experiencing. According to a March 2021 London Times article, while EU countries represented 13.5% of the world's population in 1960, it has only 6.9% in 2020. The demographic winter 
Europe is experiencing should be a concern to all European citizens and governments. The future of Europe is frankly vulnerable, apart from the words and the concomitant work of these life-affirming grassroots organizations across Europe that uphold the value of one, one mother, one child, one family at a time. Thank you so much for your time and this wonderful invitation. If there's time still, I would like to share a short video to close and I wish you well from Heartbeat International. Thank you, Ellen, bye. Now, Barbara will now introduce us to the Austrian movement for life in particular their advice to women crisis for pregnancy. What legal problems are being faced today in, in Austria? Thanks. Okay, so uh, I'm the director of the Österreichische Lebensbewegung, the Austrian Life Movement. And I just want to present a little bit our work. So we are a counseling association specialized in counseling of pregnant women who consider an abortion in order to help them find a different solution. We also have self-help groups for women who feel alone during pregnancy and for women after an abortion. The latter group is becoming bigger and bigger. In our counseling, we focus very much on the situation of the woman. We realize that in order to really help them, we need to find out the real reason why they think about an abortion. In most cases in Austria, the relationship with the child father is either unstable or he's not present at all. Quite often, we experience that their own mother or the mother of the child father is giving a lot of pressure, not only for teenagers, also for women in the 30s. There is very often, um, very often they either don't want to support them with the child or they had an abortion themselves and hope to find uh, like a common partner in the family or uh, they just don't want to have their grandchild from this woman because they want they don't agree with the partner of their son the secondary issues are financial threats and life planning very often i get the impression and even some women asked direct, directly whether she is allowed to get a child in such a situation. So they feel that it is not okay to have a child in this situation. Very rarely, we also had the very weird reason due to the climate change um, that they want to abort the child. So in order to have the women finding or strengthening their yes for the child, a big part in the counseling pro process is also the counseling of either the child father, if he is ready for it, or the relation, uh, relationship counseling in general, how to find a good father for a child for the future um, and how to build a stable relationship. I have some examples where we could save some marriages uh, or relationships, although the behavior of the child father at the message that he's becoming a father was, let's say, under earthly. Mm -hmm. Another part of our work is just practical, quick help, like material donations or helping to find out the applications, uh, to fill out the applications for state fundings or support helping with the kindergarten place for the elder children and so on, depending on the individual situation. Of course, that is what we do if she deci is deciding for the child. So we want to see the mother pass and some other documents up front that is very important for us in order to prevent misuse as we lift up donations and we want to support the women who um, really need it for a longer period of time. Another part of our work is 
um, another thing is very important for us to let uh, the women in the counseling situation know that even if she should abort the child, she can come to us again when the time comes where she needs help. And some women are rather already called us um, weeks or months after the abortion because then they realized that it was that they felt more evil than they thought and they do not know how to overcome this and they grieve a lot so for this we have a self-help group we have a racial racial vineyards groups and a program called safe one of course, we work together with other Austrian associ associations where we know we can trust the work, especially at a certain point where we see that we can't help properly anymore. In order to reach more people and to get the people to become more aware for the, of the help of, for women in crisis pregnancies, we started a YouTube channel some years ago and two podcasts, one for pregnancy and one because this is another threat at the moment. Uh, for the end of life with focus on grieving and palliative care. We also have connections to a woman and a doctor specially, uh, specialized in abortion pill reversement treatment and already had one case where it worked very well and they are now very happy. Now I want to talk a little bit about the actual situation in Austria in general. In fact, abortion is not allowed according to the law, only tolerated officially under certain circumstances until the 12th week of gestation and in case of visibility until birth. In reality, many abortion clinics do uh, abort till the 16th week of gestation. As we have no statistics, only estimations about the cases of abortion in Austria, no one controls if those certain circumstances are really the reasons for the abortions. So according to the estimations, every third child in Austria gets aborted. Another problem in Austria are as well some jurisdictional cases that let doctors pay for the treatment of the child if it was disabled and the doctor didn't make it very clear that they should abort. So for their own financial safety, Quite a lot of doctors try to force women to abort if they only have a little hint that this baby could have a disability. This is especially in Europe. Um, one, uh, on the other hand, there are some uh, now there are some speakers from the platforms for disabilities that want to cancel the embryopathic uh, exception of the law, which allows abortion till birth. Uh, this started with a civil initiative called Verändern. So now uh, there is some movement in the politics. And now I just want to uh, uh, add uh, something to euthanasia in Austria as it's very actual. Last year, the Austrian Constitutional Court repealed the law that forbids assisted suicide in Austria due to the complaint of four persons and a Swiss association that is specialized in assisted suicide. The constitutional, constitutional Court asked the Austrian Parliament to establish another law that should prohibit misuse of the possibility of assisted suicide. If not, the new regulation will be legal from the 1st January 2022. One week ago, the Austrian parliament finally could agree to a new law that is now under observation for two weeks. So assisted suicide will now be legal under certain circumstances. They could manage that the regulations are very strict with a 12 week span where the doctors and the patient try to figure out another solution and it is not allowed under a depression. At the same time, the palliative care shall be funded more as the chamber of medical doctors already denied the willingness to assist in suicides under the statement to die at the hand and not through the hand. So we will see how this will develop. That is how the situation in Austria is at the moment. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I beg you to pray for us. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And then now Arthur, good evening. He will tell us about Plataforma Renovar, which includes parents from all over Portugal. To do what? 
how to operate. Thanks. Olá, eu sou Arthur Mesquita Guimarães, casado com a Paula que está neste auditório e temos seis filhos. Tenho uma empresa que se dedica à prestação de serviço ao mundo rural e vivo no norte de Portugal. Vou-vos falar do primado dos pais na educação dos seus filhos e, já, e desde já vos peço, porque vou, peço desculpa, porque vou centrar a minha exposição no meu caso pessoal, no caso da minha família. Quando o nosso filho mais velho iniciava a sua vida académica, no primeiro ano do primeiro ciclo, fomos despertos por uma denúncia vinda a público no Jornal Expresso em maio de 2005, da interferência do Estado e escolas, em matérias de competência dos pais, particularmente no que diz respeito à vivência da sexualidade. Interferência esta, sustentada por regulamentação jurídica diversa e pouco consistente, e ainda não abrangente a todo o território. Apesar do pacto de confiança que se, exige, que se exige entre os pais e as escolas, não mais deixamos de estar atentos a partir daquela denúncia para a intenção do Estado de expropriar as competências educativas aos pais. Chegados ao ano letivo de 2009 e 2010, após muita polémica, com base na Lei 60 de 2009, de 6 de agosto, o Estado impõe a todas as escolas e em todos os ciclos a inclusão da educação sexual numa clara tentativa de ocupar um espaço educativo que compete aos pais e ou, e ou a escolhas educativas por estes consideradas. Isso originou diversas escaramuças com as escolas e tornou-se agónico a partir do ano letivo de 2018-2019, porque o governo português decidiu impor como curricular a disciplina que designou de cidadania e desenvolvimento, se até aqui, com a tentativa de imposição da educação sexual, o Estado emandou as competências educativas dos pais, de agora em diante, com esta nova disciplina de caráter curricular, expropria mesmo os pais das suas competências educativas. Pois, se desde o ano letivo 2009-2010, os nossos filhos nunca participaram nos programas de educação sexual impostos às escolas, por maior força de razão, indicámos à escola que os nossos filhos não participariam em qualquer aula, ação ou aconselhamento relativo à disciplina de cidadania e desenvolvimento, sem o nosso acordo por escrito, se assim o entendêssemos, atempadamente solicitado pelas escolas. Esta situação tem peripécias legais diversas, às quais vos poupo, porque são com, <risos> complexas, mas no ano letivo 2019-2020 desencadeou-se um conflito insanável quando a escola de um deles, por despacho, de dois deles, por um despacho emitido pelo seu secretário de Estado adjunto de Junta e Educação, decidiu que apesar das notas excelentes que eles tinham, não poderiam transitar de ano e inclusive deveriam recuar dois anos para o ano que frequentaram em 2018-2019, em virtude de não terem frequentado essa disciplina. De imediato, movemos uma ação no Tribunal e, pelos meios adequados, vimos batalhando com o Ministério da Educação, enquanto os nossos filhos, e uma vez mais com notas excelentes, mercê de legendas sociais têm vindo a transitar de ano, até que esta semana, de forma surpreendente, nos chegou uma primeira decisão judicial desfavorável, relacionada com uma previdência cautelar que acionamos, bem como a informação da escola, no sentido que os nossos filhos vão ter de recuar nos seus estudos e do mesmo e do mesmo ano escolar não serão enquanto não frequentarem a disciplina de cidadania e desenvolvimento. De seguida, apresento-vos em primeira mão o protesto que logo a seguir este fórum iremos tornar público. 18 de outubro de 2021. Mais cedo ou mais tarde, 18 de outubro de 2021, será de certo uma data recordada, será de certo uma data recordada por má memória pela crueldade perpetrada contra o Tiago, o Rafael e toda a nossa família, marcando ainda pelo fim dos direitos, liberdades e garantias, pilares de um Estado de Direito. Ditadura. Esta data, o Tribunal Administrativo e Fiscal de Braga lava as mãos e, surpreendentemente, considera improcedente a providência cautelar que acionamos pelo bem dos nossos filhos e pelos direitos que nos assistem enquanto pais, no fim do ano letivo transato, no processo de que todos é conhecido e permite aos parceiros, diretor do agrupamento de escolas Camilo Castelo Branco, Vila Nova de Famalicão, Dr. Carlos Teixeira, e ao secretário de Estado de Junta e da Educação, Dr. João Costa, concretizarem a sedenta, malvada e tão esperada retenção do Tiago e do Rafael no ano letivo que frequentaram. Tudo isto mesmo sem estar decidido o processo de reclamação de direitos que movemos. Sim, o Tiago e o Rafael, que esteja o prazo de trânsito em julgado, 5 de novembro de 2021, 
já a mais de meio do primeiro período do ano letivo corrente, terão de voltar para o ano que frequentaram no ano transato, em que ambos obtiveram média de cinco valores, além da referência de um comportamento exemplar. Só porque nós, os seus pais, não autorizamos a sua participação sem previamente sermos informados dos conteúdos a abordar na recente disciplina de cidadania e desenvolvimento. Portanto, não aceitas a religião do Estado, então chumbas. Alguém acredita nisto? É mesmo verdade. Isto, lamentavelmente, com a conivência das mais altas figuras do Estado, conhecedoras do processo desde o seu início, Presidente da República, professor Dr. Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa, Primeiro-Ministro, Dr. António Costa, e Ministro da Educação, Dr. Tiago Brandão Rodrigues. A juntar estas, a, a estes, todo um conjunto de outras individualidades, por força dos seus cargos, ou, ou, ou do que representam para a sociedade, em todo este processo, ou se mantiveram mudas ou caladas. Há... Ah, e acompanhados ainda por um punhado de histéricos que nos seus comentários apenas têm espalhado ódio, malcriadez, malvadez, falta de respeito pela diferença, enfim, um pouco, um pouco, enfim, pouco sentido de cidadania. Pois bem, o Tribunal tem o dever de aplicar diretamente o direito que é vigente em Portugal e é superior às leis e regulamentos que regem a disciplina de cidadania e desenvolvimento. Mas, qual respeito pela, pela, pela Constituição da República Portuguesa? Os pais têm o direito e o dever de educação e manutenção dos filhos, artigo 36. Os pais e as mães têm o direito à proteção da sociedade e do Estado, e, e do Estado na realização da sua, sua insubstituível ação em relação aos filhos, nomeadamente quando a educação, artigo 68. Incubo designamento ao Estado para com os pais na educação dos filhos, artigo 67. Qual respeito pelos tratados internacionais subscritos pelo Estado português? A Convenção dos Direitos das Crianças, ratificada por Portugal e, portanto, lei vigente em Portugal, superior às leis e regulamentos da disciplina de cidadania e desenvolvimento, que deve ser diretamente aplicada pelos tribunais, diz o seguinte. A criança tem, desde o seu nascimento, o direito de conhecer os seus pais e de ser educada por eles. Nada se diz, em parte alguma, sobre o direito do Estado de educar as crianças. Direito este que não existe, porque a educação tem, um fim, tem por fim, o desenvolvimento da personalidade. E este direito é um direito de personalidade que não pode ser violentado pelo Estado. Os direitos da personalidade são direitos absolutos. Os, os Estados-partes respeitam as responsabilidades, direitos e deveres dos pais. Os, artigo 5 Os Estados-partes garantem que a criança não é separada dos pais contra a vontade destes. Artigo 9 Os Estados-partes respeitam o direito da criança à liberdade de pensamento, de consciência e de religião. A criança tem o direito de exprimir livremente a sua opinião sobre questões que lhe digam respeito e dever essa opinião tomada em consideração. Os Estados-partes respeitam os direitos e deveres dos pais de orientarem a criança no exercício desses direitos de uma forma compatível com o desenvolvimento das suas capacidades. Artigo 14. Estabelece ainda a Convenção Europeia dos Direitos do Homem vigente em Portugal. O Estado no exercício das suas funções que tem One de ser minute, assumido... Please. Thanks. Sorry. One minute. Ah, ok. Thanks. Passa à frente. Qual respeito pela lei de base do sistema educativo? Qual respeito pelos direitos e liberdades e garantias? Qual respeito pela liberdade das famílias? Qual respeito pela liberdade de educação? Alguém me saberá responder a quem podemos apelar em nossa defesa, tal é o estado em que se encontra o nosso país e diria também toda a Europa? Naturalmente que nos resta recorrer da sentença da Previdência Cautelar com pedido de suspensão da sua eficácia, esperando poder contar que, ao menos por agora, impera bom senso por parte da meritíssima juíza que irá apreciar. Só pedimos justiça, como se não digo, de pleno direito. E se, será que alguém nos vai ouvir? Thank you very much. And now, Pablo. Oh, thanks. thanks, Arthur. Thank you, Arthur. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. And uh, now Pablo, he will tell us about uh, Vividores. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Yo desde luego primero quiero agradecer especialmente a Jaime Mayor Oreja y a Ana del Pino por de One of Us por la organización de este foro y desde luego a nuestros 
a, a la Universidad eh, Católica de Lisboa que nos ha acogido también. Y, y desde luego eh, yo estoy muy honrado eh, por participar en esta mesa. Después de haber escuchado a mis compañeros de mesa, tienen toda mi, mi admiración y, y mi amistad. Eh, Vividores es una iniciativa de la ACDP, que es una asociación centenaria española, Asociación Católica de Propagandistas, y esta iniciativa eh, tiene por objeto la defensa de la vida. Ante la urgencia suscitada por las iniciativas legislativas que se han desarrollado en España, claramente injustas todas ellas, Vividores se presenta como un proyecto para hablar de la vida y de la muerte, de las alegrías y de los sinsabores, y cuyo objetivo es reflexionar sobre el sentido del dolor y el sufrimiento, sin censurar nada, para provocar un debate social, ya que eso es justo lo que no ha habido en España, un debate serio, ponderado por el bien común a la hora de tratar asuntos tan graves como, como plantear la eutanasia, como muy bien han explicado esta mañana el profesor Julio Tudela y Monseñor Munilla. El objetivo fundamental de Vividores es dar testimonio de vida, de una vida digna y con sentido, y en caso necesario con el apoyo de los cuidados paliativos, todo ello a través de una serie de testimonios reales de vida, que dan ejemplo a través de las situaciones que les ha tocado vivir, que la vida en toda su amplitud merece la pena. La campaña tiene como núcleo central una web, www.vividores.org. Allí se pueden encontrar testimonios de personas que sufren y de personas que están junto a los que sufren. Además, se incluye una serie de vídeos con expertos en diferentes ramas relacionadas que tienen por objetivo enriquecer los debates que se puedan suscitar. Los vídeos han superado el millón de visualizaciones en las distintas redes sociales y han provocado que se hayan podido organizar algunas acciones para solicitar al Gobierno de España un debate sobre la eutanasia y una apuesta fuerte por los cuidados paliativos. Si, si les parece, vamos a ver un brevísimo vídeo que, que ejemplifica estas palabras que les he querido escribir. Buen vividor, ser un disfrutón. Resulta que hay gente a la que parece que le ha mirado un tuerto y es más feliz que yo, que lo tengo todo. Que me quiera a mí por quien soy, no por cómo soy. Que la muerte no es como nos la pinta, ni tampoco como nos la imaginamos, y que forma parte de la vida. Es que pedir la muerte lo que está pidiendo es una llamada de atención. Dice, tu vida no tiene sentido, yo, puede ser. Vamos a buscárselo. Thank you, Pablo, and um, we conclude uh, today. We listen uh, beautiful things, and uh, as we listen at the mass, we um, we do more in service for life. And uh, I conclude with the sentence of Paula Bonzi, our founder of uh, 
Centro di aiuto alla vita Mangiagalli. When a baby is not born, this baby will be missed by all of us. Now I introduce Marina Casini. Marina is the president of Movimento per la Vita Italiana. She is not here today. She is busy at the 41esimo Convegno Nazionale Italiano del Movimento per la Vita, but she prepared a video for us. Thanks. Eccoci, carissimi amici della Federazione Europea One of Us, carissimo Presidente eh, Jaime Mairo Reta, è appena terminato il direttivo nazionale del Movimento per la Vita Italiano e il primo pensiero è subito per voi. Per voi che siete a Lisbona, per il Forum Europeo, per voi che avrete l'occasione meravigliosa di riflettere su tanti temi, su tante questioni che toccano oggi il cuore dell'Europa. Ecco, io penso veramente che la Federazione One of Arts abbia un ruolo importantissimo, una missione fondamentale. La Federazione One of Arts, proprio perché porta questo nome, One of Arts, legato ad una vicenda gloriosa, importantissima, dovrebbe veramente essere il faro dell'Europa, della nuova Europa, dell'Europa che si basa sui valori dell'uomo, sui valori fondamentali, ed è per questo che io, pur non potendo partecipare al forum, perché come sapete in contemporanea abbiamo il convegno nazionale del Movimento per la Vita, che quest'anno si svolgerà in una modalità davvero inedita, faremo il convegno in crociera, quindi non mi posso spostare dal convegno in nessun modo, ecco che eh, non posso essere con voi, ma eh, voglio leggervi il manifesto che abbiamo pensato per una iniziativa che si chiama Cuore a Cuore. A questa iniziativa io ho fatto riferimento anche lo scorso anno quando ci siamo incontrati nel forum che si svolse in Italia, in Italia per modo di dire perché in realtà eravamo in pandemia e quindi eravamo tutti in collegamento. Però il discorso lì è stato appena iniziato e adesso vogliamo portarlo avanti. E sarebbe così bello che questa iniziativa cuore a cuore diventasse una iniziativa anche di One of Us, perché si può dire che cuore a cuore nasce nello spirito, nell'anima di One of Us. Cos'è cuore a cuore? È una campagna di sensibilizzazione che vuole mettere la voce delle donne in prima linea per difendere, per tutelare, per promuovere la vita nascente. Abbiamo parlato ai cittadini europei, abbiamo parlato ai giuristi, abbiamo parlato ai politici, abbiamo parlato agli scienziati e abbiamo chiesto che la loro voce si levasse forte per dire tutti insieme one of us. L'essere umano concepito e non ancora nato è il più bambino dei bambini, è il più povero dei poveri, è davvero uno di noi. E noi sappiamo che in questo discorso è in gioco il fondamentale principio di uguaglianza, di uguaglianza dell'uguale dignità di ogni essere appartenente alla famiglia umana. Ecco, ma in tutto questo è fondamentale anche la voce delle donne, perché le donne sono proprio coloro che hanno il privilegio e l'onore di portare in grembo per nove mesi il loro figlio. È una peculiarità meravigliosa, quindi è importante che le donne si facciano sentire. Le donne insieme agli uomini, accompagnate dagli uomini, perché cuore a cuore è per tutti, ma certamente le donne hanno un, un ruolo e un prestigio, possiamo dire particolare, che noi vogliamo valorizzare, vogliamo valorizzarlo insieme con la federazione One of Us. Cuore a cuore, il cuore del bambino che vive e cresce sotto il cuore della sua mamma. Ecco quindi, io vi leggo il manifesto che abbiamo pensato, eh, noi italiani, diciamo che con tanto onore, orgoglio e fierezza facciamo parte della federazione One of Us, lo presentiamo a voi. Speriamo che diventi una cosa anche di One of Us, una cosa condivisa, una cosa di tutti. Ecco che vi leggo il manifesto. Il giusto progressivo ampliamento della sfera di azione delle donne ha loro permesso di essere sempre più presenti nella società, 
consapevoli del loro ruolo e del valore del loro contributo. Tutto questo è molto positivo perché la costruzione di un livello più alto di civiltà non può avvenire senza porre al centro la ricchezza, l'ingegno, lo stile e la specificità dell'identità femminile. In questa prospettiva è necessario valorizzare la peculiarità tipica della donna, la prossimità con la vita umana, il privilegio del cuore a cuore con il figlio che vive e cresce nel suo grembo. Si tratta dell'abbraccio più intenso e intimo che esista, vissuto in una modalità unica e irripetibile, che non si verifica in nessun'altra fase dell'esistenza, cuore a cuore. Grazie a questo speciale cuore a cuore, le donne hanno una particolare autorevolezza nel chiedere che la società rivolga lo sguardo sul bambino concepito, riconoscendolo un essere umano a pieno titolo, un figlio, uno di noi. È uno sguardo in certo senso imposto dall'epoca complessa in cui viviamo. La pandemia mondiale ci ha costretto a riflettere sulle cose essenziali, a stringere legami di solidarietà anche oltre i confini nazionali e continentali, a riconoscere l'uguale valore di ogni vita umana. È giunto il momento di andare alle fonti di un'autentica cultura della prossimità, originata dall'etica della maternità, il cui nucleo è il privilegio del cuore a cuore, lo specialissimo legame che unisce la madre e il figlio che vive e cresce dentro di lei, è il modello di ogni primordiale solidarietà e di ogni apertura all'altro. A ben guardare, ogni autentica relazione di cura rimanda a quell'accoglienza gratuita e a quel dono di sé che fa appello alla donna quando si annuncia il figlio che vive dentro di lei. Il primo fondamentale passo è riconoscere che quella presenza in lei e che pervade tutto il suo essere è un figlio, è uno di noi. La scienza moderna e la ragione provano che il figlio concepito è un essere umano e dunque titolare della dignità umana come ogni altro essere umano, ma la voce delle donne è fondamentale perché nel cuore di ogni donna c'è la conoscenza, la consapevolezza o l'intuizione che ciascun essere umano fin dal concepimento ha un figlio. È necessario dunque che le donne prendano coscienza del loro privilegio e operino, e operino per dimostrare la verità. La campagna Cuore a Cuore consiste nel promuovere un'operazione culturale che collochi sullo stesso piano le istanze di liberazione femminile con la difesa del diritto alla vita dei figli concepiti, invocando il principio di non discriminazione per le une e per gli altri, in nome dell'alleanza tra la donna e la vita nascente. Il materno salverà l'umano. Ecco, scusatemi se ho preso tanto tempo e per il vostro ascolto. Spero che prendiate eh, in considerazione questa campagna di sensibilizzazione che speriamo comune. Vi auguro un ottimo forum e da parte di tutto il Movimento per la Vita Italiano tanta vicinanza e tanto affetto. A presto. We share our two art. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. And thanks, Anna, for the... Well, announcements in English for everyone. Uh, well, we are just... Uh, we are close to the end. Uh, we are going to make a little change. So what do you can expect? First of all, you can expect that we are going to, st to stay here until uh, 8 p.m. So um, I think maybe we have one hour or less. With what? We are going to listen to Fado, a musical moment, because in every uh, meeting of the One of Us Federation, there's a moment of beauty, because as Pope John Paul II said, the beauty is the splendor of the truth. And so that's why we, we, we like in every meeting to, to have this moment of beauty and in this case by music and by enfado that is a traditional uh, portuguese song uh, i'm also making some time they are arriving and so uh, uh, also talking about that and then after the fado we will listen the conclusions and uh, and the, the deliver of the prize uh, one of us uh, o oh, oh, Rui, diz, diz aos fadistas para virem avançando e, e também os voluntários se põem aqui umas, umas cadeiras 
ou Rui vê se é necessário umas cadeiras ou isso, está bem? Quer dizer, como é que fazemos isto? Manal, para aqui. So as you know, Fado, it's a very nostalgic song, a Portuguese song, and uh, we are going to listen to just four fados, because if not, we would become tired, you are not used to, and we are not we, we, at a good table with wine and, uh, and, uh, and uh, all these things that, uh, that we like during ear, uh, hearing Fado. But I, I will call your attention to also to one point, uh, that Fado, and this is very important, Fado is supposed to be heard in completely silence. Uh, completely silence. Why? Because the one that sings is in dialogue with the Portuguese guitar and with the guitar. And also he lives from the emotion that he feels from the people that are listening. That's why there's a classic phrase, let's there be silence, let's there be fado. But at the end of each fado, you can applaud. Uh, that you can do, okay? So please. Sorry. As I said, the conclusions are after the fado. We have changed the program because the, these friends of us need to uh, go to another place. So there's always some changes and details. And we are also waiting for Francisco Salvação Barreto. Where, where is he? Huh? Então pronto. So please, let's there be silence. Let's there be fado, please.
Thank you all, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Ricardo said, uh, I'm in our main network from the Bank of Ricardo since like I was in the introduction and the session just like me. And I think the remote scene, the melancholic one, is something that's happening. Um, well, one of the things quite often sing is uh, the city of Brussels. And so this one, this this one I'm going to sing is about one of the oldest works in Brussels called Moreria. simple language uh, to, 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 to. and so I want you to sing along in the chorus in Portuguese so that's right <laughs> you are here for our days today so you know how to sing in Portuguese I'm sure <laughs> Oh, 
Muito bem, belíssimo. And now, and now we are going for the conclusions. So I call on Geoffrey de Vries, uh, that is a member of the cultural platform of One of Us. He is a lawyer, so a colleague. Pleased to meet you. <laughs> and, uh, and he comes from, uh, from France. And I think he's going to read the conclusions or say something about it. And then we will have the, the prize, one of us, and we will close. Thank you. I would like to sing the conclusions, but <laughs> I'm not able. So I'm sorry, I went to read. My name is Geoffrey de Vries, Geoffroy de Vries, and uh, I am a French lawyer based in Paris. And I have asked to conclude our forum with Domenico Coviello from Italy. Unfortunately, Domenico has a flight at 8.30 and now he has leave. But I had the, the opportunity to discuss with him before he leaves, to discuss few points that I'm going to tell you. First of all, you should, you should know three figures about the participants in our forum. 126 persons present in this room. 
45 connected persons, all of them from 25 countries. Today, many things have been discussed or shown. And we hope that to summarize our final report will be drafted and distributed to all of us. It will be very useful. With Domenico Coviello, we think that few points among others are crucial. First, we should consider that the real enemy of Europe is not outside, such as Islam, but inside, as materialism and, relativ and relativism. Ecologists defend nature, such as animals, plants, environment, but that does not defend human life. We should promote integral ecology, defending human life in priority from conception to natural death. We have to redefine and define freedom, more especially freedom of expression. Then we should promote finally family, excuse me, family policy against the fashion of child-free life. You know, our forum is very timely. The European Commission has recently, in May 2021, opened the conference on the future of Europe. And this conference is done through a multitude of conference events and debates organized across the Union, as well as through a multilingual digital platform. And I suggest you visit this platform. The domain name is futureeu.europa.eu. The conclusions of this conference should be known in March or April 22 and should reflect normally the main proposals of the Europeans. This is an opportunity for us, a great opportunity for one of us. But of course, we should not be naive. This conference does not directly deal with the roots of Europe, but with the European democratic process. It does not deal precisely with integral ecology, but with fight against climate change, not with the reduction of freedoms, but with the rule of law, as they know in Poland and Hungary, or the rights of the LGBTI communities, not with the demographic decline, but with the management of migration. However, this conference is an opportunity for one of us. So what can we do now? Each of us should visit the platform and then share our ideas. And why not organize events on our today's subjects? Because today's subjects are those that concern today's citizens for our future as Europeans as humans. As Jaime Meror Herrera told us this morning, one of us will also organize a convention to defend the Christian foundations of Europe as part of this conference. And this convention should be held next March or April in Brussels. I guess, I hope that we will have the opportunity to participate in this convention. This should be a convention to free Europeans from the prevailing totalitarianism, excuse me, to denounce the persecution suffered by governments such as Hungary and Poland in defense of our Christian values. And above all, of course, to present proposals and alternatives. The objective is also to fight lies and seek the truth. As you know, the European Union was, was originally formed to provide us with peace and freedom. And it is the truth, rather than Europe, 
that will make us free. Thank you for your listening and have a good evening. Well, we are coming to the end. Now it's uh, for the prize one of us. I will call on convidas on Filipe Pavacoceiro. Where is she? She's coming very well. I will call on the president of the Portuguese Pro-Life Federation, uh, Isilda Pegado. And I will call on the volunteers that will, young volunteers that will give the, the, the prize. And so let's go for it. And then final announcements and we go other places. Yes, sorry, Leontine, Leontine, sorry. As in the gospel, the last are the first. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Leontine Bakermat from one of us in the Netherlands. Uh, last but not least, uh, I have the pleasure to tell about the award. Uh, so the one award, uh, the one of us award is a prize which was uh, awarded the first time at the first forum in Paris in 2016 uh, with the goal to celebrate the heroes of life. Uh, in the past, Leo uh, Bocelli, uh, uh, were on the, the nominees, so the nominees of today are a very good company. Uh, last year we were in the grip of uh, Corona, so we had no forum meeting, no award, and therefore this time uh, we have decided that we have to look bigger uh, to a whole group who uh, showed exec exceptional commitment to the promotion, respect, and defense of life and dignity of the human person. So Isolda, Isolda, as head of Pro-Life uh, Portugal. Uh, yeah, will you please announce um, who is this yes. your earned the award? Yes, yes, thank you. Life is defending in the life. A vida defends na vida. Também há outras formas de defender a vida. Mas hoje o prémio Nosso prémio é como que pedido pelos idosos, cujas vidas pareciam não ter valor e que estes jovens, bravos, valentes, abraçaram e deram valor. Fizeram-no discretamente, como aqui disseram. Mas a sociedade e o país viram como estes jovens o fizeram. Na altura, em Portugal, debatia-se a eutanásia. E o país viu que estes jovens diziam todas as vidas são dignas. Quando mudavam uma fralda a um idoso, lhe cortavam as unhas ou acariciavam, diziam, cada vida vale. Quando partiam para longe, diziam, sempre pela vida. O país viu-os, Portugal viu-os e entendemos que é um exemplo a seguir. A vida defende-se na vida, disseram-nos hoje os oradores. E por isso, a Federação Luana Faz decidiu que o nosso prémio 2021 é para o Convidas. Parabéns. <risos>
And so we come to the to the end. I'm going to make the final announcements. And first of all, I would like to say to every and each one of us, how dear to us is your presence here today. But I, I mean it. It's not uh, it's not words. I, I will refer uh, one person in special because all of you are friends. But just to say to Don Ivo Scapola that your friendship deeply touched our hearts. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.